A lot of you may not know this, but I've been an on and off Sonic fan ever since I was a little milk drinking boy. I'm now a milk drinking man, and it's safe to say my relationship with the Sonic franchise has been a rocky one. I think the first AAA game I ever played on a console was Sonic Adventure DX on the GameCube back in the early 2000s. A friend of my brother's had a GameCube way before we got one of our own, so we would often go round his house and play all sorts of classics from that era. But amongst these games, the one that stood out the most to me was the original Sonic Adventure. Some Something about the upbeat music, whimsical character design, range of playable environments, and most importantly of all, the speed and physics of the gameplay just absolutely enthralled me. And from that moment I've always associated those old Sonic games with good times. Since then, I went and played most of Sonic's mainline titles, going back and playing Sonic 1, 2 and 3, Sonic Adventure 2, Sonic Heroes, Shadow the Hedgehog, Sonic and the Secret Rings, Sonic 06, Sonic Unleashed, Sonic Generations, you name it, I've most likely played it, except for Black Knight, which is something I need to get around to playing eventually, as a lot of people praise it for its characterization of Sonic, but that's besides the point. I even went back and played emulations of the Sonic Advance games that were released for the Game Boy Advance, which are nice callbacks to the classic 90s games with the more edgy art direction and boisterous attitude from the Sonic Adventure games. I also really enjoyed the Sonic X anime whenever that aired in the UK. It further perpetuated the early 2000s depiction of Sonic as a rebellious troublemaker who would get into all sorts of trouble to stave off his boredom, but who also had a more serious side who would do anything to protect the innocent and to save his friends, even at the cost of himself. This is a particular characterization of Sonic that I really enjoyed, which was of course brought to life by the legendary Jason Griffith, my all-time favourite voice of Sonic. Anyway, the point is, throughout my childhood, anything Sonic related I consumed like a vacuum. I even have distinct memories of running through the playground at primary school with my arms behind my back pretending to be Sonic. So yeah, I loved Sonic so much that I wanted to become him. As the years rolled by and as I got older and realised that not all Sonic games were as good as I remembered them being when I first played them, my love for Sonic dwindled due to disappointing release after disappointing release. I also wanted to distance myself from being overly obsessed with an anthropomorphised blue hedgehog as I began navigating the landscape of adolescence. So Sonic was just no longer as cool to me as he was when I first played Sonic Adventure when I was about 4 or 5. On top of that, in 2013, Sega made a deal with Nintendo which meant that the next few mainline Sonic titles would all be released exclusively for Nintendo consoles only. This included Sonic Lost World and the Sonic Boom franchise which spanned three games, all of which performed relatively badly, with review scores middling out at around 4 to 6 out of 10. I was a kid who only owned an Xbox and refused to buy Nintendo consoles after getting a Wii in 2007. No hate to the Wii by the way, I actually have a lot of fond memories playing Mario Galaxy and Wii Sports on my Wii, but it was the first console that I owned that didn't predominantly belong to my brother, and most of the games I wanted to play at the time were terrible Wii versions of their Xbox 360 and PS3 counterparts, so I was disappointed to say the least. I would have been better off just getting a PS3. Due to my aversion to Nintendo at the time, I luckily missed out on playing these Sonic games. As the years went by, AAA Sonic games became few and far between, with our favourite furry blue mascot being delegated to mobile games, animated TV shows, racing spin-offs and Olympic tie-ins. Eventually, Sonic drifted from being something I was still mildly interested in due to nostalgia into a distant memory. That was until Sonic Forces was announced in July of 2016. After my interest in Sonic dwindled over the years, I was suddenly reminded of him with the release of the Sonic Forces announcement trailer. The trailer depicted a huge Eggman robot destroying a city, with a lone Sonic standing amongst the ruins with a look of resolve on his face. The trailer seemed to take inspiration from earlier Sonic entries with a much more mature tone, while still sticking to the lovable art style and modern Sonic design that we'd grown to love from Unleashed, which I was so happy to see because Sonic Boom's Sonic design looks awful in my opinion. 
I, I hate it. I was actually quite impressed by what I saw at first, but then halfway through the trailer, classic Sonic from Sonic Generation showed up, and that was the first nail in the coffin for Sonic Forces, as I knew a Sonic game with yet another gimmick playable character was the last thing that Sonic needed at the time. Especially after Unleash Werehog, Colors Wisps, and Generation's 50-50 split with classic Sonic. I just wanted a Sonic game, with Sonic as the only playable character, doing things that Sonic would do, with a Sonic-centric storyline. Even when faced with such bad odds of Sonic Forces being good, I still held out hope that it would reinvigorate the franchise that had faded into a shell of its former self. To cut a long story short, it didn't. Sonic Forces is amongst the worst Sonic games to ever come out, with a contrived and ultimately boring story, a pathetic antagonist, flanderized characters, terrible level design, pointless nostalgia baiting callbacks, and the dreaded custom character, in which children all across the world could create their own unhinged Sonic OCs, kinda like those awful Sonic character OCs from DeviantArt in the 2010s. Honestly, I'd rather play the original Sonic 06 on Xbox 360 than play Sonic Forces again. At least Sonic 06 is so bad it can be entertaining, and the story has a lot of heart from the original Sonic Adventure games. Sonic Forces is just bad, in all senses of the word. I really hate that game. However, we're not here to talk about Sonic Forces. We're here to talk about Sega and Sonic Team's answer to the negative reception that Sonic Forces garnered, Sonic Frontiers. After the release of Sonic Forces in 2017, I really thought this franchise was done for, with the combination of janky mechanics, unremarkable level design, a botched story, and unfaithful characterization, I was pretty much done with the Sonic franchise. However, in December 2021, the new vision for Sonic was announced. I thought, ah, why the hell not stick around for one more game? After all, it's been five years since Forces, so Sonic Team has had half a decade to work on this new next-gen Sonic experience. What's the worst that could happen? Well, disappointment. Not disappointment because Sonic Frontiers is a bad game in every sense of the word, but disappointment because it could have been so much more. In today's video, I'm going to try to put that disappointment into words. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of aspects of Sonic Frontiers that are genuinely great, and Frontiers is better than Forces in every conceivable way. But the genuinely great parts of this game are so few and far between that I can't help but feel as if this game could have been great if it had more time and development, and if more time was put into crafting a coherent story. As someone who loved Sonic in their childhood, it sucks to see another mediocre entry into the franchise by a studio that has had more than enough opportunities to prove that they can create a great game. Alright, with that out of the way, let's take a trip to the Starfall Islands, amongst the ancient ruins of a mysterious civilization, to search for the Chaos Emeralds and to discuss why Sonic Frontiers could have been great. It's all coming online. The ancient secrets will be mine. Status report. Answer me! Simulations complete. Executing protective initiative. What? No! No!
Starfall Islands. How exciting! You tracked the Chaos Emeralds here, right? Let's find out what drew them here. The game begins with Eggman arriving on a remote island late at night, flying through a dense forest. The camera then cuts to some sort of ancient structure, a stone monolith covered in moss, with patterns and etchings lining it from top to bottom. Eggman approaches the structure and attaches a device to it, which then begins to spread red energy across the grooves of the monolith, causing an orb of red light to rise out of the top, which then lights up the sky with the glowing geometric patterns. Suddenly, a bunch of ancient sentinels appear behind Eggman and he proclaims, yes, it's all coming online. The ancient secrets will be mine. Which is pretty ominous. Of course, Eggman's back up to his old tricks again, enacting another one of his insane schemes in order to gain power. The device on the monolith then begins being sucked into some sort of alternate dimension, and being the genius scientist he is, Eggman decides to grab it and follow it into what I can only assume is another dimension, which is the last place anyone wants to be if we're being honest. There's also this huge robot in the background, which I've now just realised is the boss of Kronos Island, which is the first island you visit in the game. I guess this moment is meant to be like, oh, cool foreshadowing. And I appreciate the effort to try and build this enemy up as some sort of looming threat, but it really isn't that impactful in my opinion. I think it would have been better if Eggman were to stumble across ancient statues of the four bosses from each of the four islands, which would immediately convey to the player that not only are these four titans in particular very important, but they're also ingrained into the lore and the culture of the civilization that once lived on the Starfall Islands. This would give us a taste of what they may look like without spoiling the final reveal for us. Anyway, Eggman's been sucked into the metaverse, sorry, the cyberspace, and the scene cuts to black. Fade in the next scene where we catch up with Sonic, Tails and Amy flying in the tornado. Honestly, I think this is a great way to reintroduce our main characters. It's a familiar sight that invokes a bit of nostalgia, but not too much that it becomes obvious nostalgia bait, which is something that Sonic has become far too familiar with over the last decade. Just seeing the three of them enjoying a joyride in the tornado immediately made me feel like I'm back with the gang, far away from the abomination that was Sonic Forces and everything else that made up the last decade of Sonic content. I also want to mention how great the character models look in this game. They're sharp and immediately recognisable, with really vibrant colours that pop, and they actually added textured fur for the first time in a Sonic game, which I think looks great. It's not to the extent of the characters from the movies of course, but it helps give the appearance of fur instead of the characters just looking like they're made of Play-Doh. There's just something about the character models in this game that I really like, especially Sonic himself. I'm sure it's mostly down to the lighting and use of colour in this game, but Sonic just looks so much better than his Force's appearance. Although, I still wish his quills were longer, and I prefer Sonic when he's darker blue, like in the adventure games. That being said, Frontier's Sonic is definitely a step up from Forces Sonic, which I consider a huge win. Sonic, Tails, and Amy are here at the Starfall Islands because this is where they've tracked the Chaos Emeralds to, making this game, of course, yet another MacGuffin chase to find the Chaos Emeralds, which I wouldn't have had a problem with if it was introduced in a slightly more creative way. Maybe something else could draw them to the islands, and they conclude that they're only 
only way of getting home is to collect the Chaos Emeralds. This could have so easily been fixed by something like Eggman gets sucked into the metaverse, Sonic notices that Eggman hasn't been active recently, so he, Tails, and Amy track Eggman's last activity in order to find out what happened to him, and in the process they get trapped on the islands themselves with no way of getting home. I just think that would feel a lot more organic than we're trying to find the Chaos Emeralds for no reason, again. I feel as if these days just searching for the Chaos Emeralds isn't necessarily a strong enough premise for the story of a mainline Sonic game. There has to be a significant event that spurs Sonic to need to seek them out, instead of that being the whole purpose of the adventure in the first place. I just think it could have been a cool setup to have the gang searching for Eggman, almost concerned that he hasn't tried to enact some evil plan in a while, in the process getting trapped on the islands and deciding to search for the Chaos Emeralds to get home, or whilst finding abandoned Eggman technology scattered across the islands. Suddenly, the tornado begins malfunctioning and Tails loses control of the plane as the three soar down to the island below. But before they're able to hit the ground, a cyberspace portal opens, sucking them in, which begins our first stage. Sonic is then immediately dropped into a familiar setting. Green Hill Zone. <sighs> I honestly couldn't make this up. Sonic Team really is beating the decaying corpse of Green Hill Zone at this point. Green Hill Zone is going through stage 3 rigor mortis, and Sonic Team is just there, relentlessly beating it to a pulp with a sturdy iron rod. I just wish they'd go like a couple games without including it, it just seems like such a cop out for a first stage. Sonic Generations, Sonic Lost World, Sonic Forces, and now Sonic Frontiers all have a variation of Green Hill Zone as their first playable stage, and it's just really uninspired. The last mainline modern Sonic game that didn't start with a variant of Green Hill Zone was Sonic Colors, and that was released 13 years ago. Don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of the original Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1, and I also love Emerald Hill Zone from Sonic 2, Angel Island from Sonic 3, the Green Hill Zone remake from Sonic Generations, and the revamped Green Hill Zone from Sonic Mania, but I really think that with these mainline modern Sonic games, they should take the opportunity to innovate and create a really impressive and unique first stage that complements the art style of the game, instead of making another soulless callback to Green Hill, which has been done to death at this point. I understand that it's specified as a plot point that these cyberspace stages are set in places from Sonic's history because the ancient technology uses his memories to create these digital spaces. But that's a cop out in order to avoid developing brand new stages in my opinion. They've been working on this game for 5 years, there's no way all they could come up with was another Green Hill Zone stage. I appreciate that it probably took a lot of manpower and money to develop the open world spaces, but if all we get from the cyberspace stages are rehashed versions of stages from Sonic Generations, I'd rather they gave the developers more time to actually develop brand new fully fleshed out stages. This one in particular is pretty short, it's just a taster of gameplay to Get you into the Sonic mood. And I gotta say, something feels lacking from these stages. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a huge hater of the boost formula. My favourite Sonic game is Sonic Unleashed, so you best believe I enjoy it. But despite using the same gameplay mechanics, there's something about Sonic Unleashed and Sonic Generations that just feels so much better. They really managed to capture Sonic's raw speed. Maybe it's because Sonic's base running speed without using the boost is slowed down so much that not boosting isn't even viable. Or maybe it's the distinct lack of momentum building when Sonic's running down an incline. Although I will say that doesn't mean the cyberspace stages control badly, it just doesn't feel as exhilarating as the old games. I'll discuss more about the movement and physics of this game later though, because I don't think it's fair to completely write off this game's movement system in the first two minutes of gameplay. Plus, as you'll come to find out, the movement works differently when you're exploring the open worlds compared to when you're racing through the linear cyberspace stages. Amy? Oh. Looks like I'm the only one who made it out of that. Whatever it was. Whew. Mortal. Oh. 
Hello? You have done the impossible. You have escaped cyberspace through your own power. You are the key. Key, huh? Sure beats being called a rodent. Are you saying I can rescue my friends? Find the Chaos Emeralds. Destroy the Titans. Tear down the walls between dimensions. Yeah, okay, sure. How about a little context? Hello? Oh well. Some direction is better than none. Here we go. After clearing the latest rehash of Green Hill Zone, Sonic wakes up in the rain with no Tails or Amy to be seen. Sonic has woken up scared, cold, and alone with no friends, which finally makes Sonic a deeply relatable character to most of the Sonic fanbase. Anyway, after waking up, Sonic is contacted by this strange voice who tells him that he achieved the impossible by escaping cyberspace and that he is the key, whatever that means. The voice speaking to him is not to be confused with the AI that Eggman implanted into the cyberspace with a device at the beginning of the game. Eggman's AI is called Sage and takes on the form of a young girl. Sage's character arc over the course of this game is a story that I actually liked, so we'll talk about that later on. For now, this mysterious voice from the clouds explains that all Sonic needs to do to save his friends is to find the Chaos Emeralds, defeat the titans of each island, and tear down the walls between dimensions, which sounds a bit scary. So overall pretty standard stuff for our blue hedgehog. Much like Dr. Eggman, Tails and Amy are now trapped in the metaverse with Mark Zuckerberg, and the only way for us to save them is to collect the Chaos Emeralds and defeat the four titans protecting the Starfall Islands. And there we are! We've established the main objective of this journey, and have a goal to work towards. At the end of this cutscene, Sonic asks for context from the seemingly omniscient voice, but is ultimately given none, which is quite symbolic as that's how the entire story of this game is written. But we'll talk more about the story later. Now let's discuss where you'll be spending most of your time during this game, the open worlds. We're finally in the open world, so it's time for me to talk about each of the five open zones you can go to. There are five open zones in total. Kronos Island, Ares Island, Chaos Island, Rhea Island, and Oranos Island, each with different terrains, climates, and enemies. However, before we begin talking about the open worlds, I'd like to give a bit of background to the Starfall Islands themselves, because there's actually a rich history of lore relating to the previous inhabitants of the islands, which sheds a bit of light as to why there's remnants of civilization here. The civilization that built the structures we see in ruins on the Starfall Islands are known only as the Ancients. Okay, so the Ancients is a really generic name for them, but I suppose this was done intentionally so as to keep the mystery alive. Through exploring the islands and partaking in the side story activities on each island, we learn that there were extraordinarily advanced aliens that existed millennia ago. They originally come from an alien planet and sought refuge on Earth after they were attacked by a mysterious entity that destroyed their home planet. After reaching Earth, they formed colonies on the Starfall Islands and rebuilt their civilization in peace away from the threat that loomed over their homeworld. The ancients were capable of creating hyper-advanced technology, such as laser cannons, huge watchtowers that rose into the sky, and armies of robot sentinels in order to defend their new home in the event that whatever destroyed their home planet found them on Earth. But amongst their most impressive creations were the Chaos Altars and the Cyberspace. Chaos Altars are exactly what they sound like, altars that were capable of harnessing the limitless energy of the Chaos Emeralds in order to power the Ancients' entire civilization. It's not known how they came into the possession of the Seven Chaos Emeralds, but they are the first known wielders of them, and their culture is deeply intertwined with the Chaos Emeralds and their power. The Chaos Emeralds were used as a power source not only to power their armies, industries, and technology, but also to power the portals leading to the cyberspace, which is a digital realm created to store all the Ancients' hopes, dreams, memories, and data which can be accessed through portals scattered across the islands. The cyberspace is a testament to just how advanced the Ancients were. They were able to create an entire dimension of their own which can be entered and exited at will via the portals. After a time of peace and prosperity following their arrival on Earth, 
the ancients once again found themselves face to face with the being that destroyed their homeworld. Only this time, it seems that the ancients were wiped out entirely, but we'll talk more about that later. This is the type of world building I love to see. There was clearly so much meticulous thought put into the backstory of the ancients, and what I just discussed there is just the tip of the iceberg. As we play the game and make our way through the story, I'll reveal more about the ancients' specific key points in this video, because I really think the lore behind them is well made and interesting. It's just such a stark contrast to the absolute drivel we've gotten from Sonic stories over the last decade. It brings that tinge of mysticism back to the Sonic universe that's been missing for so long. So, with a little bit of backstory covered, let's head down to the Starfall Islands themselves to discuss the open world spaces. The island that Sonic starts on is Kronos Island, a lush green environment with lots of sloping hills, flat plains, and blue skies. This is the island that was shown in most of the gameplay trailers and early access gameplay for Sonic Frontiers, so it's a very recognisable open world space if you followed the game up until release. Kronos Island features several ruins left behind by the ancients, as well as verdant fields, forest areas, and waterfalls across a mountainous terrain. Kronos Island is also prone to large amounts of rainfall, which I think adds a lot of nice atmosphere to the experience of exploring. Kronos is a great starting area. It's familiar, straightforward, aesthetically pleasing, and it helps you get to grips with the game's gameplay loop from the get-go. I'll talk more about the actual gameplay loop itself in a later section in this video, but for now I'm just going to focus on the surface level observations we can make upon looking at each of these open worlds. Kronos is a solid foundation for an open world space, and the other areas build off of that foundation as we progress through the game. Each island is inhabited by one of Sonic's lost friends, who are trapped between dimensions, and Kronos is the island where we find Amy. Amy's story focuses on the themes of love and companionship, but also of independence and a longing to help people. As to be expected, love is a very common theme in stories relating to Amy Rose, but there's more to her character development in this game than just pining after Sonic, which is certainly a welcome direction for her character. Ares Island is the second island you get to visit, which is covered in arid deserts and rocky canyons. I particularly like the aesthetic of Ares Island, as it's home to a number of desert features, including craggy ground and high, plateauing outcroppings, as well as long stretches of smooth sand dunes. Ancient ruins, small temples, cave systems and platforms are interwoven throughout the environment, and the island's plant life consists of palm trees, cacti, and patchy desert grass. Something about running at breakneck speed through the sandy dunes and rocky badlands is really fun. You get a lot of space to run, especially in the desert. You can also find oases in the desert with water, trees, and lush grass, which really adds a layer of biodiversity to the open world. Ares Island is also prone to sandstorms, meaning sometimes you'll be running through the desert and a large cloud of sand will gradually cover the landscape, lowering visibility and adding a ton of atmosphere. I was really impressed by this for sure. Ares is one of the larger maps in the game, so it takes a decent amount of time to traverse from one side to the other, which is what makes your movement and the way you traverse the map so important. The map of Ares Island is split up into segments which are separated by large cliffs and canyons. To access each of the different parts of the map, you've got to memorise the routes through the canyons in order to reach the part of the map you want. At first this was really confusing for me as I had no idea which routes led where, but eventually I learned the layout of the map and could easily travel from one end to the other quite quickly. It was actually very satisfying, as it adds a layer of mastery to the open world. Ares Island is where we find Knuckles trapped in the cyberspace, and you're probably wondering, where the hell did Knuckles come from? And yeah, that's the same question I asked upon finding him. But there was actually a prequel animation uploaded to the Sonic the Hedgehog YouTube channel called Sonic Frontiers Prologue Divergence that serves as an explanation as to how Knuckles found himself on Ares Island, and how he got trapped in cyberspace. Knuckles was doing the usual guarding the Master Emerald, exploring the ruins of Sky Sanctuary, looking after the Chow, and generally killing time as he normally does. Eventually, he finds a Chow struggling to clear some debris and decides to help it, punching through the stone so that the Chow could claim what was underneath it, an ancient stone mask. 
The Chow flutters off, happy with its new mask, and Knuckles looks down to find a glowing cog, and decides to head further inside the opening to investigate. Inside, Knuckles finds a large monolith, the exact kind that Eggman found in that first cutscene we talked about at the beginning of this video. As we know, this is a portal to the ancient cyberspace. Knuckles notices a slot matching the shape of the cog on the surface of the monolith, so he decides to insert it into the portal, which swiftly activates and teleports him somewhere else entirely. Upon arriving, Knuckles is attacked by a group of sentinel robots. He puts up a good fight, but he is ultimately overwhelmed and subdued by Sage, Eggman's AI who was inserted into the cyberspace earlier. He then wakes up in a desert, trapped in some sort of cage, with no way to escape. Of course, this desert is one of the many deserts of Ares Island, and Knuckles has no way of getting out on his own. I actually think it's really cool that they decided to have a small prequel story animated for Knuckles, as it would have been jarring to just stumble across him despite there being no mention of him in the story before. Not only is the animation itself absolutely beautifully created with a nice art style, but it's a great demonstration of how Sega and Sonic Team are trying to create a more consistent and overall cohesive universe for Sonic, with them even going back and referencing things that happened during the events of Sonic Adventure. This is something we'll come to see more of in Sonic Frontiers, which I actually think is a great step forward and a huge win for storytelling in Sonic games. I'm actually pretty interested to see where this goes in the future. The final line of the prequel also alludes to the themes of Knuckles' story in Sonic Frontiers. He says, I do things on my own, and that's just how I like it. I don't need anyone else to get by. I won't go into specifics yet, but Knuckles' story revolves a lot around this idea of being self-sufficient and not needing anyone, whilst also facing the isolation and loneliness that he feels being the last echidna tasked with protecting the Master Emerald. The third island is Chaos Island, a volcanic island floating in the sky with a murky grey colour palette snow-covered mountains, and a large volcano erupting in the middle. The name Chaos really lends itself to the chaotic nature of this island, with very harsh and unpredictable terrain, rivers of lava, and the ancient remnants of what was once a strong military presence in the form of ruins. This map, much like Ares Island, is split up into sections. There's one large island in the middle, and a collection of smaller islands surrounding it. In order to reach the smaller islands, you must use rails to cross. Learning the routes to each island is paramount to your time playing in this open world, but honestly, this is as simple as following the rails that lead to the island you wish to go to, so it doesn't take too much thought. One issue I have with the exploration of Chaos Island though, is that some parts of the map are completely locked off unless you progress through the story, and the player is given no indication of this. So I spent a good while aimlessly running around trying to get somewhere that I hadn't even unlocked the route to yet, without really knowing how to unlock it. I don't like how Chaos Island limits the player's exploration by locking off areas of the island behind the main story. It means you don't have full freedom to tackle content in the way you want because there's certain activities that you can only access by unlocking that area of the island via the main story. Honestly, even in terms of traversal, this island is the weakest one by far, with a lot of the terrain just being too mountainous, which is a lot less practical for Sonic Speed than the previous two islands. Chaos Island also becomes aesthetically boring very quickly, whereas Kronos and Ares Islands offered a lot of vibrant colour, varying terrains and weather conditions, Chaos Island is just very grey and very drab and has no unique weather conditions, which is a shame because a floating volcanic island sounds really cool in concept. But I will admit, the rails are very fun. Chaos Island is the place we finally find Tails, and much like Sonic's other friends, he's been trapped in cyberspace with no way to escape. Tails' story is probably one of my favourites in the game, of course covering themes like friendship and camaraderie, but also feelings of inadequacy, lack of self-belief, and an aspiration to be more than just a sidekick. We'll talk more about Tails' character journey later. Rhea Island is very much an outlier of the five areas we get to visit. It's similar in aesthetic to Kronos Island, with more plains of green grass contrasted by the blue sky overhead, and only serves as a place used to progress the story. There's no optional content, and you spend much less time here than the others. In fact, Rhea Island was originally going to be part of Kronos Island, but the island proved to be too big as one whole, so it was split into two gameplay areas. 
one on the southeast of the island and one on the northwest of the island. So it kind of doesn't make sense that they have two separate names when they're technically the same island. I think it's clear that originally, Kronos Island was intended to be much bigger than it is, but was downsized for some reason later down the line. Lastly, we have Oranos Island, which unfortunately has exactly the same aesthetic as both Kronos and Rhea. And in fact, much like Rhea Island, Oranos Island was originally meant to be part of Kronos Island. Although instead of being segmented into two different playable areas that were technically connected, Oranos Island was cut entirely and made its own island. If you get out of bounds, you can actually look down at the two islands, and you can see the outline of Oranos Island from where it was originally connected. So earlier in development, there was definitely higher ambitions for Kronos Island, and they just had to split it into three separate playable areas, instead of keeping that original vision. Which is a shame, to be honest. I would have really liked to have seen this huge, grand version of Kronos Island, the way the developers originally intended for it to be, but... Let's talk about what we actually got. I personally wish we got a large glacial island as the final island. It would really set it apart from the rest of them. Just imagine, large expanses of ice to run across, glacial terrain, snowfall, mountains, frozen lakes, it's got it all. I think it would have gone a long way to really differentiate the final island from the rest. I can look past Rhea and Kronos being the exact same, but to have the final island be such a letdown from a visual standpoint was such a shame. I was expecting some sort of grandiose ending island, but instead we basically got Kronos Island for a third time. Sonic is a franchise known for not pulling its punches when it comes to the final stage of each game. For example, Cannon's Core from Sonic Adventure 2, Final Fortress from Sonic Heroes, Eggman Land from Sonic Unleashed, hell, even End of the World from Sonic 06 was a very grandiose ending stage, whereas Frontier's final area is pretty much exactly the same as the first area. Of course, creating my ideal snowy landscape would have taken a lot more time to develop than simply using assets from Kronos Island. But I think that if the last island was actually aesthetically unique, it'd be a lot more memorable and impactful. In my opinion, the fact that Oranos Island is visually and thematically the same as Kronos Island and Rare Island is proof that this game needed more time in development. Because why else would they choose to create such an anticlimactic ending area? Kronos Island was originally meant to be huge, containing the version of Kronos we see in the final product of Frontiers, as well as Rhea and Oranos Islands too, but was later cut down because the concept just didn't work. I will say though, Oranos Island is much bigger than Kronos Island, and it's much more fun to traverse, so it does have that going for it. Each island has plenty of strengths and weaknesses in terms of structure, exploration, and how Sonic interacts with them. I'd say that both Kronos and Ares are the two best examples of world design in this game, with Rhea and Oranos being fun from a game design standpoint, but aesthetically disappointing. And unfortunately, Chaos Island is my least favourite island of the game, I really don't go there very often. Which is a shame, because that means that most of the islands in this game are disappointing in some way or another. I just can't shake the feeling that if given longer in development, we could have gotten more aesthetic diversity, which would have made for an overall much more impactful experience. Now it's time for us to discuss the bread and butter of Sonic games. Ever since the first Sonic game back in 1991, Sonic has been all about two things, movement and physics. Since 1991, Sonic Team has found various ways to incorporate tight movement and momentum-based physics into both 2D and 3D Sonic games. And no, just for the record, I'm not one of those people that thinks Sonic had a rough transition into 3D. I think the adventure games play really well for the time they were released, even now. But what exactly do I mean by movement and physics? Well, movement covers the various ways that Sonic moves through each zone, such as running, jumping, spin dashing, stomping, grinding and boosting. Physics covers the laws of physics that are defined within the simulation of the game. For example, mid-air direction changes whilst jumping, double jumping mid-air to platform, or the effect that gravity has on objects and characters in the world. Movement and physics go hand in hand, especially in a Sonic game where these two things are arguably the most important aspects of the game. 
For now, I'm only going to talk about Sonic's movement and physics in the context of the open world zones, but later we'll return to this concept when critiquing the cyberspace stages too, as the physics work differently when in a linear stage. We'll start off by talking about movement. His aerial abilities remain pretty much the same as they were in Sonic Forces. Sonic can jump, double jump, stomp, bounce and lightspeed dash. These were always very responsive abilities that I don't think needed changing, so I'm glad Sonic Team decided to keep what works to build on the movement system further. You'll find yourself using the stomp ability in particular quite a lot in this game as it's helpful to save time when falling, allowing you to reach the ground quicker so you can continue running. Double jump is also an integral ability which greatly helps with platforming. I actually wish Sonic Unleashed had a double jump, it would have made platforming in the daytime stages so much easier. They also added a new aerial movement, the drop dash, which allows you to spin dash from a jump. Being able to spin dash from a jump is useful for crossing large spaces of sloping land, allowing you to roll down hills very quickly. The steeper the slope, the faster you'll go. Although I will admit, I do still prefer the traditional spin dash from the adventure games for example. Don't get me wrong, I like being able to spin dash straight from a jump, but I also like to be able to stop and charge up my spin dash manually. Being able to do both really would be the best of both worlds. In actual fact, in a Sonic Frontiers update that came out post-launch, Sonic Team actually reintroduced the manual spin dash, which I think is really cool, and it does a lot for the game's movement. Now, I'm not going to go into detail with the post-launch updates just yet. This section of the video is meant to be solely about the base game, but at the end of the video, I do have a very long section talking about the updates and the post-launch DLC, so all of that stuff will be covered later on, but I wanted this video to be very chronological. With that covered, let's move swiftly on. Sonic's movement and controls whilst running in Frontiers is actually the best we've had in a long time. When running, his turning circle is nice and sharp, without being too sharp to the point where he becomes uncontrollable when you have to make a quick turn. This makes crossing the islands on foot very viable, allowing the player more control so that you can veer off at any point to begin platforming, grinding rails, or to interact with a side activity. I can't fully explain just how fun it is to find a nice long stretch of land, hold down the boost button, and just zoom across the map at breakneck speed. Those moments of pure speed are some of the most fun I've had playing Sonic Frontiers. Speaking of boosting, the boost is much different in this game when compared to previous games from Sonic's boost era. Boosting is no longer powered by rings, but is actually an intrinsic trait that Sonic can activate so long as your boost meter is full, which recharges naturally when you're not boosting. It also isn't as ridiculously fast as it was in previous games, which makes it more manageable and allows the player to quickly stop boosting to interact with the world. Although I will say Sonic speed does become less manageable the higher you level it up. You can level up Sonic speed over the course of the game from level 1 to level 99, but I honestly think the speed becomes too much after a certain point, specifically regarding platforming. As you upgrade Sonic speed stat, even though the speed is more fun in the more open spaces where you have lots of space to run around in, his increased speed makes precise platforming a lot more difficult. And this is because a lot of the platforming sections that are scattered around the open worlds are built for Sonic's slower speeds, not his max speed. Something else I noticed was that if you reach max rings in the open world, Sonic will go into a powered up state in which he runs at max speed when you boost. This is fine, I actually thought it was pretty cool that you got a reward for not taking damage and collecting max rings, and it doesn't greatly affect the experience because it only activates if you have max rings. All you need to do if you want to go slower is not collect too many rings or just intentionally take damage to get below that threshold. It's a bit annoying at worst, but manageable. However, if you level up Sonic Speed to level 99, you constantly remain in that powered up state. I think the powered up state should have been unattainable by upgrading any of Sonic's abilities. That way, it will remain special throughout the entire game. Having the speed as a rare bonus is nice, but having to play with it 100% of the time can be difficult. A lot of the platforming in the open world is built with Sonic's slower boosting speed in mind, so constantly going at max speed makes it difficult to platform effectively, and almost always ends up with me losing my flow, but maybe that's just a skill issue. I will admit, as I got more used to the mechanics of the game, I became better at controlling Sonic at high speeds, but some of the platforming sections still are a little bit janky. There's also a heavy influence on grinding rails in Sonic Frontiers. The way certain rails are structured across the islands creates this sort of rail system, in which it's possible to hop from one rail to another in order to travel great distances. 
Grinding rails in this game is particularly satisfying. I think it's a combination of the increased aerial control, as well as the more understated boost, making grinding rails feel as smooth as butter. Rails are pretty integral to movement in Frontiers because not only can you use them to travel across the map quickly, but you can also use them to launch yourself into a certain direction by jumping off the rail mid-grind. For some reason, when you jump off a rail in this game, Sonic almost launches himself into a glide which propels you forwards with enough momentum to carry you across to faraway ledges, platforms, and even other rail routes. This means you can create a really fun chain of movement across the world, using rails to reach platforms, bounce pads and zip lines which lead to more rails which allows you to start the chain again. If you pair this momentum after jumping off of a rail with a well-timed double jump and a mid-air boost, you can reach areas that are surprisingly far away without issue. I use this all the time in my playthrough, as it served as a way to reach areas that would normally require their own platforming section to reach. In my first playthrough, I basically completely ignored rails in favour of running, but I'm so glad I interacted with them more on a second playthrough, because they really are the glue that holds the worlds of Sonic Frontiers together. It's just such a shame that they look so ugly floating in the sky, popping in every now and then due to low render distances. Now we've come to the moment I'm sure you've all been waiting for. Physics. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to come right out of the gate and say the physics really disappointed me in this game, or the lack of physics I should say. This mainly refers to Sonic's momentum when running across the open world, the main problem being that he has no momentum. When running down a hill or slope, you'd expect Sonic to gradually gain speed the further he runs down. Sonic's mass should pull him down the hill faster as his velocity increases, but this isn't how physics work in Sonic Frontiers. You can run down a hill without boosting, and Sonic's base running speed remains the same, slow speed, which just doesn't make any sense. This means that the only way to gain speed in Frontiers is by boosting or running over a dash panel, which I think goes against the original philosophy of speed via momentum being a reward for playing the game well and engaging with every aspect of the movement system to retain your speed as you move through an area. I was really hoping that Sonic Team had heard the complaints about the lack of momentum physics in modern Sonic games and would figure out a way to incorporate it into Sonic Frontiers this time around, but it's clear they're still having issues with this. Just imagine how great it would feel if you could gain speed on foot without boosting, coming to a large slope and running down to reach a high speed. This would make traversing the open world immediately more engaging, as players would have the freedom to choose when and when not to boost, instead of just holding down the boost button indefinitely, then waiting for it to recharge. There were so many times where I'd run out of boost in the middle of running down a hill, and then my momentum just immediately stopped. It was always such a disappointment, because realistically, I should still be moving at the speed I was before. What makes the lack of momentum whilst running even stranger is that they incorporated some momentum physics into the spin dash. Launching into a spin dash at the top of a hill will cause Sonic to exponentially gain speed on the way down so long as he continues rolling, but the moment you come out of a spin dash, the momentum almost immediately dissipates. There's also momentum physics when jumping off rails, like we talked about earlier. When boost jumping off of rails, the momentum gained whilst grinding isn't lost. Sonic gains a massive amount of momentum which launches him through the air, which we established can be used to the player's advantage to traverse the world much quicker. I don't understand why they included momentum physics into the spin dash and rail jumping, but not when Sonic is running, which is arguably when momentum is most important. You also lose all momentum when jumping out of a boost, which again feels wrong. We should be able to boost while running to build momentum, jump and retain all that momentum we gain during the boost, which will cause the jump to launch Sonic through the air at high speeds. This would be particularly useful for clearing hills and other obstacles in the world. Boost up a hill, jump right at the top and then watch yourself soar through the sky before hitting the ground again and retaining the momentum you gained in the air. It would be so satisfying. And coincidentally, almost like a Sonic team was reading my thoughts while I was writing the script for this video. In update 2 of Sonic Frontiers, they actually added a bunch of physics modifiers that the player can change at will. And this includes jump deceleration and the deceleration rate. Now there were a few modifiers when the game came out that allowed you to change the bounce height, the acceleration, the steering sensitivity, your top speed, your boost turning speed, that sort of thing. But they added in this deceleration speed and jump deceleration speed modifier. And honestly, the game feels incredibly good to play when you have the deceleration speed turned down, meaning that Sonic isn't just gonna suddenly slow down when you jump 
or when you try and run down an incline. There's actually a level of momentum there. Now, it's not to the level that I wanted it to be, but it's something. And I actually really respect Sonic Team for going back and adding this in as a free update. It's really cool that they're listening to the fans of the series, and it actually makes me really excited to see where they're going to take the physics of Sonic games in a sequel to Frontiers, because I feel like great things are just on the horizon. Sonic Frontiers is the first Sonic game in a long time with a heavy focus on combat. Combat in Sonic games rarely steps out of the boundaries of the homing attack, but Sonic Frontiers introduces a whole new combat system more akin to what you'd expect from other AAA action adventure titles. In addition to the standard homing attack, Sonic can punch, kick and string together all sorts of moves to create combos that really add a whole new layer of depth to Sonic combat. I won't lie, it's by no means the most advanced combat system, but it certainly does a lot for combat in Sonic games, especially when compared to previous titles. Sonic is now able to string together combos, indicated by the combo meter on the side of the screen when you hit enemies. Sonic's base combat abilities consist of the homing attack, melee attacks and stomp, with two new base abilities being parrying and siloop. The parrying stance is activated by holding down both L1 and R1. Unlike other games, the parrying in Sonic Frontiers does not require you to time your button press with the enemy's attack in order to successfully parry. Simply holding down both bumpers will trigger a parry when an enemy's attack makes contact with Sonic. Parrying is useful against most enemies, especially because it negates all damage as long as you're holding down those buttons. As for the Psyloop, it can be activated by holding triangle. This creates a glowing trail behind Sonic that can be used to stun enemies if you run around them in a circle and link both ends of the trail together. This move is a especially useful against smaller enemies because it allows you to stun them, break their defense and launch them into the air. So Sonic's got plenty of new base abilities to use in combat, but what are some of the actual combat related abilities you gain as you progress through the game? Sonic's new combo skills consist of Phantom Rush, Sonic Boom, Wild Rush, Stomp Attack, Quick Psyloop, Homing Shot, Loop Kick, Spin Slash, Recovery Smash, Grand Slam, Cyclone Kick and Cross Slash. Most of these skills are activated by first starting a combo with the homing attack, then using the correct button combination that corresponds with the skill you want to use. For example, if I wanted to use the kick loop ability, all I have to do is press R2 and circle in midair. Or if I wanted to use the spin slash ability, I have to press X during a combo. They're very simple and easy to activate, but there's plenty of abilities to use which helps keep each combat encounter fresh as you work out the best ways to activate combos on the fly. As much as I quite liked the addition of new combos, I would have also liked an option to go in for more homing attacks after the initial combo starter. It really takes too much of a backseat in this game in my opinion. Anyway, if you get good at filling the combo meter together by performing lots of consecutive abilities without getting hit, you can fill the combo meter up to max, which allows Sonic to activate his Phantom Rush special ability. This ability is meant to simulate Sonic moving so fast and delivering so many blows in quick succession that he's just a blur around the enemy. It's super satisfying activating this ability, especially on bosses. It's just a shame really because most enemies are defeated too quickly for Phantom Rush to even proc. I do quite like the new combat system and I think it lays the foundation for further improvement. As much as it is a very bare bones system, I have hope that Sonic Team will improve upon it in the next installment. But how exactly do we obtain these new abilities? It's not like you have all of them as soon as you start the game, because then there'd be no sense of progression across the game. Well, this is where stat leveling and the skill tree comes into the mix. You can collect skill pieces in the open world by defeating enemies, defeating guardians, destroying objects, and uncovering dig spots. Once you've accumulated enough skill pieces, you can use them to purchase new abilities from the skill tree. As you progress further down the skill tree, the skills become more expensive, meaning you have to engage with more activities to collect more skill pieces, and the cycle continues until you've unlocked them all. But this isn't the only form of leveling you can do in Sonic Frontiers. I mentioned during the movement and physics section of this video that you can upgrade Sonic's speed stat to level 99. The same goes for Sonic's ring capacity, defense, and power levels. To upgrade Sonic's stats, you have to find two M NPCs that exist on each island, Elder Coco and Hermit Coco. Elder Coco is a large stone creature which can be distinguished by its spiky headpiece and rounded shape. The Elder Coco has long since forgotten its own name and its true purpose, however it dedicates its time to protecting the lost Coco across the Starfall Islands. If you speak with the Elder Coco for the first time, it asks you to look out for any lost Coco and bring them to them for a reward. But what actually are Coco? 
Coco are small, stone-like creatures that appear all throughout Sonic Frontiers. They resemble Chow from previous Sonic games, both in their appearance and personalities. We find out through the story that Coco were once used as good luck charms by the Ancients, and they eventually used them as containers to store their spirits. Assuming that there are no Ancients left in the universe, the Coco are all that remain of their hopes, dreams, personalities, and emotions. It is the duty of the Elder Coco to collect the Lost Coco and care for them, because in this state they are unable to do so for themselves. This is why the Elder Coco asks Sonic to keep an eye out for Lost Coco, and even offers a reward in return. The reward is increasing Sonic's power, specifically his ring capacity and speed. You will quickly accumulate Coco as you explore the Starfall Islands, and the more Coco you have, the more you can increase your ring capacity and speed. However, there's one really huge issue with the upgrading process. When speaking with the Elder Coco, you can only go up one level at a time, meaning you have to keep selecting the dialogue option again and again until you've returned all of your Coco. This means that the leveling process takes ages. For example, if you had enough Coco to level up from level 1 to 99, you'd have to press the X button 98 individual times to get there. And this isn't including the couple seconds it takes to exhaust the Elder Coco's dialogue after getting an upgrade. I was sitting there for what felt like forever leveling up. It's just such a painfully long process. This is just really poor game design. Upgrading your speed and ring capacity is not where the upgrading ends though, because you can also upgrade Sonic's defense and power by going to the Hermit Coco. The Hermit Coco can be identified by its tall and slender stature which is abnormal for Coco, as well as its distinct mossy beard. Hermit Coco spent their time sleeping, whilst dormant they're able to commune and interact with the cyberspace, which I found to be quite an interesting concept, but it's not really explored all that much bar one piece of dialogue. I can't actually find much information on how or why the Hermit Coco does this, but it sounds cool so I'm happy to just let him doze off whenever he wants, he's a chill guy. In order to level up Sonic's defense and power stats, you need to collect red power seeds and blue defense seeds across the Starfall Islands. These are quite easy easy to come by and can be obtained by defeating enemies, destroying objects, or using the side loop ability on dig spots. You'll most likely obtain lots of each type of seed through naturally exploring the world. When you want to level up, all you need to do is find the Hermit Coco, speak to it, and it'll level up your stats based on how many seeds you have. I might mention that the process of grading through the Hermit Coco is instant, as he takes all of your seeds and gives you the corresponding amount of levels in one transaction, instead of making you manually select the dialogue option to go up one level each time, which makes it even more infuriating when you have to go to the Elder Coco to level up speed and ring capacity. Why don't they both just use the same upgrade system? Why do they use two different methods? Why can't I just manually select how many seeds or cocoa I want to put into certain abilities? It just doesn't make sense. So yeah, Sonic Frontiers is the first mainline Sonic game to include proper RPG mechanics when it comes to upgrading Sonic stats. And I'm not a fan of this approach at all, really. This goes for both leveling stats and using skill points to purchase new abilities. I hate to be the guy that constantly compares modern Sonic to the Adventure era, but if we take a look at how upgrades worked in the original Sonic Adventure games, we can see that there's a natural progression of Sonic's abilities throughout the game as you progress further through the story. In the original Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2, you can find upgrades in the form of items that Sonic can equip, such as the light speed shoes, the crystal ring, ancient light, bounce bracelet, flame ring, magic gloves and mystic melody. I always thought that these were really creative ways to give players new abilities and to show Sonic's power progression. Instead of just going into a menu and unlocking these abilities via skill points, they're actually tangible items in the world that can be found and collected to make your experience easier. So many games now adopt light RPG mechanics, and I think it's just uninspired when compared to what we used to have. I just don't personally think leveling up your stats via putting skill points into a skill tree has any place in a mainline Sonic game and I would have preferred a more story-based and contextual way of increasing Sonic's power level. Sonic Team could have lent into the whole ancient technology idea, and had Sonic find various pieces of ancient tech that would allow him to perform more abilities, much like the level up items from the adventure games. Or they could have linked his increase in power to his cyber corruption. As his exposure to the cyberspace corrupts his corporeal form more, he gets more powerful, meaning when you defeat a titan and move on to another island, you get a large bump in power which gives you more skills and abilities 
ability to use on the next island. Honestly, I would have taken anything over a boring light RPG skill point system. I also don't think it's necessary to be able to upgrade Sonic's ring capacity, speed, defense, or power. It just feels to me like adding RPG mechanics from other popular franchises simply because it's popular right now, not because these mechanics lend themselves well to a Sonic game. Not to mention that when you upgrade your stats to max, Sonic becomes incredibly unbalanced. Being able to tank too much damage, making fights too easy to survive, dealing too much damage to enemies, making fights end too quickly because you're so strong, and running too fast, meaning you can't reasonably control Sonic for high-speed platforming. Even when playing on the hardest difficulty, everything just became too easy. The only thing that doesn't affect the gameplay is ring capacity, but even then I think it's just a pointless feature. Why cap my ring capacity in the first place? If you're one of the people who doesn't mind the RPG mechanics in Sonic Frontiers, then that's fine. I'm glad you enjoyed it. The intention of this video is not to convince you to dislike it, but to raise the opinions I formed while playing the game. As someone who's noticed the amount of franchises opting to include light RPG mechanics in recent years, it just gets tiring when every single game does the same thing, instead of leaning into the more traditional concepts that worked just fine. Overall, I appreciate the layer of depth that Sonic Team tried to put into the upgrading system, but to me it just comes across as a desperate attempt to be more like an RPG like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, instead of being a Sonic game. Alright, having discussed the movement, physics, combat, and leveling, I think it's time we get into the main bulk of this game. The primary gameplay loop. The main gameplay loop of Sonic Frontiers is, get ready for it, a collectathon. Yeah, it's... It really isn't that exciting. You're going to be spending a good 90% of your time collecting specific items around the world in order to progress the story. And the main thing that keeps this process fun isn't the content you'll engage with, but the movement you'll perform whilst racing from one objective to the next. There are three main types of items to collect. Cogs to access cyberspace stages, keys to access chaos emeralds, and memory tokens in order to progress quests, which progress the main story. There are also side stories that can be interacted with by using memory tokens, but we'll talk more about those in a later section of this video. So, let's get into it. Before we discuss the items we'll be collecting throughout the game, as well as what they do, first we need to discuss challenges, because they're important to how you explore and interact with the world. Challenges are short activities scattered across each island that Sonic must interact with in order to reveal parts of the map on the map screen. There are 105 in total, and they have Sonic partaking in all sorts of miscellaneous challenges, if you can even call them challenges in the first place. The term challenge applies to these activities very loosely because they're not challenges at all. These activities have you performing riveting tasks such as standing on three buttons, homing attacking a ball into a hoop, parrying three projectiles using Psyloop on three trees, or the most riveting of all, creating a weird statue out of Tetris blocks. Yeah, most of these challenges are really mundane things that really don't feel like challenges, which is yet again another missed opportunity. Not to mention that some challenges can only be completed at night time, and with no way to manually change the time of day, you're going to be waiting around for a while. Don't get me wrong, I think there are some fun ones in here, like the time trials where Sonic has to race to step on a button, the ones where you have to follow a route of gates to reach the end before the timer runs out, or the ones where you've got to deal a certain amount of damage before the timer runs out, but most of them are really unremarkable. I would have loved it if they embraced more of the challenge side of these activities and had various intense time trials or difficult combat challenges, not just stand on these three buttons and there you go, you did it, well done, now you can look at the map. In fact, I think it's really uninspired to have an unfog the map feature in the first place. It's a Sonic game, not Far Cry or Assassin's Creed. There's literally no reason for there to be an unfog map activity besides padding out the open world world with more pointless stuff that isn't even fun to interact with anyways. Instead, I think it would have been really cool if these challenges had you completing difficult or fast time trials for example, where Sonic has to complete a set route under a specific time in order to pass the challenge, or a difficult combat arena challenge which pits Sonic against large groups of tough enemies with a time limit, forcing you to string together long combos to complete the challenge. Hell, if this game actually featured momentum physics, you could even have challenges revolving around that, maybe one that requires you to reach a certain amount of 
airtime, using your momentum to launch yourself into the air off of an incline. I'm just spitballing ideas at this point, but surely there's more engaging challenges than what we got. These challenges would have to be actual challenges too, possibly taking players multiple attempts to complete because they're hard. At the end of the day, they're supposed to be hard. The only issue is, if these challenges were suitably hard, there's no worthwhile reward to gain in this game. The only items I can think of that could be awarded to the player for completing these challenges is a significantly large quantity of upgrade seeds, cocoa and memory tokens for completing each one. Meaning that players who are skilled at the game are rewarded with plenty of resources to keep them on track to complete the main story without having to collect them in the open world. I'd also say it'd be better if there were less of these challenges across each map if we went with my idea of fleshing out each challenge more. This way the developers could dedicate more time to making each challenge feel unique and fleshed out instead of recycling the same activities to make up the 105 challenges. And players wouldn't just be able to farm the challenges and speed to the end of the game without engaging with the world itself. I just really don't think defogging the map makes for riveting content, especially when the challenges to defog the map consist of such mundane things. That's just my take on it. However, challenges are useful for another reason in Entirely. Once you complete a challenge, not only does the map become defogged, but it also spawns a sky rail that can be used to travel to another part of the map. Once you've completed all of the challenges on a map, you'll notice that there are a lot more rails leading to and from the completed challenge nodes. Given their frequent placement on the map, you're never too far away from another rail system, which really helps when travelling, especially across the larger islands. This leads me to believe that the challenges were intended mainly for this purpose, so the player can gradually make the map easier to reverse the more they interact with and complete challenges. So at least the challenges do offer some form of reward, and I gotta say, a system of sky rails to traverse the map quicker and easier is a pretty decent one at that. It's just a shame the challenges themselves weren't actually challenges. And much like how Sonic Team retroactively fixed Sonic's movement slightly by adding in more momentum based mechanics in an update of Sonic Frontiers, they actually added in Battle Rush mode, Action Chain challenges and Coco challenges in the open world. And each of these three focuses on a core aspect of Sonic gameplay, with Battle Rush focusing on combat, Action Chain focusing on movement, and the Coco challenges focusing on puzzle solving and platforming. I think these challenges are the types of challenges we should have been getting in the base game of Sonic Frontiers. It would have made the experience so much more engaging. It's actually really cool that these updates made this game tangibly better, but as I said, I'm not going to be talking about the updates until later on in the video because I want this section of the video to encompass my initial thoughts about the game. The updates are all well and good, but I'm of the opinion that the updated version of Sonic Frontiers is the game we should have gotten at release. And I'm not going to throw my criticisms of the base game away simply because they went and retroactively updated it. Hopefully Sonic Team can use their experience of Sonic Frontiers and make the next mainline Sonic game something truly, truly special. After completing the challenges and defogging the map, we can finally start the Collectathon. The first item, Cogs, can be obtained by fighting the various Guardian bosses across each open world area. Honestly, I actually really like these fights. Each island has a set of Guardians that are unique to that area each of which have different strengths and weaknesses, forcing the player to use all of Sonic's abilities to beat them. There are four Guardians on Kronos Island, Ninja, Tower, Asura, and Squid. Four on Ares Island, Shark, Strider, Sumo, and Tank. Five on Chaos Island, Spider, Shinobi, Fortress, Squid, and Excavator. And six on Oranos Island, Red Pillar, Caterpillar, Kunoichi, Ghost, Master Ninja, and Silver Hammer. So yeah, there's plenty of Guardians to fight, all with very cool and unique designs. It's clear that the developers put a lot of time into each of these fights in order to make them feel different from one another. This is the type of passion I love to see, where it's evident that a lot of care, time and attention went into developing something. I feel as if the developers and artists were given freedom of creativity with these fights and enemy designs. I really enjoyed them, and paired with Sonic's new combat system, I found myself fighting these guardians just for the fun of it, even if I didn't need the cogs. I will admit though, the names that they decided to go for each of the guardians are pretty uninspired. Thought provoking names Names like Squid or Ninja or even Tower, like what? Specifically, why is this ninja? Because honestly, it just makes me think of the Fortnite guy. The font that comes up to announce the boss just looks like the Fortnite font too, so it just fits perfectly. The fuck you say to me, you little shit! <laughs> how are you how are you not in fucking school? 
You kiss your mother with that mouth? It's called you ki it's called you kiss your mother with that fucking mouth? Because the fucking youth of society- You shut up when I'm talking to you! You shut your mouth! This joke seems really out of date, like who the fuck talks about ninja anymore? But yeah, my point is that I really wish the names of each of the guardians reflected something about the lore of the island. That little bit of depth will go a long way for world building in my opinion. Other than that though, the guardians are really fun and add a nice dynamic layer to the open worlds. One of my favourites was Asura, which has you running up the legs of this huge mech in order to reach the weak points at the top. This fight really makes use of Sonic's movement, verticality and combos, it's just a really nice spectacle. I will say though, some of the physics are a bit off during this fight, making Sonic hard to control sometimes when you're running up Asura's leg. Another one I really enjoyed was Fortress, which again requires speed to be defeated. This boss has you grinding on rails behind it, slowly catching up the more you boost and dodge its attacks. Eventually you catch up to it and can deal damage. It's a really fun fight and again it's a very impressive spectacle. Similar to the Fortress, the Squid is another boss that requires you to chase the enemy before being able to do damage, only instead of grinding on rails to catch it, you're you're running on a long purple ribbon with three lanes, using the bumpers to change position when the squid fires projectiles at you. Eventually you catch up to the squid and can deal damage. And of course, I can't ignore the whole squid meme. It's fucking hilarious when you go to fight a squid and it comes up with squid on the screen and it just stares at you. It, oh god, I love it so it's fucking hilarious. Lastly, because otherwise we'd be here all day talking about all the guardians, I liked the master ninja fight. I actually think this boss is really fun. It has an interesting moveset with slash attacks, teleportation, shields, and a really cool move where it spawns four clones and throws them all at you in quick succession, forcing you to parry. I think this had great potential as a mini boss, but it just has such a low health pool. You end up absolutely decimating it before you get a chance to see all of its moves if you've leveled your attack power enough by the time you reach Uranus Island. As much as I really like some of the guardians in this game, it is a shame that some of them just seem to be reskins of guardians from previous islands. For example, the Shinobi, Kunoichi, and Master Ninja are all reskins of the Ninja boss, and the Excavator, Red Pillar, and Silver Hammer are all reskins of the Tower boss. Although, for the most part, the Guardians are unique. Also, fuck the Caterpillar boss. This thing decimated me one too many times because the physics when you're grinding on the rails just don't work properly. Every time a Caterpillar spotted me, I'd run away as fast as I could. So yeah, the Guardians are part of this game that I think is really cool, and they reward you with a cool little glowing cog. But what exactly is the purpose of the cogs? Why do we collect them? Well, scattered on the map are portals like the one in the introduction cutscene with Eggman. These portals lead into cyberspace stages. We've already played through cyberspace stage 1-1, one, one, which was Green Hill Zone, but there are plenty more scattered across the map with varying themes, layouts, and lengths. After defeating enough guardians and collecting a few cogs, you can go to one of these portals and use the cogs you collected to unlock the cyberspace stages, which as we established, a shorter versions of the traditional boost stages with a few optional objectives thrown in there, giving the diehard fans of traditional Sonic stages something to play in between open world exploration. We talked briefly about cyberspace stages at the beginning of this video, and I voiced my concerns about the uninspired nature of these stages, and how they just take areas from previous Sonic games and change them ever so slightly. It's clear that these stages were added to appease fans of the old structure of stage and zone based levels, but I also think they serve as a subtle way to celebrate Sonic's 30th anniversary, because the cyberspace stages draw heavy influence from Sonic's past. The old Sonic game's influence can be seen in two main aspects of these cyberspace stages. The first and most obvious aspect being the theme of the stages themselves. Each cyberspace stage uses a theme from one of four classic Sonic zones, including Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1, Chemical Plant Zone from Sonic 2, Sky Sanctuary from Sonic 3, and what can only be described as Speed Highway from Sonic Adventure, but I may be wrong in assuming that the highway stages are meant to be Speed Highway, they could just be a completely new aesthetic. I was actually sort of interested when I learned that each cyberspace stage was going to reintroduce zones from previous Sonic 
Fortnite games. But upon learning that only four zones would make a return, I quickly realised how boring these cyberspace stages would become from an aesthetic standpoint. They ideally should have gone all out here and had visual themes from zones from all different eras of Sonic, like for example Metal Harbor from Sonic Adventure 2, Grand Metropolis from Sonic Heroes, Holoska from Sonic Unleashed, or Tropical Resort from Sonic Colors just to name a few. Hell, it would have even been nice to see something like Kingdom Valley or Crisis City from Sonic 06. If you're going to design the cyberspace stages using aesthetic influence from zones from previous Sonic games, it would have been way cooler if they used zones from all eras of Sonic, instead of just the first four games. It's really disappointing and just seems to me like they were rushing and didn't have the time to fully explore the idea of the cyberspace pulling fragments from Sonic's memory to create these spaces, and ended up only being able to use four zones. I don't blame the developers for this however, I just think Sonic Frontiers was pushed out before it reached its full potential and would have really benefited from more time and development. The second influence from previous Sonic games is the physical layout of each stage. To give a few examples, Portal 1-1 takes the layout from Windmill Isle which is the first stage in Sonic Unleashed. Portal 1-7 takes the layout from City Escape which is the first stage in Sonic Adventure 2. Portal 2-4 takes the layout from Shadow's version of Radical Highway from Sonic Adventure 2 and of course Portal 3.3 takes the layout from Sky Sanctuary Act 2 from Sonic Generations. So these stages may not take on the theme of old zones, but their layouts are callbacks to old Sonic stages. This is actually really cool. When I first found out that the cyberspace stages actually took on the form of stages from previous Sonic games, after finishing each cyberspace stage I'd search up the original stage and watch how similar it is to the recreation in Frontiers. Although again, there's not enough diversity in terms of which Sonic games they take stages from. Cyberspace stages only follow the structure of stages from Sonic Adventure 2, Sonic Unleashed and Sonic Generations. Which is a shame, because there's lots of games I would have loved to see stages taken from such as Heroes. 06, Secret Rings, or the original Sonic Adventure. Honestly, all Sonic Team had to do to make the cyberspace stages much cooler and impactful while sticking to the idea of the cyberspace taking Sonic's memories was to create direct remakes of stages from all eras of Sonic. Not only would this have been cooler, but it would have been a really fun and creative way to celebrate 30 years of Sonic. If the cyberspace is taking Sonic's memories and creating digital spaces out of them, wouldn't it be cool if we could play old stages almost exactly how they were in their respective games, with revisions made to accommodate new visuals and boost gameplay? Why would the cyberspace opt to make a Green Hill Zone variant of Windmill Isle from Sonic Unleashed, instead of just recreating Windmill Isle how it is in Sonic's memory? It just doesn't make sense from a story perspective. Additionally, something I realised is that a striking amount of the cyberspace stage themes and layouts are taken from Sonic Generations, and it's obvious why. It's easier to rip assets and level designs from Sonic Generations because it's a much more recent game running on an earlier version of the same engine that Sonic Frontiers uses. And if we look at the zones they chose to bring back assets from, Green Hill Zone, Chemical Plant Zone, Sky Sanctuary, and potentially even Speed Highway, Way, each of them are in fact the returning stages that were remade in Sonic Generations. It's just clear to me that they cut as many corners as possible when creating the cyberspace stages, and then tried to cover it up by coming up with the loose excuse of, the cyberspace just takes stuff from Sonic's memories. If that was the case, then why does the cyberspace only choose from the first four games? Does Sonic only remember Sonic 1, 2, 3 and Adventure? And why does it only take level structure from three Sonic games? And why does Sonic remember Radical Highway in the first place? That wasn't even a Sonic stage, it was a Shadow stage. They had a great idea with these cyberspace cyberspace stages. Not only is it actually a really creative way of celebrating Sonic's 30th anniversary without making another generations, but it's a great way to incorporate that traditional linear level based gameplay into a game that's all about open zones and freedom of exploration. But they just about missed the mark with these unfortunately, and I ended up just feeling disappointed, as if these stages could have been so much more if given more time to be realised. But that doesn't mean there isn't fun to be had in the cyberspace stages anyway. They serve as a nice break from running around the open world, and adds a nice stash of familiarity to a game that's really trying to break the mould of traditional Sonic linearity. I'd say the most fun I had trying to beat these stages was trying to get the S rank in all of them, whilst also completing all of the optional objectives. They're very short, snappy levels that almost feel like mini challenge speedruns, and they've got a lot of replayability because of this. 
To get an S rank, you have to get a perfect time. And with the levels being so short, that doesn't leave an awful lot of room for error. So you have to learn the stage's layout and enemy placement if you want to finish in a good time. It's honestly a ton of fun learning a new stage and trying to optimize your run to finish in the quickest amount of time possible. Which brings to mind the infamous Cyberspace Stage 1-2, which had the Sonic community scratching their heads when the game first came out. You have to achieve a time of 55 seconds or less to get the S rank, but with how much ground you have to cover, many players found it nearly impossible to get. Personally, I'm built different so I got it after a few tries, but it was definitely noticeably harder than the later cyberspace stages. I think in the end I only managed to get a time of around 54 seconds, just one second under the S rank threshold. But people have taken it to new levels, getting speedrun times of down to 34 seconds by using certain tricks and skips to cut down time. It's honestly really cool to see people pushing the boundaries on this particular stage, and it shows that Sonic speedrunning isn't dead just yet. Sonic Frontiers also includes original level design in some of the cyberspace stages too, which I actually really appreciated. It shows that Sonic Team are still interested in creating new linear stages and haven't completely forgotten about this important aspect of Sonic game design. Not to mention that these stages are actually pretty good, with a lot of them even offering alternate routes and different ways of reaching the end of the stage, which is exactly what I want to see. Linear stages should offer many different routes through the stage. Not only is it more fun, but it also adds a great deal of replay value to each stage because you can play it differently each time. Pair the alternate routes with optional objectives to complete and you've got yourself a really replayable stage that's fun to load up time and time again, which may even encourage players to replay it simply to beat their personal best time. I actually found myself really enjoying the cyberspace stages in this game, it's just a shame they're visually very boring because of the lack of variety in stage themes. In terms of movement, it's still not perfect. There's a severe lack of momentum when running down slopes, and Sonic's base running speed is absolutely pathetic which forces you to boost nearly at all times, which kind of defeats the point of having a boost feature. In Sonic Unleashed for example, Sonic can still reach very fast speeds while not boosting, but the boost serves as a way to go at ridiculous speeds, with the trade-off being a lack of control. In Frontiers however, choosing not to boost during a stage is not viable, as Sonic's base running speed is just too slow. He also controls significantly worse in the cyberspace stage as opposed to the open world areas, where he actually controls pretty smoothly. In the cyberspace, his turns are a lot wider and there's no drift ability like there was in previous games, which leads to some corners being hard to clear without hitting the borders or falling off the edge entirely. Sonic's movement in the cyberspace stages is not necessarily as exhilarating as Generations or Unleashed, but his movement is satisfying in Frontiers in its own right, and I had a lot of fun playing these cyberspace stages and timing my boost to coincide with slopes and dash pads, although I could have done without the 2.5D stages. Of all the stages to bring back, why would Sonic Team choose to bring back classic Sonic stages from generations. I much prefer the 3D stages that have 2.5D sections thrown in the mix every now and then. Sonic's speed is much slower in 2.5D, and this slower pace is much less exciting than the fast paced 3D stages, which just made me groan whenever I realised I was playing a 2.5D only stage. Although I will say, even the 2.5D stages have a stronger focus on platforming, which I really appreciated. So even though I didn't enjoy these stages as much as the 3D ones, at least they demonstrate that Sonic Team wants to integrate more platforming into linear stages, which I see as a win. The cyberspace stages have so much going for them, but also so much that holds them back. I just can't help but shake the feeling that if this game was given much longer in development, Sonic Team could have really fleshed out this aspect of the game and created a collection of linear stages that not only explored all 30 years of Sonic's history through returning stages, but also offered a great linear Sonic experience. I enjoyed these stages for sure, they're the best linear stages we've gotten since Sonic Generations, but they could have been so much more than what we got, which ultimately leaves me thinking that this was another missed opportunity. Upon completing a cyberspace stage, you are rewarded with a key or keys depending on how many optional objectives you completed. The optional objectives in the cyberspace stages consist of completing the stage, finishing the stage with a certain amount of rings, finishing the stage with an S rank, and collecting all of the red star rings. If you complete all of the optional objectives on each cyberspace stage as you come across them, then you will always have enough keys to unlock every Chaos Emerald in one go. This is why I made an effort to finish all the cyberspace stages on each island before even interacting with the story. You can 
can also collect keys sometimes by using the Psy loop on dig spots. This isn't a very reliable source for keys because it only gives you one and is not guaranteed to give you any. But what exactly are the keys used for? Well, on each island, the seven Chaos Emeralds are scattered across the map. Each emerald is contained in an altar, so to be able to collect them, you need to use the keys. In order to defeat each titan on each of the islands, you must collect the Chaos Emeralds to become supersonic so that you're strong enough to fight them. But we'll talk more about the main bosses in more detail later. All you need to know for now is that collecting the Chaos Emeralds is the main goal of each island, and at the end of each island you get to become supersonic to fight the respective boss of that area. It's actually pretty cool in concept. It's really rare that we get to turn into supersonic multiple times in a Sonic game. It's something that's usually reserved for the final boss of the story. So, cyberspace stages are integral to your progress in the story. If you don't have keys, you can't get the Chaos Emeralds, and without the Chaos Emeralds, you can't progress to the next island. However, there are some emeralds that can't be obtained through keys. Instead, you have to progress the quest of whichever character is trapped on that island. For example, Amy is trapped on Kronos Island, Knuckles is on Ares Island, and Tails is on Chaos Island. In order to progress any given character's story and collect all the emeralds, you have to help them with certain tasks on the island, which mainly consists of helping Coco. And oh boy, we'll talk about about that later. So it's time to do more item collecting, but this time we're looking for memory tokens, which is a whole grind in of itself. So, how do you obtain these memory tokens across each map? All sorts of ways, actually. Once you've cleared the map and had a chance to look around, you'll notice that there are specific icons on the map. Heart-shaped memory tokens for Amy on Kronos Island, metal-shaped memory tokens for Knuckles on Ares Island, and wrench-shaped memory tokens for Tails on Chaos Island. As I mentioned earlier, you must progress each character's story in order to collect all of the Chaos Emeralds. For example, to obtain the pink, turquoise, and green Chaos Emeralds on Kronos Island, you have to progress Amy's story past a certain point. Similarly, to open up necessary areas of the map to obtain the red, green, turquoise, and pink Chaos Emeralds on Chaos Island, you have to progress Tails' storyline. This means that memory tokens are integral to completing this game's story, but how do you obtain memory tokens and what are the best ways of finding them? Well, Memory tokens can primarily be found in and around the open world. Within open zone fields, tokens are scattered around different places, either on floating platforms, rails, or floating in midair like a trail of rings. The player has to reach the item's location by passing through linear obstacle courses while using common sonic gimmicks such as springboards, dash pads, jump panels, dash rings, and rainbow rings. Enemies can also drop memory tokens when defeated, but it's not guaranteed nor is it a very effective way to collect tokens. You can obtain tokens randomly from using Sonic's Psy Loop ability to create a full circle. You mainly get rings from doing this, but you can also be awarded with a small amount of tokens. However, honestly, this isn't a reliable or fast way to obtain them. You can also gain a decent deposit of tokens by interacting with dig spots using Sonic's Psy Loop ability, but tokens are, again, not guaranteed. Primarily, I like the fact that tokens collection is linked to just naturally exploring the open world and engaging with the game's platforming. All you need to do is mark an area that has tokens on your map, travel there, and then search for the tokens amongst the floating structures, platforms, and rails. This means that in between main story quests, the player has to engage with the open world and actually explore around if they want to progress, which can be really fun. I think the most fun I had in this game was just speeding around the open world spaces, trying to string together cool combinations of movement by running, spin dashing, grinding, jumping and boosting in order to reach memory tokens. However, that's not to say I think that this should be the only reason players want to interact with and explore the world. There should ideally be other factors beyond memory tokens which intrigue the player enough to explore outside of what's required for the main story. But there isn't, which is a much greater symptom of this game's design. Instead of Making the world inherently interesting and filled with mystery and content to uncover, which spurs the player to explore, they require the player to explore in order to collect memory tokens which you need in order to progress the game's story. You shouldn't have to force players into exploration, they should want to veer off from the main story to explore of their own accord. So, you can obtain memory tokens primarily through exploration, as well as through a few miscellaneous tasks that offer you extra tokens for your time. But what if I told you there was another secret third method of gaining tokens. This last method of gaining tokens gets you a very large quantity of tokens, and when I say large, 
I mean big. On Kronos, Ares, Chaos, and Oranos Islands, you can find what are known as fishing spots, which take the form of a stone monolith not unlike the portals that lead to the cyberspace stages. Only instead of glowing red, these monoliths grow purple. Upon interacting with the fishing spot, Sonic is teleported to a beautiful serene pond and is greeted by none other than Big the Cat. Boy am I glad to see this chill guy here. Sonic Frontiers has felt like nothing but a fever dream, but with this big round soft boy here to comfort us, we have nothing more to worry about. Even better is, he wants us to fish with him. But, but, but how, how do I do that George, I hear you say? Well, I'm here to teach you Fishing 101. So, before you get fishing, there's something you need to know. In order to fish with Big, you need a type of currency called Purple Coins. I don't know why Big needs these coins so badly, but he endlessly demands them like the hard-headed big shot capitalist business cat he is. Purple coins can be found in two ways. The first way to find them is to just run around the open world, naturally accruing purple coins as you explore new areas, which, as you can imagine, is incredibly slow. The second way is much more lucrative. You have to wait for a special world event called a Starfall event, which can only happen at night time. You'll know a Starfall event is happening when a meteor shower begins overhead and robots begin spawning out of the ground. During a Starfall, all breakable objects, items, enemies and guardians that you've defeated will respawn in their original locations. This happens to ensure that Sonic will never run out of things to collect in the open world, because every few days in game, everything in the world gets reset. However, memory tokens, portals to the cyberspace and defeated titans do not reset. Although the main attraction of the Starfall event is the array of multicolored beams of light emanating from the ground. At the foot of each of these is a star fragment. You'll notice a slot machine at the top of the screen whenever Sonic picks up a star fragment. Each fragment is used to spin the slot machine, which then awards you with purple coins depending on the slots you got. Honestly, it's almost like Sonic is just so addicted to gambling at this point after years of running through casinos that he's just playing the slots in his own mind. Because I have no idea where this slot machine comes from canonically, as there's no story excuse for it. It just happens. Maybe the ancients loved gambling, which would make sense as later in the game you have to play a large game of pinball using some ancient technology, which I might add is actually one of the worst pieces of content in this game. You have to accrue like 5 million points, which means it just takes forever to complete. Oh, and also it's mandatory to finish the main quest of Chaos Island, so no matter how badly you don't want to play it, the game just makes, it just forces you. What makes even less sense is that pinball is basically luck based. So when the ball falls out of play, your score multiplier goes back down to zero. You're literally punished for it, despite it not even being your fault because you're playing a mini game based on luck. This is actually trash game design and I hate it. On PC, fans have even created a mod that lets you entirely skip this part of the game. You know something's wrong with your game when diehard fans that like the game enough to learn about how to mod it create a mod to remove a part of the game. But wait. That was a complete tangent. We were talking about Sonic's gambling addiction, weren't we? This seems to be par for the course as casinos are a part of the DNA of Sonic games, with even the first Sonic game having a casino stage in the form of Spring Yard Zone. After 30 years of being forced into casinos, Sonic's psychologically dependent on those slots. He just can't pull himself away from them. Anyway, each star fragment counts as a spin on the imaginary slot machine, so the goal here is to pick up as many star fragments as possible in order to keep it spinning for the whole 3 minutes that the Starfall event lasts for. You're rewarded with different quantities of purple coins based on which slots you get, with 3 purple coins being the best slot you can get. It awards you with 50 purple coins in one go. Usually, if you keep spamming the slot machine, you'll be able to accrue hundreds of purple coins pretty easily, and this is where our lovely friend Big the Cat comes in. When in the fishing cyberspace, Sonic can exchange these purple coins with Big, allowing you one cast per token on Kronos Island, with fishing spots on later islands costing increasingly more, but with more valuable fish to catch to compensate for the higher cost. Again, no idea why Big the Cat, our friend of 24 years, is requiring us to give him tokens in order to fish but I guess he's got to make his money in the metaverse somehow, even if that means selling us fishing NFTs in exchange for big 
coin. What the fuck was I thinking like, when I wrote this script? I'm like, fucking God. If you've got hundreds of purple coins, you can now fish for a decent amount of time if you just keep handing big your cryptocurrency of choice with reckless abandon. The actual fishing minigame was genuinely fun, even if it's so ridiculous ridiculously bare bones, especially in comparison to fishing mechanics from other games. All you need to do to cast your line is press A on Xbox or X on PlayStation. When a fish takes the bait, a red circle appears around your lure, with a white circle slowly enlarging inside of it. When the white circle overlaps the red circle, just press A or X to yank the fish out of the water, and it's as simple as that. Sometimes there'll be two or three red circles instead of one, but apart from that, that's the entire fishing minigame. Now you think this is where I'm going to say something outrageously negative about the fishing in this game, but honestly I had a lot of fun fishing in Frontiers. Probably far too much fun considering how terrible this fishing mechanic actually is. You know what, I, I probably had more fun fishing in this game than engaging with like 75% of Frontiers content. Yeah, I do wish the fishing more so resembled a less broken and more modern version of the fishing minigame from Biggs levels in Sonic Adventure, but this'll do just fine for me. I'll just really enjoy chilling there with Big the Cat, listening to the chill music and catching a few fish. It's good for the soul. There are also all kinds of fish and items to catch in the pond, so many that I can't even begin to go through all of them. Just go to the Sonic Frontiers wiki and have a look at how much stuff you can catch. A lot of effort went into this component of the game, or I guess at least a lot of effort went into designing the sheer amount of shit you can catch in this random pond. Not all of which are even fish, as you can catch random items, which for some reason Big still pays you for. This man is insane, he doesn't even care if you catch a tin can or a tire, he still gives you money because he just loves the action of fishing so much. Big sure is a nice guy. I'm sure you're all wondering what the reward is for fishing. Well when you catch anything you're rewarded with treasure tokens based on how rare the item is that you caught, be it a big golden fish or a literal twig. These treasure tokens can then be exchanged in Big's item shop for a variety of special items including portal gears, seeds of power, seeds of defense, lost cocos, chaos emerald vault keys, skill points, and most significantly, memory tokens. So yeah, all of the items and resources can be bought in bulk from Big's shop, meaning you can farm all of the items you need solely by using the fishing minigame. Now, I like the fishing game as much as the next man, and I love being able to buy all of these useful items from Big, however, the sheer amount of main quest items that you can buy is just far too high. Using Big's method of farming a ludicrous amount of items basically means you don't have to interact with the world past collecting the emeralds, progressing the main quests of characters, and fighting bosses, which kind of defeats the point of the game being open world in the first place. In my first playthrough of Sonic Frontiers that I streamed with my brother James, we barely engaged with any of the later island's content because all we wanted to do was find big, farm items from his shop, then move on with the story. This is by far the quickest and most efficient method of progressing the main story, which is just silly in my opinion. Just imagine, you spend hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars to develop this open world game filled with secrets items to collect and routes to run and puzzles to solve, with all of these activities being seemingly necessary to progress the story. And then you just throw in a big fat cat who can help you bypass basically 75% of the game's content through a very bare bones fishing minigame that consists of pressing the action button twice. Don't get me wrong, I like the fishing because it's endearing and chill, but Sonic Team really shot themselves in the foot because it means that players can just go straight to big and skip a ton of content which makes the game seem so much worse and disjointed than it actually is. My first experience of Frontiers was ruined pretty badly thanks to Big's fishing shop, and it remains the most efficient way to progress through the game. It was only when I played it a second time and actually collected the items the way developers intended that I saw the appeal of this game's open world although even then it's not even really that good. When me and my brother first discovered this method of collecting memory tokens, cogs and keys, we weren't quite sure what was going on really. It felt like we'd found an exploit that shouldn't have been in the game in the first place, despite it of course being a very viable way to progress through the story. They could have so easily balanced this by having big shops stock less main quest items, capping how many keys, cogs and memory tokens you can buy, therefore forcing players to still fight guardians to get cogs, 
play cyberspace stages to get keys, and engage with the open world to get memory tokens. With Big Shop just being a nice boost of items if you want to put that extra time in to acquire some extra resources. Towards the end of my first playthrough, I didn't play any cyberspace stages, I didn't fight any guardians, and I didn't do any exploring, because I knew it was just much faster and more efficient to go straight to Big's shop and buy it all instead. Why would I choose the longer and potentially more tiresome method when I can just speed through it all using Big? I get that Sonic Team was maybe trying to create alternate ways of getting to the end of the game, but this just feels far too overpowered for my liking. Again, it makes a lot of the game's content obsolete. Also, who's to say this is even the real Big the Cat in the first place? How did he get to the Starfall Islands? Why is he here? Why do we have to go into a cyberspace to meet him? Why is he not desperately asking Sonic to help him escape like Sonic's other friends? Where the hell is Froggy? So many questions, and yet... No answers. Maybe Big in Frontiers isn't Big the Cat at all, but a digital imposter. Oh fuck, I, I fucking wrote a fucking Among Us joke in this script. Yeah, that's not gonna date the video at all, is it? Anyway, the whole point of the Big Tangent was to explain memory tokens and the different ways of obtaining them. Now that we've spent a decent amount of time fishing, we have enough tokens to last us a long while. So I think it's time we discuss the game's main quests, side stories, and the characterization of the game's main characters. Yes, you heard me right in the previous chapter. We're playing a Sonic game with main quests, which sounds a bit jarring right off the bat. The main quests refer to the missions that are required to be completed in order to progress the story of the game. I use the term missions very lightly by the way, because most of the quest markers lead to quests that consist of literally one cutscene. Like that's the entire quest, it's a single cutscene. Every now and then you'll be tasked with completing some sort of mini game in order to progress, which we'll talk more about later. But most of the time, these main missions just consist of watching a single conversation between Sonic and one of his friends, requiring you to collect more memory tokens in order to reach the next main quest, which most of the time is just another static cutscene. However, even if the content itself is incredibly lacklustre in every sense of the word, that didn't stop the writers from at least trying to write an underlying story for each of Sonic's friends that results in some form of character arc. Each story is centred around Sonic's friends wanting Wanting to help the Coco, with Amy wanting to help reunite two Coco lovers, Knuckles wanting to help a platoon of Coco soldiers fulfill their duty, and Tails wanting to help an engineer Coco fix the cannons around the island. An interesting concept of these stories is that Coco contained the hopes, dreams, and essentially what are the spirits of the ancients, meaning that fulfilling their wishes sets their souls free. The Coco are constantly stuck in the past, believing that the attack on the Starfall Islands is still ongoing, which leaves the spirits of the Ancients in a state of unrest, at least that's how I interpret it. Resolving their lingering desires puts them to rest and allows them to enter the metaverse or whatever it is they do when their spirits leave the Coco. But like, yeah, this is all great and everything, but Sonic makes a great point when talking to Amy about helping the Coco. Do we really have the time to waste helping them, when Amy, Knuckles, and Tails are all in immediate danger? Shouldn't Sonic's priority be helping his friends who could inevitably be locked away in the cyberspace forever? It just seems like a massive tangent away from the main story, which is why it really doesn't make sense that these missions are considered main quests, because in actuality, they don't have much at all to do with the main story. It would make more sense if these Coco related activities were side stories. So what do these main quests have us doing exactly? Well, apart from the missions that consist of nothing but singular cutscenes, the ones with actual objectives have us engaging in a variety of mini-games that the Cocos want us to do. I'd say the only justification for helping these Coco is that engaging with their mini-games yields Chaos Emeralds for some reason. Yes, you heard it right, in order to collect some of the most important items in the Sonic universe, you have to play little whimsical games with Coco. Like, how did the Coco even get their hands on the Chaos Emeralds? They don't even have hands! Most of these minigames are just awful too, when considering that they're meant to be main quest objectives. One has you rounding up Coco and herding them towards a goal, avoiding bombs that the Coco for some reason drop in an attempt to hurt Sonic. Why are they dropping bombs on me? I'm trying to help them. Since when were the Coco violent and capable of developing advanced explosive weapons? Another Coco minigame consists of 
using the soy loop on these plants in order to rack up points, but there's bees flying around that are attracted to plants that can hurt you if you run into them? Why does this yield a Chaos Emerald? What does this have to do with the main story? It makes literally no sense and feels incredibly shoehorned in. Plus, there's not even Coco involved in this one. It's just Sonic running around a bunch of weeds like a madman, which for some reason results in him fucking dancing and finding a Chaos Emerald. One that I actually found kind of fun, and I use the word fun charitably, was on Ares Island. It has you collecting Coco sitting underneath these spiked pillars that are repeatedly smashing into the ground. The goal is to pick up as many Coco as possible in one go and take them to safety. However, the more Coco you're holding, the quicker the pillars move and the quicker Sonic moves. This means that you have to balance how many Coco you pick up in each run. If you pick up too many Coco at once, it becomes impossible to take them to safety as the spiked pillars blocking the way move too quickly to pass and Sonic becomes too fast to control manageably. Collecting just the right amount of Coco means you can safely pass the pillars, whilst also saving a decent amount of Coco in one run. I also like how picking up the Coco just stacks him on top of Sonic's head and creates this big long tower. It, it looks pretty funny, but even if this is slightly fun in a dumb sort of way, it still makes no sense in the context of helping the Coco, let alone the context of, like, the main goal of the game. Why do these Coco have emeralds? Why does collecting them, stacking on top of your head, and carrying them to the goal fulfill their final wishes? How does herding the Coco and avoiding their literal bombs on Kronos Island help them? And why do the Coco want Sonic to siloop these weeds? It's never explained further, it's just really odd writing and game design in which you do nonsensical things and the characters just accept that that's what needs to be done, even if it doesn't make any sense. To me, it just felt like these minigames were created because Sonic Team had no idea what else to do for these main quests. The minigames in of themselves aren't necessarily bad content, and I actually wouldn't have minded them if they were their own separate thing away from the main story. Maybe they could have been used as an alternate way to collect large quantities of lost Coco to level Sonic's abilities, but they're jarring when you as part of the main quests, because they don't actually do anything to progress the main story, which is something that main quests should certainly do. It just leads to the story feeling incredibly disjointed. Why should I care about helping the Coco when Sonic's friends are trapped? Saving the Coco does nothing to help them escape the cyberspace. In fact, it actively halts Sonic's progression of finding the Chaos Emeralds and defeating the Titans. Granted, helping the Coco does award the player with a Chaos Emerald, but it just feels a little bit disappointing disappointing when previous games have had such spectacles when it comes to collecting the Chaos Emeralds. Doing a simple silly minigame for some Coco just feels really anticlimactic. I mean, if the Coco was so important to the overall story and finding the Emeralds, why are most of the other Emeralds in the game just found out in the open world? And why are the Coco themselves delegated to being an in-world reason for Sonic to be able to level up his abilities? I'm starting to think that they're not actually that important to the overarching narrative of the game, despite what the game wants you to think. Don't get me wrong, I like the concept of the Coco. But to have them be the keepers of the Chaos Emeralds, and to have you partake in these incredibly simplistic minigames in order to collect some of the most powerful and important items in the Sonic universe, it just feels a little bit wasted. I would have preferred to have actual missions where you delve into the ancient structures in order to find the Chaos Emeralds. Which is why it makes entirely no sense that the main quests are focused nearly entirely around the Coco. Again, they definitely should have made the Coco minigames side missions, and and had, you know, actually interesting content for the main story missions. The only impactful thing in relation to the main story that interacting with the Coco actually does is give some background into the story of the Ancients and what happened during the attack on the Starfall Islands thousands of years ago. At specific points during these main quests, Sonic and his friends witness flashbacks from the perspectives of the Coco they're helping, which sheds some light onto the enemy that the Ancients were facing at the time. During Amy's quest, we witnessed two Ancients running towards each other whilst explosions fire off around them, with the two of them finally embracing before being caught in a large explosion, which supposedly ended their lives. This tells us that many ancients lost their lives during the attack, families and lovers were ripped apart, and the only luxury that remained for those who were lucky enough to stick together with the people they loved was to die alongside each other. Escape was not possible. During Knuckles' quest, we see a flashback of a platoon of ancient soldiers erecting these large walls in order to keep the threat out. It seems as if these walls were the pride of the ancients' military, 
as the soldiers in the flashback seem elated to see them standing tall. However, in an instant, the wall is destroyed. What was most likely the most advanced defences the ancients could come up with was destroyed instantaneously, which shows us just how powerful the threat they faced was. The game makes a point of how advanced the ancients were, so I'm going to assume that this wall is more than just your regular stone wall. It probably has some sort of force field tech integrated into it, so the fact that it was taken down with such ease really demonstrates the desperate situation that the ancients were in, with the might of their military struggling to keep the people safe. Finally, during Tails Quest, we get this really cool stylized flashback, kinda like the cutscenes from the storybook games, which depicts Chaos Island being bombarded from the sky by these huge beams of energy, which does catastrophic damage and seemingly destroys a huge part of the island. This really shows the might of the Ancients' enemy. If they're capable of this kind of damage, then it's no wonder the Ancients are nowhere to be seen. But also raises the question of, are these hostile beings still around, or have they since moved on? Will we face them ourselves? Can even Sonic contend with such world-ending power? This scene definitely adds tension to the story and raises the stakes. Until you remember that the main content of this game's main quests consists of standing around and watching Sonic talk to his friends, or, if you're lucky, helping Coco do a variety of menial tasks that have nothing to do with the overall plot of the game. Like, I'm sorry if me moaning about the Coco missions is getting repetitive, but try playing Sonic Frontiers for yourself. You'll find the game a hell of a lot more repetitive when it comes to its main quest missions. All I wanted was some good missions and fun level design, but instead I got given a bunch of shit minigames. Honestly, I enjoyed running around aimlessly collecting medals, keys, and cogs more than I enjoyed the main story missions. You know something's wrong with the content of your story missions when collecting the required materials to unlock them is more fun than the actual missions themselves. Yes, these quests offer some decent story beats every now and then, but these moments don't feel earned because the missions themselves suck. I honestly think the main symptom of this is the decision to go open world. The idea of running around an open world as Sonic sounds so fun on paper, and you know what? The actual open world exploration and traversal is fun, despite the lack of true physics. However, this raises the problem of what kind of content do you put into an open world Sonic game, where linear stages are no longer the main source of content? Well, it feels as if the developers had a hard time answering this question based on what we got, because I'd happily take another 30 recycled linear cyberspace stages for the main story content over any of the mini games that the Coco have you partake in. They're just that bad. Most of the older linear 3D Sonic games had stories that were directly supported by the linear stages that we were playing in. Each stage told its own part of the larger story, whilst also simultaneously being the main source of playable content. The stages themselves were replayable enough, long enough, and varied enough that completing them was satisfying content for the player. There didn't have to be any main quest missions within the stages themselves, because the stages were the missions. The stages were also relevant to the immediate events of the main story, because they offered story progression at the end of each stage in the form of cutscenes. A symptom of Sonic going open world is that the open zones aren't enough on their own in terms of playable content. Linear stages are no longer the reliable glue that holds the story of Sonic together, so Sonic Team had to come up with something else to fulfil this purpose, something that fit with the open world formula. They needed main quest missions within the open world that would serve the same function that linear stages used to in the older games, and for some reason nobody seemed to think that maybe these main quest missions should also be directly linked to the context of the main story. I just want to clarify that the actual idea of having missions within the open world is not a bad idea, but the problem arises when the main quest missions have nothing to do with the events of the story. You see the problem here? Sonic Team just opted to hastily stitch together the game's important story moments with content that has nothing to do with those very same story moments. This gives the illusion that players are completing missions and uncovering a story in this open world, when in actuality the content they're engaging with has little to nothing to do with the overarching story presented at the beginning of the game. Linear stages in the older 3D Sonic games were enough content on their own that they were fun, whilst also being directly relevant to the main story. Whereas running around the open world collecting stuff isn't enough on its own to be considered substantial content. And their remedy to this issue, an over 
overabundance of Coco-centric content is not relevant to the main story. This leads to there being a distinct disconnect between the main quest missions and the actual story you're watching unfold, which is to save Sonic's friends by collecting the Chaos Emeralds and defeating the Titans. So it just left me confused when I first played the game, and realised that the main story missions heavily veer away from the immediate story in order to follow these smaller side stories about Coco. Sonic pointlessly runs around helping these Coco, when in fact the only thing he needs to do to save his friends is to collect the Chaos Emeralds in order to defeat the Titans. So when we're playing the main quest of this game, we're actively engaging in something that doesn't even progress the goal of the characters in the story, and yet all the characters are so engrossed in it for some reason. It's completely bizarre storytelling. As I said before, I wouldn't mind the Coco's minigames if they were optional content, but forcing the player to engage with this content in order to progress the main story just isn't good enough from a game design standpoint. There really just needed to be better main mission content, content that is actually relevant to the story of the game you're playing. But with the Coco missions being delegated to side missions in this hypothetical scenario, what does that leave for main quest content? Well, Ever since I played Sonic Frontiers, I had an idea as to what kind of main quest content and level design I would have liked to see in the game. I think these main quest missions should have focused on more adventure era level design. Well, I mean, they should have actually at least attempted some sort of level design in the first place, but my idea for the main quest missions in Sonic Frontiers would have you explore some of the ruins on the different islands, delving into large temples or structures to find out more about the ancients and to search for the Chaos Emeralds. To enter these temples, it would make sense to change the use of the keys you collect from the cyberspace stages instead of just using them to collect chaos emeralds in the wild They could be used to unlock the doors of these ancient temples Which would be used to house the chaos emeralds themselves Ideally these ruins or chaos temples, which I think sounds pretty cool would have a heavy focus on platforming combat speed Environmental puzzles traps and some of them could even have unique boss battles at the end of these missions You would find a chaos emerald in the temple which would make these missions feel like they're directly progressing the story. Not only would this style of main mission structure be a great way to reintroduce more platform-centric gameplay from earlier Sonic games, and not only would it be a way to introduce actual missions with actual level design into Frontier's main quests, but it would also flesh out the lore of the Ancients. Whilst exploring these ruins in order to find the Chaos Emerald, you could stumble across pieces of environmental storytelling that would provide subtle world building for the Ancients themselves. You could have statues and murals that tell stories of their culture culture, and if you're feeling a little bit crazy, you could even allow players to find ancient text logs left behind by the ancients themselves, maybe notes left behind by ancients that were taking refuge in the temples during the attack, or text that sheds some light on the technologies of the ancients and how they work, or how they use the Chaos Emeralds to bolster their own power. There's so much potential for this kind of mission, and I think it'd be so engaging for the player. You could even use the conversations that Sonic has with his friends that would normally take place in the open world space and incorporate them into the temple mission structure in the form of dialogue that's just scripted to happen as you explore, further adding more intrigue and context. Basically, these Chaos Temples would serve as dungeon-like activities, but would still remain true to traditional Sonic level design. There will be platforming, combat, speed sections, puzzles, traps to avoid, environmental storytelling, text logs, and exposition from the character that are directly involved in the story. Hell, you could even throw some Lost Coco in there for good measure. This just sounds much more fun to me, and I got this idea because there's a similar concept to my idea actually in the game. On Chaos and Ares Islands, there's a system of underground tunnels lined with the crumbling ruins of the Ancients' architecture. After running through the tunnels for a while, you come out into this large ornate room with branching pathways and enemies to fight. This structure could be used as a framework to develop the structure of my hypothetical dungeon-like chaos temples. Furthermore, on Oranos Island, there is in fact a temple which houses a Chaos Emerald. There's a large door leading into this tunnel with ancient architecture, vines hanging from the ceiling, and a loop in the middle leading to where the Chaos Emerald is. Now imagine these concepts but on a much larger scale, with elements taken from the underground areas from Ares Island and some of the other ancient structures we get to enter on the other islands. You could even have aesthetic differences between the different Chaos Temples depending on which island you're on, such as a desert sandstone themed temple for Ares Island, or a more lush, overgrown temple for Kronos Island. I think that would be really cool. So the framework for my idea is literally there in the game, and they explore it somewhat in certain sections. However, once again, 90% of the 
main quests consist of either watching a cutscene or taking part in an unremarkable minigame to help the Coco, which is completely unrelated from the main story, instead of doing cool stuff like exploring the ruins of the civilization that the writers have clearly put effort in to build a lot of mystery around, which naturally makes the players interested in exploring more about them. It's just such a missed opportunity to make something interesting and cool. Again, it seems like Sonic Team was so focused on the idea of an open world Sonic game that the thought of what content they were going to put into that open world just went completely out the window. Ah, what could have been, eh? Anyway, let's move on from the main quest to the side stories. Each set of main quests for each island are resolved when the Coco's final wishes are fulfilled, and all the Chaos Emeralds are found. However, this isn't the only content available relating to Sonic's friends and the arcs that each companion goes through. There are also side stories that are not mandatory to move on to the next island. Side stories are basically small interactions that you can have with each character, in exchange for a certain number of memory tokens. So basically they're exactly the same as 90% of the main quests, in which you go to an area, speak to one of Sonic's friends, then move to the next area to do the exact same thing. You see why I think the main quest we got should really qualify as side content? Because they're literally the same thing as the side content. The only thing that differentiates main quests from side stories is that main quests are mandatory to progress the story, whereas side quests are not and can be skipped entirely. But the overall content remains the same apart from, of course, the riveting Coco minigames. Side stories don't offer any form of mission objectives, they're merely conversations between Sonic and his friends, giving their thoughts on the island, speculating about the ancients, and even referencing the events of previous Sonic games. I can see what they were going for here, to have pieces of optional dialogue that give exposition about the world, how the characters are feeling and what they think about their situation, and how they compare their current situation to previous experiences. But it just ends up being exhausting because these side stories are the exact same type of content that we've been interacting with the entire time whilst playing the main story. If the main quest missions actually had fun and engaging mission structure and objectives, then these side stories would feel like appropriate downtime in between high action main quest missions. It would be nice to stop for a second to have an optional one-on-one -on -one conversation with Amy, Knuckles or Tails about the aforementioned topics. Only problem is, the main quests don't offer high action gameplay or engaging mission structure, therefore the side stories just bored me to tears because I was already bored. It's yet another example of how the content itself isn't actually bad, but it's brought down by all the nonsense that surrounds it. I barely even took notice of the side stories, save for the few references to previous Sonic games, which just feel like cheap fan service at best. The side stories do offer some world building about the ancients, their technology, the cyberspace, their culture and beliefs, which is a nice effort from the writers, but it's just too little to make up for the terrible content that the main quests offer. Amongst all of the boredom and tedium that comes from engaging with the main quests, minigames and side stories, we have the characterization of Sonic, Amy, Knuckles, Tails and Eggman. I'm happy to say I thought these characters were actually characterized well in this game, especially when compared to the completely flanderized versions of the characters from Sonic Forces. Remember when I said each character goes through a character arc? Well, their experiences actually lead to a change in their outlook of the world, as well as how they plan to live their life moving forward. Which for me is a return to form for their characters, even if a couple of their arcs retread ground from previous games. Amy realises she wants to travel and help people of the world, and to stop constantly chasing Sonic for his affection, even if she still does love him. Knuckles concludes that he needs to take a break every now and then from protecting the Master Emerald, and that he doesn't have to do everything alone. And Tails decides he wants to go on his own for a while, as he feels like he's constantly stuck in the shadow of Sonic, and wants to make his own accomplishments instead of just being the sidekick. If I'm not mistaken, these are actual character arcs. I will admit both Amy and Tails have had similar 
similar arcs before. At the end of Amy's story in Sonic Adventure, she realises that she doesn't have to spend her life chasing after Sonic, and that she can have her own adventures and experiences without having to revolve her life around him. This arc then carries over into Sonic Adventure 2, with Amy being a much stronger person as a result of wanting to be more independent. But the slate is then wiped clean again in Sonic Heroes, where she's back to being frantically interested in Sonic, determined to force him to marry her. I think it's great that the writers at Sonic Team decided to have her go through this arc once more. Let's just hope she sticks to it this time. I just think the whole obsessed with the protagonist romantically trope is very outdated, and I hope Amy becomes a stronger character in her own right following the events of Frontiers. Hey, still thinking about the Coco? Yeah, and more. I'm not sure what happened, but I know what I saw. A love that transcended time. I believe in that power. When this is over, I want to share that love with the world. Even though it may take us far apart. I know you'll do great. I want to hear all about it when you come back. As for Tails, at the end of his story in the original Sonic Adventure, he finally finds courage within himself. He sees that he's not just a sidekick, but a hero in his own right, and that he can do things by himself without having to rely on Sonic. Again, this is an arc that carries on into Sonic Adventure 2, as Tails even goes head to head with Eggman in that game and proves himself to be a valuable asset to the team. However, as I said, the slate was wiped clean for Sonic Heroes, so much like how Amy's character was reverted to her Sonic-obsessed self, Tails was reverted to a scared and timid boy who would constantly rely on Sonic. Despite this arc already being done before, I'm glad that Sonic Team has decided to have Tails go through that same realisation again, because I think the strongest characterizations of Tails are games like Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2, or even Sonic Unleashed, where Tails struggles with self-belief but is stronger for it, becomes more confident in his own abilities, and realises he's capable enough to look after himself. He doesn't even necessarily have to be a fighter like Sonic, he can rely on his knowledge of science and engineering to help people, which is a particular characterization of Tails I really like. He just needs to be more involved with tech and gadgets, as well as tinkering with the tornado, Leaning into Tails' strength as a character is important to realising his arc as his own hero, whilst also differentiating his abilities from Sonic. Hey little bro, feeling better? Yeah, this whole experience gave me a kind of clarity. When this is all over, I think I need to go it alone for a while. I can't grow into my full potential if I always fall back on you. If that's okay. <laughs> You're free to go your own way. I guess you just blew up on me a little faster than I expected. Are you saying I outpaced you? Yeah, don't push it. It's gonna take some getting used to, but... Here's to you reaching new heights, partner. As for Knuckles, I believe his arc in Frontiers is completely new, which I thought was cool. As much as I prefer the characterization of Knuckles from the adventure games where he's a bit more serious and brooding, with a goofy side that comes out every now and then, I don't mind the Knuckles from Frontiers, especially after watching the prologue animation which adds a lot of context to his character journey. Knuckles is the last Echidna, and so he has this worldview that he and he alone is responsible for protecting the Master Emerald as a way to honour the loss of his civilization. This has led to him being a very solitary person, believing that he must do everything alone. 
His pride often gets in the way of his friendships and causes tension, especially between him and Sonic. I don't care much for Knuckles' voice actor in this game, I guess I was spoiled by Dan Green's beautiful voice in the 2000s, but I do like the way Knuckles is characterised in this game. Instead of the literal knucklehead he is in games like Sonic Boom or Forces, he's back to the introspective and yet gullible loner he once was in the adventure games, which I really appreciate. Over the years, Knuckles became more of a comic relief character who would just say dumb stuff which made it hard to take him seriously. In Frontiers, his characterization is night and day when compared to his appearance in Forces. Knuckles' arc over the course of his quest is to realise that it's okay to accept help from people, especially from friends. Knuckles feels powerless watching Sonic freely explore Ares Island in his corporeal form, and over the course of the quest, he slowly accepts that sometimes you have to rely on others for help, and that's okay. This culminates in his worldview changing at the end of the quest, when he realises that having people to support you isn't so bad, and that the burden of protecting the Master Emerald doesn't have to be his alone he can share it with his friends. He was so focused on honouring the legacy of the Echidna by declaring himself the only one capable of defending the Emerald, that he forgot about himself on his own personal journey. I think the themes from Knuckles' arc are some of the best in the game, even if the game itself only explores them on a very surface level. This is without a doubt the best characterization we've gotten for Knuckles in years, and I can see them utilising his character in some really great ways moving forward. Ages ago, my people were wiped out by a cataclysm. I know the Coco faced something similar. It reminds me I'm the last Echidna, that I'm alone. You may be the last, but you're not alone. You've got us, Knucklehead. I'll admit, I do envy your lifestyle. Freedom to go where you want, when you want. So do it. Get out there and live a little. Maybe I could. But first, I need to be back to normal. So hurry up and get me back to normal. Anything to get you away from me. <laughs> as much as I like the characterization of these characters, and as much as I enjoy the concept of their character arcs, due to the lackluster content of the main quests, these arcs don't feel nearly as impactful as they could. Once again, the actual good parts of this game are brought down by the awful main quest missions. Because Amy, Knuckles and Tails don't actually do anything towards the quest besides standing there and watching Sonic do everything, it doesn't feel as if there's any significant character journey for any of them. I guess from a certain perspective you could try to argue that Amy, Knuckles and Tails had time to think about their current situation due to their lack of freedom, and vow to change the way they live their lives when they're free, but in my opinion, a character arc that relies solely on the character not doing anything just isn't compelling enough in my opinion. It would have been cool if Amy, Knuckles and Tails could help you in some way during the main quest missions. Going back to my idea of dungeon-like chaos temples, it would be cool if Sonic's friends had an active role in these levels. For example, because they're stuck in the cyberspace, they can pass through walls and objects. This could have been used as a gameplay feature, allowing Sonic's friends to reach certain places that he can't via the cyberspace network. This way, they aren't just sitting there watching Sonic do everything, which would make their arcs feel a lot more earned as they have to adapt to this new kind of existence, which would make them appreciate their corporeal form a lot more. Plus, this would work in favour of their arcs. Amy helping Sonic in these temples would show her a side of life that she hasn't experienced, which would spur her to want to explore the world and do good on her own. Knuckles helping Sonic would help him realise that sometimes, even the strongest people need help from the seemingly helpless. Plus, his time away from Angel Island would teach him that the Master Emerald isn't always in danger and he can afford to take some time off. Lastly, Tails helping Sonic would prove to him that sometimes Sonic needs him and that he's not the burden he thinks he is. Gameplay and story should always be in communion like this. In a game that's attempting to tell a story, you can't have a compelling story if the gameplay doesn't lend itself to that story and vice versa. You can't have characters go through arcs if they don't actually do anything in the game. So as much as I enjoyed the idea of the arcs that these characters went through, in the actual game, it actually doesn't make much sense considering all they did was sit there and watch Sonic do everything. 
But overall, I still much prefer the characterization of Amy, Tails and Knuckles in this game when compared to any Sonic game since Generations. Throughout the story of Sonic Frontiers, we get to see the events of the story unfold from the perspective of Eggman and his AI, Sage. I want to say straight out of the gate that I think Eggman's characterization in this game is like a breath of fresh air. He's no longer a character used solely for comedic relief. His personality is a lot more subtle and serious in this game, and I love it. Yeah, of course he still has his moments of comedy, which is to be expected because Eggman is inherently a pretty funny character but overall he's a lot more focused on his plans in this game, and seems very knowledgeable about the ancients and their technology, which makes sense because he's an inventor and scientist. He even makes mention of having respect for Sonic despite the two being enemies, which is really good characterization. It conveys to the player that even though Eggman and Sonic have been locked in this rivalry for as long as they can remember, they still have a level of respect for each other that transcends any negative feelings they have. Throughout the course of the game, it periodically cuts to Eggman trapped in the cyberspace as he discusses how to escape with Sage, who can freely move between the two realms. It's pretty cool to see the events of the game unfold from Eggman's perspective. From an environmental perspective, it's evident that Eggman has been studying the Starfall Islands and the Ancients technology for a while, as you can find Eggman tech all over the islands in the form of small bases, large bridges, and in an operational Death Egg robot. It's clear he's been very hard at work for months, trying to uncover the secrets of the Starfall Islands and the cyberspace, which characterises him as a capable scientist, instead of a lazy fat man who gets his stupid comedic relief robots to do everything for him. Don't get me wrong, I do like Orbot and Cubot in short bursts, but they're absolutely useless characters and I'm kinda glad they're not in this game. You can even buy items from Big the Cat's fishing shop called Egg Memos, which detail the discoveries that Eggman makes during his time trapped in the cyberspace before Sonic arrives on the islands. These egg memos cover all sorts of things, like the shifting terrain within the cyberspace, the ancients having their memories and desires within the cyberspace, the link between the ancients' technology and the Chaos Emeralds, as well as the discovery that the ancients are related to Chaos from Sonic Adventure, which is pretty obvious from our perspective because we get to see them and they look exactly like Chaos. However, this revelation also means that the Chow from previous Sonic games are genetic relatives of the ancients. Chaos itself was once a Chow that was mutated by the Master Emerald, into the water-like being we saw in Sonic Adventure, so by association that makes the Chow living relatives of the Ancients. This is a really cool discovery, because it means that in some form, the Ancients live on through the Chow. This also explains why the Chow lives so close to the altar of the Master Emerald. The Egg Memos also detail the development of Eggman and Sage's relationship. At first, he only considers her an AI, a means to an end to get him the power he wants, but he actually begins to consider her as his daughter. As the Egg Memos progress, Eggman struggles with the idea of referring to Sage as it, or she, her, and even wonders whether or not Sage would have a preference on what he should call her. He lately expresses pride in creating her, stating that he created life and that it doesn't matter that she's lines of code, she's still life. This is actually the first time that Eggman has shown any form of compassion for any of his creations. He seems to genuinely care about Sage as a person, which is a stark contrast to how he treats most of his creations with contempt. This is a really interesting direction for his character, because it depicts Eggman as a sympathetic villain, which I think is the perfect choice. Who knows? Maybe with Sage in the mix, Eggman will have something more important than total world domination to focus on. Although, as much as these Egg Memos are cool, it kind of bothers me that instead of putting this great writing and character progression into the main story, Sonic Team decided just to put them in audio logs. It's crazy, this game consistently forces players to dig through a literal pile of shit in order to find the good stuff. It's such a shame. As for Sage herself, I think her story in this game is particularly interesting. She's a super intelligent AI whose sole purpose was to infiltrate the cyberspace and extract the secrets of the ancients. However, over the course of the game, the exposure to the cyberspace helps her develop sentience, and she begins to question her own fixation on empirical data and statistics. Sonic in particular also has a profound effect on Sage, as she witnesses him push on through statistically insurmountable odds for the sake of his friends. She begins doubting her view of the world and starts to rely less on data, and instead allows herself to feel emotion, all while struggling to understand the concept of emotion itself. 
We get to see her slow development from a cold and unthinking AI into a sentient being who begins to deal with an intense influx of emotions, which I think is a pretty cool concept to be explored in a Sonic game. I really hope Sage turns up again in the future, because I think there's a lot more that can be done for her character. This is the first time we've gotten a genuinely interesting antagonist or deuteragonist in Sonic in years. So we've talked about the characterization of Sonic's friends and his enemies, but what about Sonic the Hedgehog himself? Is he characterized accurately in this game? Well, I want to give a bit of background to my relationship with his character first before delving into what I think about him in Frontiers. I started playing Sonic with Sonic Adventure DX on GameCube. Yep, yeah, I know, I didn't play the infinitely superior Dreamcast version. I was a little too young for the Dreamcast, unfortunately. I immediately identified with Sonic as he was this cheeky troublemaker who would always get into some sort of trouble. But he was also someone who always believed in doing what was morally right and standing up for his friends. Ryan Drummond's iteration of Sonic was a great starting point for 3D Sonic, and I'm really grateful for what he and the writers at the time brought to the character, brilliantly capturing his larger-than-life personality. However, my true love for Sonic as a character started when Jason Griffith started playing the character. Not only did I really enjoy him as Sonic in the Sonic X anime, but I also especially loved his performances in the games. He perfectly captured the playful nature of Sonic, his mischievous side and his cocky exterior, whilst also bringing a certain degree of calmness and maturity to the character that I think Ryan Drummond was unable to convey. Over the years since his first performance as Sonic in Sonic Heroes, Jason Griffith really made the character his own, and brought a whole new level of personality to Sonic that had never been seen before. By Sonic 06, Griffith's Sonic began to be very distinct from that of Drummond's Sonic in both voice direction and writing. By the time games like Sonic and the Secret Rings, Sonic and the Black Knight, and Sonic Unleashed rolled around, Sonic's voice had changed from the immature, quirky troublemaker into a more mature, kind, and compassionate voice that I really, really liked. With this change in voice, Sonic was also characterized in a much more mature way. Sonic Unleashed was definitely my favourite iteration of the character we ever got, not only because Jason Griffith had mastered the voice of Sonic in his seven year run, but the writers also understood the character of Sonic at that point, and they understood why fans loved him so much. He was cool, but not obnoxiously self-absorbed. He was kind and humorous, but was still serious when he needed to be. He was energetic and excitable, but could also be chilled out and reserved. Sonic Unleashed is without a doubt the strongest characterization we've ever had for Sonic in my opinion. And just as Jason Griffith had just about mastered the voice of Sonic, he was recast, despite not wanting to leave the role. Sega and Sonic team opted to then hire the current voice for Sonic, Roger Craig Smith. Don't get me wrong, I really like Roger Craig Smith as Ezio in Assassin's Creed, Batman in Batman Arkham Origins, Chris Redfield in the Resident Evil series, and I thought he did a great job at conveying the chaotic nature of Daedara in the Naruto Shippuden English dub, but I just never liked his Sonic voice. After the perfect casting that was Jason Griffith, I found it difficult to adjust to Roger Craig Smith, and I guess I never got used to it, because even to this day, I still don't really like him in the role. Much like how the characterization of Sonic changed when his voice actor changed from Brian Drummond to Jason Griffith, he was characterized differently when Roger Craig Smith took the role. And in my opinion, they changed Sonic for the worse. In Sonic Generations and Sonic Colors, Sonic was immediately more obnoxious and comedic, spouting constant self-referential jokes, observational humor, and just being all-round annoying in most scenes. He never took anything seriously, which quickly became grating. Now, it's not entirely Roger Craig Smith's fault, of course, because he's just the guy that reads the lines on the script, which is written by a team of writers who already have a pre-established idea of what Sonic should be. But honestly, his delivery really doesn't help. Not even because it's bad voice acting, because it isn't. But for me, it contributes to the undoing of the carefully crafted characterization of Sonic that was developed from 2003 to 2010. As soon as I started playing Generations, Sonic just didn't feel like Sonic anymore. Yeah, he looked like Sonic, he moved like Sonic, and did Sonic-like things, but his character had been irrevocably changed, and I could no longer see in him the character that I'd come to love so much over the course of nearly a decade. 
This trend continued as more games came out, Sonic became increasingly more of a comedian, and would just spout the most unfunny observational comedy ever, and would rarely take a moment to be serious or to take the stakes of the story seriously. Roger Craig Smith's era of Sonic has never had dialogue like the scene in Sonic and the Black Knight, where Sonic is talking to Merlina about the world's ending and living life to its fullest while we still have the time. Or the scene in Sonic Unleashed where Chip gets his memories back and Sonic refuses to let him face Dark Gaia alone, saying, do I need a reason to want to help out a friend? These were scenes with genuine heart. They took themselves seriously and had pretty good writing, something you don't see much these days with Sonic because it's all become about Sonic making jokes and being absolutely insufferable. This all came to a head in Sonic Forces, where Sonic's characterization just reached an all-time low. Like for example, the line at the end where Sonic says to Eggman, your plan will end like all your plans do, with you sitting in a pile of busted robot parts wondering how you failed so badly. Like, what? This is a genuine line in a AAA game, just before the final climactic battle of the story. It's meant to be an impactful moment, but of course the writers just had to have Sonic make an unfunny observational joke in this moment. Instead of having him comment on how this is the moment that the war has been building to, or talking to his friends to rally them together for the final battle, they immediately opt to remove any tension from this moment by having Sonic basically say, well, Eggman literally always loses, so why would he win this time? It's just terrible writing. Sonic Forces made me hate Sonic as a character. I just couldn't stand him anymore, which is such a shame considering how much I loved him in the 2000s. After Forces, I had completely given up hope that the version of Sonic I knew would ever come back. So that finally brings us to today. Going into Sonic Frontiers, I had no hopes for a good characterization of Sonic. In fact, I almost expected it to somehow be worse than Forces because I just had no faith that anyone understood his character anymore. However, I'll say right out the gate that I was pleasantly surprised by the characterization of Sonic in Sonic Frontiers, as well as Roger Craig Smith's voice direction this time around. Sonic in Frontiers is a lot less obnoxious. He still makes bad jokes, I will admit, but it's nowhere near the degree of something like Sonic Colors or Sonic Forces. I noticed this as soon as I watched the first few cutscenes. The constant jokes were dialed back, they're appropriately placed in the right situations, and Sonic speaks with a calmer tone of voice and his speech is less exaggerated, which I really appreciated. Don't get me wrong, it's far from my ideal characterization of Sonic, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Sonic actually engages with the world around him, questioning the ancient structures and their purposes, taking the time to appreciate the beauty of the Starfall Islands, and actively theorizing and discussing the ancients with his friends. In previous games, he would have just said something like, Wow, that's a crazy big structure! Almost as big as Eggman's fat, disgusting body! Or, Wow, those ancients are old! Almost as old as Eggman, because he's a stinky old man! Or something along those lines. But in this game, he's involved in the world around him. Instead of dismissing it all as crazy nonsense for the sake of poorly executed self-referential humour, he actually takes it seriously, which I really appreciated. An audience can only take a fictional world seriously if the characters take it seriously too. He also shows genuine concern for Amy, Knuckles and Tails, and you can tell by his tone of voice when they profess their desire to be free from the cyberspace. He's saddened by their situation and is disappointed that he can't do anything to save them right now. It's just nice to see that side of Sonic again, where he genuinely and deeply cares about his friends and shows actual concern for them when they're in danger. Sonic is at his best when he displays a full range of emotions and knows when to take a situation seriously, instead of just trying to be funny all the time in all situations. There's this one scene where Amy is concerned about one of the Coco and Sonic makes a point that they're running around helping Coco despite not even having found Tails yet, which is a, such a valid fucking point. Amy then gets mad at him for even considering abandoning someone in need, and Sonic then voices his concern for Amy, and how she'll never be able to get out and see the world the way she wants to if she's trapped in the cyberspace forever. You can hear in his voice how sad the thought of losing Amy makes him, which is just great. As I said, Sonic is at his best when he shows a range of emotions. Writers definitely shouldn't shy away from allowing Sonic to feel sadness and concern. 
If he's constantly jovial and joking, it makes him so much less relatable and leads to him feeling very one note. Another example of a scene that I think characterizes Sonic in a good way is the cutscene just before Sonic goes to fight the Titan on Ares Island. It's after him and Knuckles have set the Coco of Ares Island free, and the two of them are sitting on some ancient ruins talking about what they've learned about the cataclysm that befell the ancients. It's this really nice scene where Knuckles expresses how he feels all alone being the last Echidna, and that the burden of protecting Angel Island and the Master Emerald by himself is taking a toll. He's envious of Sonic's lifestyle, going wherever he wants, when he wants. Sonic then convinces Knuckles that he should take some more time for himself, and that even though he's the last Echidna, he's got plenty of friends who would be willing to help him protect Angel Island. It's just a really nice little moment that shows how good of a person Sonic is. He'd happily give up his free time in order to help Knuckles, someone who he has historically been at odds with on many occasions. Again, it's not the best writing I've ever seen by a long shot, but it characterizes Sonic well, as someone who cares for his friends and wants to support them in living the life they want to live, no matter the cost. Sonic is inherently selfless, and this scene really shows that. Lastly, another scene I think characterizes Sonic particularly well is the scene in which Tails tells him he wants to go and explore on his own for a while. While, instead of falling back on Sonic. Sonic is very understanding and reassuring towards Tails, saying that he's sure he's going to reach new heights on his own. These are the kinds of interactions I like seeing Sonic have, where he openly supports his friends' decisions and reassures them that he's proud of them. This scene is particularly poignant given Tails' mischaracterization from the last few games. It's almost like Sonic Team letting us know that they plan on sticking to his current character arc. I also like how Sonic is softer with Tails compared to when he's talking to someone like Knuckles, for example. It demonstrates that he thinks deeply about how to interact with each of his friends. Characterizing Sonic as thoughtful, understanding, emotional, and supportive is a great step for the writers at Sonic Team, because these traits are what made Jason Griffith's iteration of the character so beloved. Overall, Sonic's characterization in Sonic Frontiers is good, but isn't perfect. He still manages to break the tone of certain scenes and moments by making bad jokes and being a little bit too unserious for my liking, but it's nowhere near as egregious as previous games. Dare I say, I even like this version of Sonic, but I'd be lying if I said it's as good as the brilliant characterization from Sonic and the Black Knight, Sonic and the Secret Rings, and Sonic Unleashed, and even Sonic 06 to an extent. However, as I said, this is certainly a step in the right direction, and I appreciate Sonic Team's attention to fan criticism. This goes for all of Sonic's friends too. Amy, Knuckles, and Tails are all characterized accurately in this game, and they clearly have intentions to develop these characters in either DLC or sequels which is actually pretty exciting. For once, I'm actually looking forward to the future arcs of Sonic characters, which I haven't been able to say for a long time. Right, now we've got all that story and character analysis out of the way, I think it's time we talk about the true appeal of Sonic Frontiers, the boss battles. The four main islands being Kronos, Ares, Chaos and Oranos Islands all have their own Titan. Titans are large mechs that were built and piloted by the Ancients. They were intended to be the last line of defense against the looming threat that followed them across the stars, and were used by the Ancients in the final battle in an attempt to salvage what was left of their civilization. When Sonic arrives on the Starfall Islands, these Titans have been awoken by Sage after thousands of years of being dormant, thanks to the power of the Chaos Emeralds. As I mentioned earlier, the Chaos Emeralds were used to power all of the technology and machinery on the Starfall Islands. This includes the Titans themselves. Sonic can collect a total of six Chaos Emeralds via exploring the open world and completing main quest missions. However, the final seventh Emerald can only ever be found attached to the respective Titan of each island. Apart from on Oranos Island, which we'll talk about later. This means that when all six Chaos Emeralds have been extracted from their altars across the world, Sonic has to take on the Titan in his normal form and claim the last Emerald before he can go super. This leads to some really cool moments at the beginning of each boss battle where Sonic has to scale his way to the head of the Titan to claim the last Chaos Emerald. For example, you've got to climb up Giganto's legs and torso to reach its head, reach the top of the large tower in order to jump onto Wyvern, and grind up the rails on Knight's arms to reach its head. Once you've done that, the fun can truly begin.
After collecting the final Chaos Emerald, Sonic is able to go super, which is when the boss fights actually start. The rules to playing as Super Sonic are simple. Sonic doesn't take direct damage, but his rings slowly deplete as the fight progresses. This means you have to maximize damage output in order to get the boss's health down before your rings run out. This encourages the player to use a variety of combos and skills in order to deal as much damage as possible in as little time as possible, which keeps the focus of each encounter on speed. All of Sonic's abilities and combos that can be used in his normal form can be used as Super Sonic, and their damage output is amped up by a ton. It's especially fun to build up the Phantom Rush ability as Super Sonic, because when you unleash it on a boss, you can just send a ludicrous barrage of attacks at them, giving them no chance to retaliate. You can also parry the melee attacks of the bosses too, allowing you to immediately follow up with a riposte move which does lots of damage. The fights themselves are almost like a test to see how quickly you can learn a patterned moveset, and how accurately you can predict the moves they're going to make in order to launch a counter-attack, whilst also performing a variety of your own combos during the damage phases. It's actually really fun, and the fact the fact that your rings are always dropping lower and lower means you've constantly got to be outputting damage, whilst also being careful to avoid or parry attacks. Once you've done enough damage to each boss, they have a sort of final phase or desperation move, where their attacks become more desperate and erratic, as they send everything they've got at Sonic to stop him. Giganto on Kronos Island shoots lasers out of its back and sends a huge energy beam towards Sonic which prompts a quick time event in which you've got to deflect it. Wyvern on Ares Island begins firing a barrage of projectiles towards Sonic, and a quick time event is prompted that has Sonic dodging all of Wyvern's missiles, then sending them back at it. Knight on Chaos Island throws its charge shield towards Sonic and the player has to catch the shield and throw it back at it, allowing Sonic to do more damage whilst the knight is stunned, and Supreme gets out this huge sniper and shoots Sonic, which prompts another quick time event in which Sonic dodges the blast and closes in on the Titan to do more damage. Supreme also has a wider variety of attacks than other bosses, but I'll go into more specific detail about this particular boss later. One thing I'm not a huge fan of is relying on quick time events in your boss battles, however I do appreciate the effort to convince how futile the Titans attempts to fight Super Sonic are as you get closer to beating them. It adds a sense of urgency to getting that final bit of damage in as the Titans do everything in their power to defeat Sonic. Plus, as you do more damage to any given boss, not only do they unleash their desperation move, their attack patterns gradually become more complicated as they send more projectiles at you and add more attacks to their melee combos, which gives you more to dodge and parry. These are multi-layered fights, with each fight getting harder as you do more damage, which I think is a very important aspect of boss fights in video games. The boss fights themselves are sort of on rails too, meaning you don't have full control over Sonic's movement while fighting. Sonic is nowhere near as controllable as he is in the Super Sonic section of Sonic Adventure 2, in which you can control Sonic's vertical and horizontal movement for example. You can only control Sonic on a horizontal plane of movement, meaning for example, you can't go down and attack gigantic to his legs to make it fall over, which would have been really cool now that I think about it. This restriction of movement sounds bad as a concept, but I think this was done to make the fights feel like these large set pieces, and I think it works pretty well. The movement of the camera as well as Sonic himself is always directed towards the boss, which makes sense as they're the main focal point of these encounters. This means players are less likely to try and fly away to the edge of the boss arena to avoid attacks. You're encouraged to constantly engage in the fight without a second of reprieve constantly up in the boss's face doing damage. I think these bosses were designed specifically to showcase the power of Super Sonic, because honestly sometimes it feels as if Sonic is the boss, and Titans are merely trying to defeat him. This is actually quite fitting, because the last time Super Sonic was used as part of a game's story before Frontiers was in Sonic Generations, which came out in 2011. It makes sense that Sonic Team would want to bring Super Sonic back as this all-powerful form, and being able to absolutely trash a bunch of god-level titans is a great way to convey this to the audience. It's actually quite hard to lose these fights, like, you have to actively try to not win, but I think that's what the developers were going for. The power fantasy that these fights offer is something we haven't seen in Sonic for a long time, and for most people, that feeling of playing as Sonic with limitless power is enjoyable enough on its own that the bosses don't have to be overly challenging. After all, this was the triumphant return of Super Sonic in a mainline Sonic game, and they definitely didn't pull their punches when it came to showing off just how powerful he is. Part of the fun of playing as Super Sonic is being overpowered, so I think they balance these fights well.
One last thing I wanted to mention about these bosses is the soundtrack. The music that plays during these fights is some of the best Sonic boss fight music we've ever had, and I mean that wholeheartedly. The tracks that play during the fights are Undefeatable and Breaking Through It All, which are composed and arranged by Tomoya Otani with vocals from Kellen Quinn. Find Your Flame, composed and arranged by Tomoya Otani with vocals from Tyler Smith and Kellen Quinn. And I'm Here, which is once again composed and arranged by Tomoya Otani and written by Mary Kirk Holmes. There's also some talented artists involved with the guitar and string arrangements of these pieces that I think deserve to be mentioned, such as Japanese composer and guitarist Megami Wada, Japanese video game and anime composer Takahito Aguchi, and Japanese violinist and violist Koichiro Moroya, as well as the many talented people working on the music that weren't listed as main contributors. Thanks to this immense collaboration of talent, we've gotten some of the greatest Sonic music in the series. The use of the metalcore and post-hardcore sound in these boss fights really adds this cool edginess to Super Sonic that I don't think we've seen since the Adventure games. It really harkens back to the boss fights like Sonic Adventure's Perfect Chaos with Open Your Heart as the backing track, or Sonic Adventure 2's Final Hazard and Live and Learn playing. I just love the sound of these songs. They're just the perfect complement to these fights, and really brings together all the aspects of these bosses to make that Super Sonic power fantasy feel as overwhelmingly cool as possible. Just thought I had to mention the music in these boss fights. I rarely talk about video game soundtracks because I'm no authority on music, but these tracks are just that good that I felt like I had to mention them. All in all, I really like the boss fights in Frontiers. I think Sonic Team really made a ballsy move having players turn into Super Sonic multiple times in the story to fight these really ambitious bosses. Yeah, I will admit, the fights aren't perfect, as there's a certain degree of jank that comes with the lack of direction or freedom, and the fights themselves aren't very challenging. But overall, I still had a great time with them. They're definitely the highlight of Sonic Frontiers, and I hope to see as much ambition in future Sonic games as what was demonstrated here in Sonic Frontiers. Now that we've discussed the Starfall Islands, the game's movement, physics, combat, skill tree, leveling, the overall gameplay loop, cyberspace stages, main quests, side stories, characterization, and boss battles, I thought we could discuss the island that sets itself apart from the others. Rhea Island. As I mentioned earlier, Rhea Island is just the northern part of Kronos Island. Kronos was split into two areas, most likely due to not having enough time to fully flesh out such a large map. Rhea Island is unique in the sense that there are no guardians, no challenges, no cyberspace portals, no chaos emeralds, no memory tokens, no side stories, and no titans. The only objective on Rhea Island is to shut down the six large towers that protrude from the ground. The towers themselves, according to the voice in the sky that has been speaking to Sonic throughout the course of the game, are the key to tearing down the walls between dimensions. So basically, to free his friends, Sonic must deactivate these towers. In order to do this, we must reach the top of each tower through a conjunction of platforming, speed sections, grinding rails, and running across walls. From a gameplay standpoint, I really enjoyed Rhea Island because it focused focuses on the core traits of Sonic gameplay. Each tower was actually really fun to scale, because you've got to pay attention to the routes you're taking to get to the top. After hours and hours of running across large expanses of land from cutscene to cutscene, collecting endless amounts of items in the world, and messing around with Coco, finally we have some tangible content, and man is it actually really fun. I honestly had such a blast just reaching the top of each tower, admiring the view, and jumping off to plummet down to the ground below. Not only is Rare Island fun, but we're also rewarded with story beats as a result of shutting down each tower. Deactivating each tower prompts a flashback from the perspective of the Ancients from thousands of years ago. These flashbacks depict the Ancients harnessing the power of the Chaos Emeralds to escape their planet, fleeing their home planet after its destruction, their ships being forcibly drawn to Earth by the Master Emerald, the creation of the Cyberspace to preserve their memories and ambitions, the creation of the titans to battle the threat, and their final battle using the titans in space. The final flashback in particular is very significant because it shows the ancients that piloted the titans and how they dealt with the threat that followed them to earth. One of the pilots was able to bind the threat to their titan, and the other pilots were able to seal them away in cyberspace. So in the end, the ancients were able to subdue whatever it was that threatened their homeworld. However, it still resides within the cyberspace, and if freed, 
would surely wreak havoc again. Considering Sonic's goal was to break down the wars between dimensions to free his friends from cyberspace, I think you guys can see where this is going. The flashbacks were super interesting and shed lots of light on the story of the Ancients. The mention of the Master Emerald drawing them towards Earth also insinuates that the Master Emerald itself isn't of the same origin as the Chaos Emeralds. It's always been believed that the Master Emerald and the Chaos Emeralds came from the same place or were created by the same power, so this game really throws a curveball into that line of thinking. Of course it's an obvious retcon, but it's interesting and ballsy enough that I don't actually mind it. The story of the Ancients has been the most interesting part of Sonic Frontiers so far, so the idea that they were drawn to Earth by the Master Emerald and as a result found sanctuary on Angel Island is actually pretty cool. This group of ancients that found the Master Emerald and settled on Angel Island must have eventually evolved into the Chao, as we now know that the Chao and Chaos are direct genetic relatives of the ancients, thanks to the egg memos. I quite like that the Ancients are given a pretty significant role in the Sonic universe. After all, they're the most interesting plot device we've had for a Sonic game in the last 10 years. So, Raya Island offers gameplay that includes all the core aspects of fun Sonic gameplay, and also offers interesting story points and exposition about things that have been shrouded in mystery up until this point. It's like my prayers have been answered in this one isolated instance, but as much as I like the story points presented on Raya Island, just think how much more impactful these cutscenes would have been in my hypothetical version of Sonic Frontiers. You would have just spent hours deeply exploring the islands, the temples, ruins, and remnants of the ancient civilization, slowly being drip-fed just enough information about the ancients through fun Chaos Temple missions, environmental storytelling, well-written dialogue, and lore entries to keep your interest peaked. And now, in the third act of the game, a lot of your questions are answered in this satisfying outpour of story and lore, with bigger questions questions replacing the original ones. The payoff and satisfaction of this would spur people to want to finish the rest of the game in the hopes that they can find out just a little bit more about the Ancients and what happened to them. I just can't help but think Rhea Island could have been this zenith of the story where all of your nagging questions are answered, but it isn't. If only the story was actually written in a coherent way. In reality, you just spent most of your time collecting arbitrary items, doing cyberspace stages, and engaging in main quests that, as we've established, have basically nothing to do with the main story, or the mystery of uncovering the secrets of the Ancients. Because all of this game's content is either loosely related or not related at all to the main story, Rare Island feels more like a sudden, jarring dump of exposition and story, instead of being a natural progression of the story up until that point. It just feels like Sonic Team got to Rare Island and thought, oh wait, we actually need to write a story, don't we? And just opted to throw a bunch of important story moments here, despite there being next to no build-up. I just think that the writers at Sonic Team needed to find a way to take these important story moments that are actually good, and link them together with a coherent story that persists throughout the whole game, opposed to just bursts of story every now and then. This would stop big moments like the flashbacks on Rare Island, and the flashbacks from the other islands for that matter, from feeling like random dumps of story that don't feel earned because barely anything of significance precedes them. Again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but the lack of coherent story in the main quest actually actively ruins the overall story of the game. This wouldn't be a problem if the main quest actually furthered the main story, instead of just covering a bunch of inconsequential shit. It always comes back to those damn Coco. I thought I'd also take this opportunity to talk about Sonic's cyber corruption. At the start of each island, Sonic's friends are trapped in cages, and in order to free them, Sonic absorbs their cyber energy. What is cyber energy? No idea, but you're just gonna have to suspend your disbelief here a bit because cyber energy is just straight up never explained. Each time Sonic absorbs the cyber energy, he has to bear the burden of that cyber energy, which slowly corrupts his corporeal form as the game progresses. Sonic's idle animations even change depending on how much cyber energy he's absorbed, reflecting his deteriorating physical state. On Kronos and Ares Islands, his physical state is normal, which is reflected in his idle animations. He stands upright, looks around inquisitively, and crosses his arms casually. Once you get to Chaos Island, Sonic has absorbed enough cyber energy to start feeling the negative effects, and his idle animations show the strain that it's putting on him. 
He's slightly hunched over, and he holds his head as if he's in pain. Lastly, once you reach Rhea Island, his cyber corruption reaches its peak, as his idle animations show him in a state of complete exhaustion, barely able to stand, but still pushing through it all. I really like this small attention to detail. It conveys to us as the player just how much strain Sonic is going through over the course of the game, and even though he's constantly straining, he still soldiers on for the sake of his friends, which really helps with his characterization. He cares less about his own physical well-being than he does about the safety of his friends, which I think is really heroic and very Sonic. Anyway, as I said, Sonic's cyber corruption reaches its peak on Rhea Island. After deactivating all the towers, we have this scene where Sonic finds himself trapped within the cyberspace thanks to the corruption. The corrupted cyberspace is depicted as this red void with nothingness as far as the eye can see. Sonic himself can no longer move and is stuck between realities. This is where Sonic's friends show up in their corporeal forms. Deactivating the towers seemingly freed them from the cyberspace, so they show up. Oh, and Eggman's here too, with Sage. After realising what's happened to Sonic, the voice in the sky begins to talk again. Remember the one that spoke at the beginning of the game and called Sonic the key? Turns out this voice is actually the threat that caused the end of the ancient civilization. When referring to Sonic as the key, it meant the key to getting out of cyberspace after being locked away for thousands of years. It used Sonic's desire to free his friends in order to manipulate him into inadvertently free it too. Well, after Eggman laughs at Sonic and taunts him for having his soul literally stuck between realities, Sonic's friends link hands and offer words of encouragement? I don't really know how this works, but they use what can only be described as the power of friendship to save Sonic from his cyber corruption, which is just really lazy writing. This is like some shonen anime shit because it's never actually explained how they did this, it just works. They just straight up teleport away, supposedly back to the cyberspace, I don't actually know where they go, and that fixes Sonic's cyber corruption for some reason. I don't understand how this works, like why does Amy, Tails and Knuckles re-entering the cyberspace get rid of Sonic's cyber corruption? If anyone in the comments can let me know, I'd appreciate it because I've searched for explanations for this and I just can't find anything anywhere. Anyway, yay, Sonic's back, Woo! So the cyber corruption that was emphasised throughout the entire game ended up being something that could be reversed in mere seconds through the power of friendship. Great writing, Sonic Team. In my opinion, it would have been so much cooler if this cyber corruption was actually used instead of just getting thrown away for a we believe in you Sonic moment. I think it would have been a cool twist if Sonic's cyber corruption were to reach such an extent that when he used the Chaos Emeralds to turn super, he instead turned into a cyber corrupted Sonic, allowing him to use powers that the ancients had locked away in the cyberspace. There's actually a really cool piece of artwork on r slash Sonic the Hedgehog subreddit by user Hertz Burst that depicts a fully corrupted form of Cyber Sonic. The addition of a new super form that's even more powerful than regular Super Sonic thanks to the power of the Ancients could have added a whole new level to the Super Sonic power fantasy that's present in all the game's boss fights, and would have been a nice reward for the players that made it to the end. I like it when Sonic uses a negative or dark power as a necessary evil to become more powerful, kinda like when he turns into Dark Spine Sonic at the end of Sonic and the Secret Rings. That shit was so badass, but instead of using Sonic's cyber corruption in a cool way, they just decided to get rid of it as quick as it arrived, which just ends up being flat in my opinion. After Sonic comes back, Sage begs Eggman to work with Sonic, to set aside their differences in order to defeat a common enemy that threatens existence. I love it when Sonic games force Eggman and Sonic to work together, because in the end they actually make a really powerful coalition when they have to. I think it's great characterization too, it shows Eggman as a rational individual who knows when he needs to join forces with his greatest enemy, and it shows that Sonic is still willing to forgive him despite all he's done. Plus, it raises the stakes of the story. You just know an enemy is a true threat when Eggman and Sonic have no choice but to team up to overcome it. Eggman agrees to help Sonic collect the Chaos Emeralds one last time in anticipation for the final fight, and flies off in search of them. Sonic is then teleported to the final area, Oranos Island. So we've explored all the islands to the fullest extent, wasted hours helping random Coco for no reason, completed all cyberspace stages and all their bonus goals, collected the seven Chaos Emeralds three times, defeated three of the four main titans, deactivated the towers, and successfully tore down the walls between dimensions. However, 
We're not done yet, because unbeknownst to him, Sonic accidentally freed the being that destroyed the ancient civilization by unlocking the cyberspace. After being healed from his cyber corruption through the definitely not lazy plot device that is the power of friendship, Sonic was transported to the last area of the game, Oranos Island. We talked about Oranos Island earlier, and honestly, I personally don't think it even needed to be in the game at all. Rare Island really does feel like a very conclusive area with its heavy focus on narrative, so suddenly being thrust into yet another open world in order to perform menial tasks feels very jarring. Not only this, but as I mentioned earlier, Oranos Island is aesthetically identical to Kronos and Rhea Island, so it's not unique or interesting enough to really warrant being here at all. I know this is wishful thinking, but I think it would have been so cool if we had six original linear stages after Rhea Island, in which the goal is to reach the end of the stage to find each Chaos Emerald. Also, I say six stages because Eggman said he'd take care of collecting the seventh with Sage. These linear stages could use assets and environments from the previous islands, which would convey to the player that Sonic is racing across all of the islands to quickly collect all the Chaos Emeralds, knowing that he has limited time. This idea comes from the end of the world stages from Sonic 06, in which the goal of each stage is to return to familiar areas from the story to collect the Chaos Emeralds. I think it would have been really cool to include these linear stages right at the end of the game to bring a sense of urgency to the story. Instead of being able to explore Oranos Island at your leisure, you have six quick and snappy linear stages that get straight to the point. Also, it's clear Sonic Team still still knows how to make good linear stages, because some of the original stages from Cyberspace are actually really fun, with multiple routes, fully 3D speed sections, rail grinding, enemies to fight and platforming. The removal of Oranos Island would allow the devs to create these last 6 Chaos Emerald stages, because the manpower and hours that would have gone into creating the Cyberspace stages for Oranos could have gone into creating these hypothetical ending stages. I know throughout the video I've suggested a lot of changes for the game, but I genuinely believe that these changes would have made the game a lot better. Of course feel free to drop a comment letting me know how you would improve the game, because I know there's a wide range of opinions in the Sonic community. I just think either Oranos should have been unique from the other islands to make it feel like this final zone, or removed entirely and replaced with something with a bit more finality to it. By the time I'd reached Oranos Island, I was kind of bored of the whole gameplay loop of collecting memory tokens, watching cutscenes as main quest content, collecting cogs and collecting keys. The novelty of running around an open world as Sonic had worn off at that point. Plus, it's not even like Oranos was a new area, it was just the same stuff we'd seen on Kronos and Rhea, and does not offer a different visual or gameplay experience. I just think my idea of having six Chaos Emerald stages feels a lot more final and impactful, instead of just another slog through an unremarkable open world. One thing I'd say is cool about Oranos is that Sage is the character that shows up during most of the main quest objectives, and her character arc is reaching its conclusion by this point. Instead of trying to discourage Sonic from continuing with his quest like she has been for most of the game, she actively helps him, and they have conversations about all sorts of topics, such as whether or not Eggman cares about Sage or just sees her as another invention, how the ancients struggled to adapt to life on Earth, the true purpose of the Coco, how the cyberspace helped her achieve sentience, and how the Chaos Emeralds are native to the Ancients homeworld. Sage clearly enjoys talking with Sonic, because whenever they interact, her black cloak and red eyes turn white and blue, insinuating that she's experiencing positive emotions. I really like this touch. It shows that Sonic is such a nice guy that he's even capable of befriending an AI who has only just developed emotional capabilities. It's really wholesome watching him help her navigate this new state of being. There's this really nice piece of dialogue from Sonic during one of these cutscenes where Sage voices her doubts about being able to defeat the ancient threat, and Sonic replies with, If there's even a 1% chance I can turn that despair of yours into hope, I won't disappoint. This line just feels so Sonic. It really reminds me of something Sonic would say during the era of Jason Griffith playing the character. Like, I can imagine Jason Griffith's Sonic saying this easily. That sentiment of hope in the face of impossible adversity sums Sonic up as a character for me. So this line was really nice to hear because it demonstrates that the current writers somewhat understand the characterization of Sonic past the surface level stuff. Anyway, after collecting six of the seven Chaos Emeralds, Eggman shows up and tells Sonic he's found the last Emerald. Eggman willingly gives Sonic the Chaos Emerald in this moment of pure irony, because you'd never expect Eggman of all people to be the one that gives Sonic the last Emerald. Sonic then flies off to find the final Titan, the one that the ancient pilot used to seal the threat in cyberspace. One more. I gotta hurry up. Sonic! 
Sonic. We know. You're not fast enough, so I found it for you. Go ahead and beat that giant! Don't you dare lose it! Now why would I want to disappoint you? We've already discussed the Titan boss fights as a whole, but I'd like to talk about Supreme on its own, because it definitely sets itself apart from the other fights. Supreme definitely has the widest range of movement and variety of attacks out of any of the Titans in the game. Being the fourth and final one, you'd expect it to be unique in some way, and it is. Supreme can use melee attacks, can shoot energy beams from its sentries, and can use its sniper to shoot Sonic at range. Supreme can even fly around the boss arena thanks to the large wings it gets in the second phase of the fight. Supreme's fight focuses on projectiles and ranged attacks mainly because of its sentries that constantly float around it, shooting large yellow energy projectiles in all directions. This adds a nice aspect of movement to the fight, as players will have to carefully maneuver through the changing fire patterns of these sentries in order to find an opening to do damage to the boss. I particularly like the move Supreme does where it lines up its sentries to simultaneously shoot 7 laser beams at Sonic. You can actually parry all of them to send them back at the sentries, in turn destroying them all in one go, which allows you to close in to do some extra damage. However, Supreme will eventually generate more sentries to continue bombarding you with projectiles. If you do enough successive damage in a short burst, Supreme will fall to the ground stunned, which allows you to follow up with a powerful spin attack, which does even more damage, allowing you to continue your combo for even longer. Supreme is definitely the most engaging of all the boss fights in the game, and it even features the game game's main theme was its boss music, which I thought was a nice touch. So I think I've rambled too much about Oranos Island at this point. It's time for us to talk about the ending of the game, and oh boy, get ready for probably the least climactic ending you've ever seen in a Sonic game. No, you, you know what? Let me re let me rephrase that. The least climactic ending in any game. After Sonic deals the final blow to Supreme, we can see this red and purple gas emanating from the Titan. This, of course, is the threat that's eluded us for the entire game. Sonic thinks that in defeating Supreme, he's defeated the being that destroyed the Ancients, but he couldn't be more wrong. Sage confirms this, saying that it's retreating into space in order to regain its true form. This sounds really cool. You just had a pretty fun boss fight and now you're being told that you're about to fight something even stronger. Sage even says that Super Sonic won't be strong enough on its own to defeat it and that she needs to pilot the Titan in order to help Sonic in space. I was so excited to see what the boss was going to be. Eggman refers to Sage as dear daughter as she flies away, which is a satisfying development for Eggman's character because he's been grappling with the idea of whether or not he could or should consider her daughter for the entire game. Not only is Eggman's concern for Sage an insane humanizing moment for him, as a character who has never once shown love or care for any of his creations, but it sets the stakes for this next fight as it insinuates that Sage may not make it out safely. But the fact that she's willing to potentially sacrifice her newfound sentience to protect the people she has only just met is quite a beautiful sentiment, and is definitely a nice conclusion to Sage's arc. She went from being untrusting and skeptical of others, to literally wanting to give her life for them. I for one think that's a pretty poignant arc, even if its execution was quite poor in the grand scheme of things. Anyway, Sage takes control of Supreme, and the two fly up into space in order to stop this threat once and for all. So, what does all of this come to? The hours of exploring the islands, fucking around with Coco, getting 100% on the cyberspace stages, fishing with Big, collecting the Chaos Emeralds, fighting Guardians, shutting down the towers, and defeating the Titans, all comes to a boss fight against a big purple moon called The End. Which is a shit name, by the way. Also, I use the term boss fight very lightly, because it isn't a fight at all. 
It's a glorified game of Space Invaders. I can't even put into words how disappointed I was by this. The fact that Sonic Team opted to just take one of the boring minigames from the story that was mainly used to hack computers and made it their final boss is just absolutely terrible. I just think this is another symptom of the game being released before it was fully finished. I'm sure the developers wanted to create something cool for their final boss, but my guess is execs and shareholders pushed for the game to be released earlier to cash in. There's no way that the people who worked hard on this game got to the end and were like, yeah, I just don't feel like making a final boss. The way I see it, devs are merely the talent, and they answer to the ones with the money and power who also have an interest in getting the game out as soon as possible while spending as little money as possible. Because of this decision to not make an actual final boss, Sonic Frontier's ending is forever tarnished as an anticlimactic disappointment. I'm not even going to go through the effort of critiquing this boss because it's honestly an insulting excuse for an ending fight after 20 to 25 hours of playing in order to reach this point. But I think this highlights a greater point about the video game industry at the moment. Far too many games are being released in unfinished states, and instead of being delayed, they're pushed out the door for everyone to buy, so that they can be patched retroactively with the content that they should have had in the first place. Sonic Frontiers had been in development for 5 years. There's literally no excuse as to why the final boss ended up being whatever this is. Whoever was in charge clearly saw the negative feedback and concerns from fans that came after the initial gameplay demos were released in the summer of 2022, and yet still refused to delay the game, meaning the devs were never able to fully realise their vision for this game. This just shows the attitude of higher-ups and the money men of Sega. They're just straight up milking that Sonic cash cow, and actively hindering the devs from making a complete product. The boss fight- you know what, I can't even seriously call it a boss fight. The Space Invaders minigame ends with Sonic blocking a huge laser from the end, then having Supreme, piloted by Sage, throw him him at the big purple moon. Yeah, I forgot to even talk about the design of the end itself, so I'll just briefly summarise it now. Having a big purple moon as your ending boss is a shit idea for a boss design, and looks so fucking goofy when, for the entire game, the characters have insisted that this is the most powerful being in existence. Like. I'm sorry, but you're telling me this is what wiped out a hyper-advanced civilization that was able to harness the power of the Chaos Emeralds? It's absolutely mind-boggling that this was agreed upon for the final design of the end, when the rest of the game is filled with such cool boss designs and concepts. Like, it's just a fucking big purple moon. This would have been the perfect opportunity to go all out with boss design. Like, they could have designed a godlike final boss, kind of like... Dark Gaia or Solaris. After all, if it was powerful enough to destroy the Ancients, it at least has to look cool, right? There's so many concepts going through my head as to what the end could have truly been. Like, actually, why is it a purple moon? It honestly baffles me so much. This also would have been a cool point to delve deeper into Sonic's cyber corruption that I talked about earlier. In my revised version of events, Sonic would not have been cured of his cyber corruption on Rare Island. However, it also would have not consumed him there and then. Instead, I would have saved this for the final boss. After defeating Supreme as Supersonic, I think it would have been cool for his cyber corruption to get so bad that it takes over while he's in super form, which would have turned him into the cyber corrupted Supersonic, similar to that Reddit post that I showed you earlier. This could have been a cool reward for players that stuck around for the end of the game. I always think it's great when they get creative with different versions of Supersonic forms and just go for a new one entirely. This would have immediately made the prospect of the final boss so exciting as you'd be eager to use cyber-corrupted Sonic's new abilities to finally take down the end. Having these new powers paired with an actually cool final boss that takes place in space and challenges you with counterable moves, ranged attacks, melee attacks and cool set pieces would have been absolutely amazing and would have made this ending feel grand and climactic as you finally face the enemy that's been built up for the entire game. Anyway, yeah, so Sage throws Sonic at the end and then Sonic goes really quick and flies through the big purple moon and then, oh no, it didn't fully work. So Sage makes the decision to fly Supreme into the already injured end to finish it off. I actually like this sacrifice, to be fair. It doesn't feel earned, which is a common theme in this game. If there was a challenging and impressive final boss, this moment would feel so impactful. But I just can't take the ending of the game seriously. Sage sacrifices herself to defeat the end and Amy, Knuckles and Tails come back from the cyberspace safe and sound. Honestly, I still have no idea how they willed themselves back into the cyberspace with the power of friendship back on Rhea Island, but 
they're back now. Sonic flies back down to Earth and the Chaos Emeralds scatter once more, ready to be found again in a future game. Sonic and his friends celebrate their victory, and none of them even so much as show concern or gratitude towards Sage, who literally just gave her life for everyone. Like, Sonic doesn't even give like a solemn glance up at the sky or any indication that he acknowledges Sage's sacrifice. Dude just straight up doesn't seem to care. Although I do appreciate that in the final cutscene with Sonic, Amy, Knuckles and Tails, their arcs aren't forgotten. Sonic makes mention of each of the characters' plans to experience more of life, now that there's nothing stopping them from fulfilling these goals. I just wish this last moment was used for a bit more reflection about this journey from Sonic himself. I mean, he just witnessed Sage sacrifice herself, and yet he doesn't seem troubled by this at all. Like, he doesn't even mention her sacrifice or anything, he just moves on into Entirely. There's also this moment where Sonic says, So, there was fun. And all the characters look at him and make over-exaggerated, bored faces. Which I think is hilarious because it perfectly highlights the way I feel about most of this game. Funnily enough, Eggman's ending is actually the best and most impactful of all. We have this emotional shot of Eggman watching the pieces of the end fall back down to the Starfall Islands. Knowing that Sage didn't survive the fight, he stares into the distance, watching the debris enter the atmosphere, and outstretches his hand as if he's reaching out to Sage. He then hangs his head in sorrow before looking back up and clenching his fist with resolve. So many emotions are shown in this shot alone, and yet not a single word is said. It's brilliant. Honestly, Dr. Eggman was without a doubt the strongest characterization in this game, and this stays consistent until the very end of the game in which his arc culminates in this beautiful scene. Eggman also gets a post credit scene, which is pretty mysterious. It shows him typing away on a computer, and then this symbol comes up on the screen and we can hear Sage speak. She sounds lost, scared, and confused. I like that Eggman's arc of seeing Sage as his daughter also wasn't forgotten about either, and it seems like this arc will progress into the next game, in which Eggman and will clearly be trying to find a way to bring her back, which I think could certainly lead to some interesting character moments. It's a story thread that has a lot of potential in my opinion, because it gives Eggman something other to do than just plot world domination constantly. He now has something he cares about. Well, that's it. That's Sonic Frontiers done. And my god, was it one of the most confusing and difficult games to critique ever. Sonic Frontiers is a strange game because throughout the course of writing this script, I've gone from hating the game, to understanding why people enjoy it, to actually liking it, to being bored with it, and finally to feeling that it's a game that had a great deal of potential, but that the potential was squandered because it was pushed out of the door before it was ready. Don't get me wrong. I think Sonic Frontiers is a decent game, and is certainly the best Sonic game we've got in years. But it could have been so much better, which is why it's a bit of a shame that it was never able to reach its full potential. Whether it be the recycled assets from Kronos for Rhea and Oranos Islands, the lack of momentum-based physics and movement, the overuse of light RPG mechanics, the open world padding, the recycled layouts for the cyberspace stages, the lackluster main quest content that has little to nothing to do with the main story, the lack of meaningful side content, the disjointed story or the anticlimactic final boss, these are all symptoms of a greater problem with Sonic Frontiers, that it needed more time in development to either fine tune or completely change aspects of the game in order to make it feel more of a complete experience. The thing is, I don't hate Sonic Frontiers. If it was terrible through and through with no redeeming features, then yeah, I'd lump it in with Sonic Forces. But Frontiers is different. Underneath the glaring issues with this game is a concept that I think was really ambitious for Sonic Team. The open worlds are gorgeous and fun to traverse. The combat is sure a step up from previous Sonic games. The original cyberspace stages that don't borrow from older games are well designed and replayable. Big's fishing minigame is wholesome and fun. The characterization of each character is well executed. The underlying story of the ancients is really intriguing. Island has fun level design, the boss battles are engaging and cool, and the soundtrack is brilliant. So no, I don't hate Sonic Frontiers. It's a mixed bag of great, good, bad, and nonsensical game design. But there's something in there that made me want to give it another playthrough for this video. And I'm glad I did, because it allowed me to discover things I liked about it. The thing is, Sonic Frontiers being unfinished isn't sad because it's a bad game. Because it isn't. It's sad because it was almost great. Uh.
Ah, uh, this is such a bad fake out. You guys have seen the timeline of the video. You know there's an extra like two hours left. So let's just jump straight into it. The original part of the script there I wrote back in February of 2023, but since the three post-launch updates came out for Sonic Frontiers, I thought I'd write a section that I'd tack on the end of the video here discussing the new updates. So yeah, we discussed the base game of Sonic Frontiers, but the post-launch updates adds a ton of new content and fixes some of the various issues with the game. Well, that's a whole rabbit hole in of itself, and you bet we're gonna jump right into it. First off we have update 1, the sight, sounds and speed update released in March of 2023. This was a great way to kick off the post launch support for Sonic Frontiers and actually added in a ton of cool features and quality of life improvements. To kick off the new features in update 1 is jukebox mode. What sounds like a fairly trivial and simple feature ends up being such an important part of the game when you're just wandering around finishing up content around the world. Jukebox mode is exactly that, a jukebox that allows you to play our favourite music from all eras of Sonic. Granted, I will admit there are a few songs missing that I would have liked to see, but but classics such as Emerald Coast from Sonic Adventure, City Escape from Sonic Adventure 2, Seaside Hill from Sonic Heroes, Wave Ocean from Sonic 06, and Rooftop Run from Sonic Unleashed, and so many more are available in jukebox mode. Having access to such a wide range of music from the Sonic series completely changes the vibe of exploring the open worlds, and adds a nice layer of familiarity to what can sometimes be very dreary and lonely open world spaces. On top of this, you can choose to play any of the open world tracks from Sonic Frontiers. Want to listen to Kronos Island music whilst exploring Chaos Island for example? No problem, the jukebox mode can do that for you. I didn't realise it when I first heard about this update, but the jukebox mode really is a genius addition to Sonic Frontiers, and it made my time tackling the content of these updates so much more enjoyable. Would I have liked to see a wider range of music? Yeah, certainly. But the music we do have access to is incredibly extensive and includes some of the best Sonic tracks of all time. So I'm pretty content with what we've got. Photo mode is pretty self-explanatory, but its inclusion in this update is a very welcome one. Personally, I'm a huge fan of photo modes in video games. In fact, I think every game should have a photo mode option. I can't think of a game that wouldn't benefit from having a photo mode. It's just a really nice option to be able to edit your own shots in game to showcase some of your favourite moments. Sonic Frontiers photo mode is pretty similar to all major AAA games, giving you the freedom to choose the camera's position, rotation, height, tilt, zoom, as well as the speed that the camera moves, allowing you to get more precise shots. There are also a few options for filters which is always nice, letting you stylize your photo with a variety of different looks. I will say though, when you compare the features of Sonic Frontiers photo mode to that of most other AAA games, it is quite bare bones. Other photo mode features allow you to change all sorts of things such as time of day, depth of field, character poses, weather, saturation, particle effects, exposure, contrast, lens aperture, and the intensity of applied filters. Sonic Frontiers is lacking all of the aforementioned features. I would have loved to see more customizable features not only for photo composition, but also for the world and Sonic himself. It would have been great if we could choose a variety of poses and facial expressions for Sonic, as well as being able to change things about the world around him such as weather conditions or the time of day. But overall, I still think it's great that Sonic Team added a photo mode to Frontiers. It adds a lot of personalization to your experience playing the game, and it actually helped directly in the creation of this video. Throughout the video, I've used photo mode to capture cinematic footage of the game to either accompany story exposition or to show a detailed view of in-game items, characters, and locations. Photo mode massively helps me when creating videos because it allows me to record immersive and cinematic footage. It's a 
trick I've used both in my Demon Souls review and my Horizon Forbidden West retrospective. So for me, a photo mode feature is always a huge bonus when I'm making a video for a game. Whether or not you think Sonic Frontier's photo mode should have offered more customization for photos, it's hard to deny that this is a great addition to the game, and I really do think every game would benefit from having a photo mode feature. In terms of playable content, Update 1 added one of my favourite new additions to Sonic Frontiers, Cyberspace Challenge Mode. Now, I enjoyed the initial 30 cyberspace stages in the base game for the most part. Even though I have my gripes with them, they are good stages with a fair amount of replay value. One thing I really enjoyed was going for the S rank in each stage. So this Cyberspace Challenge Mode was right up my alley. There are 5 challenge runs in total, Kronos Island, Ares Island, Chaos Island, Oranos Island, and all stages. Each of the first four challenges times how quickly you can get through every cyberspace stage on each of the islands, with Kronos Challenge being cyberspace stages 1-1 through 1-7, Ares being 2-1 through 2-7, Chaos 3-1 through 3-7, and Oranos 4-1 through 4-9. I just thought it was so fun doing all the cyberspace stages on a given island back to back, being timed on how quickly you can get through all of them. Once you've gotten the S rank for each of the four cyberspace challenges, you unlock the final challenge all stages, which means you have to complete all 30 cyberspace stages in the game back to back within the time limit, which was super hard but also a really fun challenge that pushed my skills to their limits. Through trial and error I managed to perfect my times on every stage in the game and in the end was able to confidently run through every single stage in one 39 minute sitting in order to get the overall S rank. I found this challenge mode really exhilarating and it reminded me just how fun these cyberspace stages can be when you're optimizing your run for the S rank. Completing all five cyberspace challenges with an S rank rewards you with the power boost in cyberspace stages, allowing you to run at Sonic's max speed in the cyberspace. This is a nice little reward, allowing you to complete cyberspace stages even faster than before. You can even utilize this power boost in cyberspace arcade mode, which means you can go back and beat all your previous times adding a ton more replay value to the cyberspace stages if you're someone who enjoys beating previous records. Although as much as I like this increase to speed, it does further to highlight a problem with Sonic's movement in the cyberspace stages, mainly his turning circle being too wide. Sonic moving at a faster pace means you have less time to correct his movement when running around bends, often leading to Sonic just hitting the side barriers which slows you down. I would have loved if this update added the option to customize things like Sonic's turn speed in the cyberspace stages, kind of like how you can customize Sonic's movement modifiers in the open zones. This would have immediately made the power boost feel a lot better to use, but as it stands it can hinder you if you're not careful where you choose to boost. At least you can toggle power boost off in the settings, so if you don't like it, you're not forced to use it. I just hope that if we get linear stages in the next game, Sonic is a little bit more controllable on a horizontal plane. Overall though, I actually really loved the cyberspace challenge mode. It was challenging, but very achievable if you learn each stage and take the most efficient routes when platforming. Definitely a great addition to the game, which gives people a reason to go back and play through the cyberspace stages again, and offers a tangible reward for completion. Probably my favourite part of Update 1 is the Battle Rush mode, which pits you against enemies from each island in a combat gauntlet that will push your combat abilities to their limits. Similar to the Cyberspace Challenge mode, there are 5 timed challenges, one for each island and one for all islands. Each combat challenge takes unique enemies from each island, including Guardians, and times how quickly you can get through them, giving you a rank based on how quickly you're getting through the overall gauntlet. Something that I loved is that some of these time constraints are very strict meaning you have to work out which combos work best with which enemies, and eventually you get to the point where you're absolutely tearing through each fight. 
it's just so satisfying. It also does a great job of showcasing the game's combat system. There were certain moves I pretty much never used during my time playing the main story, but the battle rush challenges forced me to use basically all of Sonic's abilities to get through with an S rank. At the end of each challenge you get to replay the titan boss of each island, which is such a nice finale to the gauntlet, and you've got to play these bosses pretty much perfectly in order to achieve the S rank. There is some room for error, but missing parries and not making the most of damage phases wastes a lot of time. I'd recommend upgrading Sonic's abilities to max before taking on the battle rush mode in order to get the best times possible. That extra damage really helps with defeating the smaller enemies quicker so you can get to the titans as soon as possible, leaving more room for error on the bosses. Once you've cleared all four individual island challenges with an S rank, you unlock the All Islands challenge, which pits you against every enemy in the entire game on all islands back to back without reprieve. This challenge was really tough for me. I'd speed through the smaller enemies and guardians but then choke at the titans. Playing this over and over again pretty much made me perfect at defeating the titans as I had their entire attack patterns memorized and found the best ways to deal the most amount of damage in the smallest amount of time I could. Ornos Island was particularly challenging during this final gauntlet because there are a lot of tough enemies such as the group of white Ornos Island soldiers, Caterpillar, Master Ninja and Ghost which all take a decent amount of time to defeat especially if you make errors. Many times I got through the entire challenge only to fail towards the end of Oranos Island, but I eventually got it and completed the All Islands challenge with an S rank, officially completing one of the most challenging modes in the game. It's safe to say, I was quite proud of myself. Completing the Battle Rush challenges with an S rank rewards you with extreme difficulty for the main story, which is a mode that will push you to your limits. In extreme mode, Sonic dies in one hit, meaning you must play perfectly at all times. Sonic's stats also can cannot be increased on extreme difficulty, so you're stuck at level 1 speed, attack, defense and ring capacity. Prices in Big's fishing shop are also multiplied by 10 in extreme difficulty, meaning you can't solely rely on Big's shop in order to collect all the items to progress the story, you have to collect them yourself. Which I think is a really cool addition and certainly makes the game much harder as you can't bypass content via farming fishing tokens. I think extreme difficulty is a really cool reward for completing the battle rush mode. My only issue with it is that there's no reward for completing the game on extreme difficulty, it's merely there for the love of the challenge. I think this would have been the perfect opportunity to reward players with something they've been asking for since Sonic Frontiers was released playable supersonic in the open zones. Now I'm aware that this would probably be something that would require a lot of work to implement given how supersonic controls much differently than regular sonic, but I personally have no desire to play the game through again on extreme difficulty due to lack of reward. But if playable supersonic was on the table, I'd go for it without hesitation. I just can't see myself putting myself through such a challenge for nothing, but it is still really cool they added this difficulty in for people who want that level of challenge. Overall, I had such a fun time mastering the battle rush mode and I hope to see something like this come back in future Sonic releases. To wrap up update 1, I just wanted to mention some of the quality of life improvements that were introduced. Firstly, the slot machine during Starfall events can be toggled off, meaning if you don't want to interact with the Starfall event, you're not forced to have the slot machine hovering in the center of your screen, which is a nice option. In the end game, you really don't need more purple coins, so Starfall events become obsolete and being able to turn off the slot machine is a godsend. Secondly, the power up animation that plays when you collect max rings can also be toggled off, which is absolutely absolutely great. I have this toggled off as a standard now. Even if the animation is cool, it becomes old very quickly. Being able to toggle it off is amazing because it means you don't lose your flow halfway through platforming or running when you reach max rings. For those that like the animation, you can leave it toggled on, so it really is the best of both worlds. Lastly, and this is a big one, they actually updated the upgrading system for the Elder Coco. Remember how I said upgrading Sonic speed and ring capacity via the Elder Coco took a very long time because you could only upgrade each stat one by one, well now you can choose to give all your available Coco to the Elder which will upgrade your stats based on how many Coco you have, but you can also choose to only go up one level at a time if you wanted to reach a specific level and stop there. This update was so needed, and I'm so glad they fixed this. It means nobody else has to sit there for 30 minutes upgrading stats, and you also have much more control over how much you want to level up. It's nearly perfect. Update 1 was a solid beginning for Sonic Frontiers post-launch 
support, with lots of fun content, rewards, and quality of life improvements. Let's hope this same energy is kept up in update 2, eh? Update 2 for Sonic Frontiers released in June 2023, and it definitely carries on the trend of adding in some great post-launch content. I had a ton of fun making my way through this update's content, so let's go ahead and celebrate Sonic's 32nd birthday. The first thing that Update 2 added was New Game Plus, which is always a great option for post-launch content. It encourages players to give the game another playthrough, but also allows them to approach it differently than the first time. Although, similar to Extreme Difficulty, there are no rewards for completing the game on New Game Plus, and no unique extras, trophies, or achievements tied to New Game Plus, which I would have liked. Nevertheless, it's a good addition to the game, as I think New Game Plus has become an industry standard for games like this. It's become expected for most games to have the option to load a New Game Plus save in a post-launch update, and I'm glad that Sonic Team added it in for fans that were waiting for a reason to play through the game again from the beginning. I have no reason to play New Game Plus, but I'm sure many, many people were waiting for it. As the name of the update suggests, Update 2 is all about Sonic's birthday, and you can't have a birthday without the birthday vibes. If you go to the extra section on the main menu, you can choose to change a variety of things about the game's world and characters to fit the theme of Sonic's birthday. This includes Sonic's outfit, Sonic's friends' outfits, the Coco, and the overall theme of the islands. This is a really fun addition to the game. Yeah, it serves no practical purpose, but little extras like this are just fun to mess around with, so I decided to put on Sonic's birthday extras for a while to see how different the Starfall Islands look. When loading into the game, the HUD theme has changed to resemble present wrapping paper, and all of the platforms, rails, bounce pads, dash panels, rainbow rings, and more have been given the birthday bash treatment and I think it's just fun. Definitely not something I'd use all the time, but it was fun to use for a little while to see how different the islands looked. Sonic's outfit is also pretty funny. He's wearing this bow tie and party hat and has these huge comically large sunglasses on. Although, now that I think about it, Sonic does have huge eyes, so they probably need to be that big to work for him. Either way, Sonic is looking very stylish in his new getup, so I think it's time we delve into the main content and improvements introduced in this update. The first major piece of content introduced in this update was the Open Zone Coco Challenges, which has you collecting new types of Coco throughout the Open Zones. There are 40 in total, with 10 per island. However, it isn't as simple as walking up to one of these new Coco and picking it up. You have to partake in some of the new platforming routes in order to reach them, which I thought was really cool. Adding a bigger emphasis on platforming was a nice change from simply speeding around the open world on foot or using rails. You actually have to engage with the game's platforming, and I will admit, some of these new routes are quite challenging, but that only makes it more fun. I had lots of fun figuring out how to find each Coco, and listening to songs using the jukebox mode made this even more fun. Adding a dash of nostalgia to running around the open world, the perfect way to celebrate Sonic's birthday. But that doesn't mean the Coco challenges are without their problems. One specific issue I noticed was it was sometimes hard to find where the platforming route actually starts, because sometimes they're quite far from the actual Coco marker itself. Not only this, but with the render distance being so low in this game, a lot of the platforms wouldn't load until you're quite close to them, which makes it hard to survey an area in order to find the beginning of the platforming route, or to even find the platform that the Coco is sitting on. For a lot of these challenges, I had to search up where to go just so I could start platforming, which was a shame, because it made my experience more of a chore than it needed to be. There's also this really frustrating one on Kronos Island in which you need to climb this large tower and press buttons along the way. Not only is the platforming kind of janky during this Coco challenge, but the game doesn't do a very good job of indicating what you actually have to do to progress up the tower. Most of the buttons are hidden behind boxes, and once pressed, you have to collect the rings that appear in order to retract spikes on platforms, or to move platforms entirely. But this is a mechanic that isn't found anywhere else in the game, so at first it took me a while to figure out that collecting the rings was the objective, 
in hindsight, it seems so obvious that that's what I'd have to do, especially considering the rings spawn after stepping on the buttons. But at the time, I just assumed they were extra rings that spawned so you can survive a few hits from the spikes, and not rings that had to be collected to progress up the tower. And to top it all off, to finally reach the top of the tower, you have to do this weird jump off a nearby ramp fast enough to propel yourself into the air so you can grab the wall that leads to the top. But it all feels very precarious. I tried so many times and fell off the tower so many times before I finally got it. Maybe it's a case of me not being great at the game, but it felt like this particular Coco challenge was very unforgiving when compared to the rest, and it ended up being a frustrating platforming experience instead of a satisfying one. I'm all for a challenge, but for me, this just felt like too much. But other than that, I can't really think of any others that felt overly difficult or janky. I had a great time exploring the open fields of Kronos, delving into the canyons of Ares, soaring into the skies of Chaos, and reaching new heights on Oranos, all to find these lovable little guys and bring them to the Elder Coco. The designs of these new Coco are fun too, with the little guys wearing funny hats like cowboy hats, pirate hats, crowns, there's even a little ninja and a guy with a sword on his back. It's great, no idea why they're dressed so whimsically, but I don't care, it's fun. So what's the reward for collecting all these Coco? and taking them back to the Elder Coco, you may be asking. Well, it's not the best reward ever, but I appreciate Sonic Team including a reward for these challenges nonetheless. After collecting all the Coco and taking them to the Elder Coco, you are rewarded with the ability to maintain your boost for longer before it runs out. This does seem like a great reward at first, until you realise that you can gain infinite boost in the open worlds by using the Psylute to draw an infinity symbol. This only takes like 2 seconds at most, so you don't really have to worry about your boost meter at all once you figure out this trick. However, the extended boost can be used in the cyberspace stages, so if you pair this longer boost with the power boost we got from the first update, you can probably cut down a lot of time in the cyberspace if you're into that sort of thing. But honestly, this reward just isn't worth it for me, so instead of handing my Coco into the Elder Coco, I just keep them on me so that whenever I go idle, I have a fun group of Coco standing in front of me on all islands, wearing all sorts of funny hats and quirky outfits. For me, that's a reward in of itself. Regardless of some of the jank, the popping in platforms, and the lackluster reward, I enjoyed collecting these Coco. I think the focus on precise platforming is great, and it's definitely worth worth engaging with this content just for that alone. Something I touched upon much earlier in this video during the movement and physics section was how the physics were improved in a post-game update. Update 2 introduced the deceleration rate and jump deceleration rate sliders in the game settings, allowing you to choose how much momentum Sonic retains when slowing down from boosting and jumping. I've found that by far the best thing to do is to immediately set both of these values to zero, meaning that Sonic has to gradually slow down instead of losing momentum completely upon stopping or jumping. With both deceleration rate and jump deceleration rate down to zero, Sonic Frontiers feels amazing to play in the open zones. Being able to boost, then jump and retain your momentum from the boost feels so satisfying and allows you to really traverse across the world faster than ever before. One thing I absolutely love doing is boosting up a hill and then jumping right at the highest point of the slope so I can soar through the air as the land slopes downwards. You can really get some nice airtime. It just feels great. Boost jumping is now a viable option for platforming too. If you want to reach a platform that's a decent distance away, you can boost jump quite easily to reach it, as the momentum carries you a long way. This is one of my favourite moves to perform. It just feels so good to pull off successfully. It's crazy how just a simple change in Sonic's physics immediately turned this game's movement system from good to brilliant. This game is just so fun to play now. I find myself loading it up just to mess around in the open worlds with no goal in mind. I genuinely don't think Sonic has felt better to play as than he does following update 2 of Sonic Frontiers. It's just that good. That doesn't mean it's perfect though. Jump deceleration being at zero is great, but you still don't gain momentum from running down inclines, which I would have loved to see. I genuinely think this would be the perfect Sonic movement system if they were to somehow incorporate downwards momentum when running down hills and slopes. 
However, I believe they chose to keep his lack of momentum because Sonic wouldn't control well during platforming if he had such low deceleration. Precise platforming requires a great deal of control when Sonic is moving, so having him almost slip and slide when trying to position yourself would be incredibly frustrating. I'm imagining something similar to Unleashed's movement, where Sonic has much more slidey movement due to his deceleration rate, which would cause him to be difficult to control when trying to platform. The only fix I can think of for this is that Sonic would have downwards momentum in the larger open world spaces, but as soon as it comes to platforming his movement becomes tighter and his deceleration speed increases. Kind of like how when you interact with some of the 2D platforming sequences in the open world, Sonic's movement changes to suit that style of play. This would be the best of both worlds in my opinion, and if this is something that was incorporated into the next game, I really think Sonic's movement would be perfect. Regardless though, these improvements to the game's physics really add a lot to the experience, and I think this update made Sonic Frontiers a million times more fun to play. My favourite piece of content from Update 2 has to be the Action Chain Challenges. These challenges are scattered across each island and the goal is simple. Increase your score multiplier to 256 by collecting these golden orbs as quickly as possible and perform as many actions as possible within the time limit to increase your score. Actions include boosting, collecting rings, performing combos and interacting with gimmicks such as bounce pads, dash panels, rainbow rings and anything that increases your speed or boosts you into the air. I I absolutely loved these challenges. You're allowed to go anywhere on the map within the time limit and you can interact with any platforming you want. You just have to make sure that you keep performing actions as quickly as possible in order to keep your score multiplier up. This leads to really fast paced action movement as you speed around the world trying to accrue as many points as possible. I went for the S rank in all of these challenges and even though some of them are very tough, I never felt like it wasn't my fault that I failed to get the top score. There was always something I could do better to increase my score. As you fail, you begin optimizing your runs to quickly dash between different action chains. It's great. I'd say the only thing that hindered my experience was when I was on Ares Island. Those damn jellyfish kept forcing my camera to look upwards when I got too close to them, which often caused me to fail. I never really got why every time you see a jellyfish, your camera follows them into the air, because it ends up just becoming really, really annoying when you're just trying to explore, or in my case, trying to complete the action chain challenges. This is the only time playing this content where I felt that the game was actively hindering me. Apart from that though, these action chains are a lot of fun and are some of my favourite content in the game. So what is the reward for getting an S rank in all action chain challenges? Well, it's probably the best reward in the entire game the spin dash. This is without a doubt the best update to movement in the game. I'm so happy they brought back the manual spin dash. Not only can you stand still and charge it up, but you can also go straight into the spin dash whilst running like in the original Sonic Adventure. This allows you to boost up a hill normally, then go into a spin dash at the top in order to roll down at insane speeds. It really helps with getting across the world faster. Not only this, but the spin dash can launch Sonic into the air when used on an upward slope, meaning you can use upwards inclines as ramps to gain insane airtime. This really brings Sonic's movement to a whole new level, and I absolutely love it. I think I can confidently say that after this update, Sonic Frontiers has one of, if not the best, movement system we've ever had in a Sonic game. And if that isn't great enough already, the spin dash also becomes available to use in Cyberspace Stages too, which adds a whole new layer of movement to these linear stages. Some people have done some crazy speedruns using the spin dash, as it can be used to bypass entire sections of levels if used in the right place. I'm nowhere near good enough to do this myself, but the spin dash certainly is useful for non-speedrunning players because you can use it when running down slopes to move very quickly, which in turn allows you to cut down your cyberspace times even more if you want to. So yeah, the action chain challenges are not only some of the most fun content in the game, but they offer what is definitely the best reward in the game as well. I had an absolute blast playing through these challenges, and I certainly had a blast using the spin dash. This update is great.
Lastly, same as update 1, update 2 adds some quality of life improvements to Sonic Frontiers that I think are pretty neat. First of all, update 2 added more songs to the jukebox, which is always a welcome addition. Being able to listen to even more of Sonic's best tracks at the click of a button is great, and it's exactly what fans wanted at the time. Secondly, a completion percentage screen was added to the game's map. All you need to do is bring up the map, press the switch maps button, and when you're hovering over the map you want to view, you can see which activities have been completed and which haven't. The ones that have been completed are marked in gold. In the bottom right, you can also see how much of the island has been mapped, as well as your highest action chain challenge score. It's a really cool feature and definitely helps completionists keep track of how many activities they have left. And with that, that's the end of update 2. This update added so much to the game that I think is brilliant. And even though I had some issues with the Coco challenges, and even though I wish Sonic had more momentum when in the open world zones, I still think this update was great. And the fact they're all completely free really does demonstrate Sonic Team's desire to create goodwill with Sonic fans by listening to the community and giving people what they want. With these first two updates done and dusted, it's time we take a look at update 3. The big story update for Sonic Frontiers. The Final Horizon. Hold it, Hedgehog! Before you embark, there is one other scenario to consider. All right. I'm listening. Moments ago, your friends sacrificed their corporeal forms to suppress your cyber corruption and return you to this dimensional plane. They were so close to being free again, and they gave it all up for me. I don't care how many islands or titans it takes, I'm getting them back this time. <clears throat> Please, no tedious speeches about the superpower of teamwork. Of my millions of calculations, there was one so remote and unlikely I did not consider it. However, as things stand, it could be the one to save us all. Well, I'm all about beating the odds. What's the plan? I can reverse your friends' efforts and restore them. They would then seek out the Chaos Emeralds for us. I can stabilize your cyber corruption for a brief time. And then, I would guide you on how to convert that corruption into power, so that you may end this conflict and save Father. And save the world, too, right? It is his to conquer, so yes. Yeah, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I like that plan. Let's do it to it. Be forewarned, the trials you face will be grueling, and we will have precious little time. Please, I live for time trials. Let's go already. The final update for Sonic Frontiers doesn't just add new content and new playable characters, but it also rewrites the ending of the game, as it takes place just before the final fight of Oranos Island. After stepping through the ominous ring portal on Oranos Island, we are transported to what I can only assume is a different timeline, one in which the ending of the game plays out very differently. The story of the Final Horizon was the actual intended ending for Sonic Frontiers, but the developers just didn't have time to fully realise it, which proves my previous statements about the game being released before it was ready. Sonic is running across the verdant green hills of Oranos Island, on his search for the Chaos Emeralds in order to fight Supreme, where he's stopped by Eggman and Sage. Sage mentions to Sonic that his friends just sacrificed their corporeal forms to suppress his own cyber corruption, the key word in this sentence being suppress, suggesting that Sonic's cyber corruption isn't completely gone this time, but is instead under control for now. Sage then begins to tell Sonic about one of her unlikely calculations 
revelations that could end up being the one to save everyone from the end. Sage can restore Sonic's friends in their cyberspace forms, allowing them to interact with the world and find the Chaos Emeralds for Sonic, whilst he works on a way to convert his cyber corruption into power so that he could take out the end and save everyone. In order to gain this power, he needs to take part in certain trials. Sage says these trials are gruelling, and man, she isn't wrong. But we'll talk about that later. So far, this premise is immediately better than what we had in the base game. Having Sonic's friends partake in the ending of the game is great, and converting Sonic's cyber corruption into power is exactly what I wanted initially. So far, this is shaping up to be something super cool. Sage then stabilizes Sonic's cyber corruption, which in turn brings Amy, Knuckles, and Tails back into the world, only without their corporeal forms. Sonic explains the plan to the team, and everyone is on board. Amy, Knuckles, and Tails head off to find the Chaos Emeralds, while Sonic splits off to partake in these trials that Sage spoke of. Firstly, we get to play as Amy, which makes sense considering she's the first character we come across on the Starfall Islands way back on Kronos. Amy controls very similarly to Sonic, being able to boost and double jump, however she has a triple jump ability which allows her to jump even higher, and then glide back to the ground using tarot cards? Something I didn't know is that Amy likes fortune telling, and a lot of her recent appearances have this as a core aspect of her character. It seems I'm just not paying much attention to recent Amy Rose lore. Anyway, playing as Amy is actually pretty cool. It's always fun to veer away from playing as Sonic for a while to play as some of Sonic's friends. I like seeing how their abilities are different from Sonic's. Speaking of abilities, each of Sonic's friends have their own skill trees. Amy's skill tree has a few movement options and some combat options too. The abilities she shares with Sonic are Jump, Double Jump, Boost, Homing Attack, Stomp, Psyloop, Parry, and Spin Dash. But she does have plenty of her own abilities such as Card Float, card attack, card spin boost, high card jump, card spin, infinite card spin, Psy Hammer, and Poison Parry. I think it's really cool that Sonic Team gave Sonic's friends their own unique abilities. It really goes a long way to differentiate them from playing as Sonic, and playing around with their new abilities is pretty fun. Amy's movement options are great. Her double jump and card float abilities work so well in tandem. I just found it really satisfying to boost jump, double jump, and then card float to reach faraway platforms and ledges. Amy also has the spin dash and it works exactly the same as Sonic's. This makes Amy's movement even more fun, because you can use the spin dash to ramp off an incline, and then use that height and speed to card float really fast through the air. I'm so glad they decided to let Amy keep most of her momentum when card floating out of a boost jump or spin dash. It feels so satisfying. Amy also has a stomp ability, which is obviously really useful for platforming when you need to reach the ground quickly, but this ability can also be paired with the high card jump ability. In midair, if you hold down the stomp button, Amy will not only stomp to the ground, but she then uses that downwards force to push herself back upwards. Pairing this with her double jump and card float abilities allows you to reach some pretty nice heights. Amy's verticality really is great. One of Amy's most expensive abilities is the card spin boost, which allows her to use her hammer and cards together to make this strange vehicle, in which the cards work as a wheel. Not only does this go super fast, but you can kinda break the physics of it by drifting side to side. Kinda like Sonic's drift ability from Generations that would cause him to go insanely fast, spamming the card spin boost drift has the same kind of effect, and you can just zip across the map at insane speeds. However, you need to have max rings to use this ability. When the DLC first came out, Sonic's friends were incredibly weak, to the point where it was pointless using their combat abilities to fight Guardians because the fights were just so insanely slow and incredibly difficult. However, since the Final Horizon has released, it seems they've updated the damage values that Sonic Friends actually output. And they went from being too weak to being too strong. I can now take out Guardians in as little as two hits while playing as max level Amy, which is just far too much. They completely overcorrected the damage values of Sonic's friends. It's weird, it's like they can't strike a balance between too underpowered or too overpowered. So now it's equally as pointless fighting the Guardians because the fights last all of two seconds. 
The main abilities that are useful for combat with Amy are, of course, the homing attack, the card attack, the card spin, and the poison parry. Homing attack and card attack are used for basic combos, but the true damage comes from using the card spin ability to do damage and parrying with the poison parry, which also adds a damage over time effect to any enemy that's parried by it. Honestly, no idea why Amy applies a poison effect to enemies upon parrying them, but it does help if you want to do combat with Amy. Overall, I think it's really cool we got combat abilities for Sonic's friends, but I just wish they were balanced way better because it went from them being too weak to being too powerful, and it just makes the Guardian fights totally obsolete. Anyway, the goal of Sonic's friends is to find the Chaos Emeralds, so Amy heads to the known locations of the Chaos Emerald vaults scattered across the islands. Upon reaching the vault, Amy realises that the Chaos Emerald isn't here, meaning that they're going to have to use other methods of procuring the emeralds. She consults her tarot cards, which obviously doesn't help, and then she has an idea to seek help from the Coco. We spent a lot of time during the base game helping them, so let's hope they can return the favour. Amy speaks with the Elder and Hermit Coco, and they both tell her that the Coco have hidden the Chaos Emeralds given the looming threat of the end over the islands. But this is the only information they give her. They don't give her a location or even a hint as to where the Chaos Emeralds are, but somehow Amy still knows where to find it. Just magically. Even though the Coco gave us no information, Amy just knows where the Chaos Emerald is so Somehow. Anyway, Amy makes her way in the direction of the Chaos Emerald, and we get to enjoy some good old-fashioned platforming in order to reach it. And I gotta say, platforming as Amy is particularly fun. Given her higher jump height and her ability to glide, we have so much vertical and horizontal control, allowing us to reach higher places and travel to further platforms. There are also these cannons placed around platforming sections in the Final Horizon, which make for some pretty fun platforming gimmicks, as you can use their cannonballs as moving platforms by using the a homing attack on them. It's pretty fun, and quite a creative way of merging an enemy with a tool the player can use to traverse the level. You'll also notice that the platforms we're jumping on are pink. This is to indicate that this is an Amy platforming section. Likewise, Knuckles and Tails platforming sections are red and yellow respectively. This is so you don't try to platform with a character in a place where you're not meant to. It's actually a really good design choice because without it, I know for a fact I'd be trying to traverse a Knuckles platforming section as Amy, then get frustrated when it doesn't work. Upon reaching the top of this fairly simple platforming section, Amy is met with the first of many Chaos Emeralds, but she can't quite get to it just yet because there's a force field surrounding the emerald, and with no way to collect it, she just has to wait there until they can figure a way to free it. At this point we switch to Knuckles, who's also trying to help track down the Chaos Emeralds. I found playing as Knuckles to be a mix of good and bad. Similarly to Amy, Knuckles does share some abilities with Sonic, these being jump, double jump, homing attack, psi loop, boost, spin dash, and parry. But of course, he has a number of his own abilities, such as wall climb, glide, heat stomp, combo attack, psi knuckle, break parry, drill spin attack, drill spin boost, and infinite glide. So I've had to completely redraft this section of the video because they actually made some updates to Knuckles movement which really improves playing as him. When this DLC first came out, Knuckles gliding was incredibly difficult to control. There was a certain input delay with directional movement and it felt like the dreaded Sonic 06 Knuckles glide because it was so difficult to control. If you weren't careful about where you moved the analog stick, Knuckles would often just veer off in his own direction and you would completely fail the platforming section you were trying to engage with. In addition to this, Knuckles' wall climbing was also incredibly janky before. If you were to glide into a climbable wall, normally Knuckles should latch onto that wall automatically because his arms are already outstretched. In the original version of the Final Horizon, you had to stop gliding mid-air and then boost into the wall to be able to climb it, which would often lead you to overshooting, and would often just lead to complete failure of platforming. There was also this long animation that would play whenever you tried to activate Knuckles Glide, in which he would outstretch his arms and then begin gliding, and this really messed up 
stop the flow of platforming because you want the gliding to be as responsive as possible and having this small animation really messes up your flow. However, in the months since the Final Horizon was released, all of these issues have been fixed and Knuckles actually controls really well now. The movement of his gliding is insanely responsive and tight. He now automatically lashes onto walls from gliding and that little animation that would play when activating gliding is completely gone and it feels so much better. From a movement standpoint, Knuckles went from being one of my least favourite characters to play as, to one of the best. He really plays very well. Once you've claimed the infinite glide ability, Knuckles Glide does become a lot more fun. It's less of a glide and more of just outright flight because you don't lose height as you move through the air. This ability can only be activated when you have max rings too, but honestly getting max rings in Sonic Frontiers isn't a challenge because you can just spam Psyloop to get free rings, so you can pretty much use Knuckles Infinite Glide at all times. Of course Knuckles having a spin dash is an incredibly welcome feature, and it actually works really well in tandem with his infinite glide ability. You can use the spin dash to ramp off of hills and slopes, then use the double jump to gain even more height, then finally launch into a glide when you're high in the air. It's actually really fun, and one of the best parts of Knuckles' movement system. Finally, you can upgrade Knuckles' boost ability to the drill spin boost, which can be used while boosting with max rings. This ability turns Knuckles into a big drill, propelling himself forward at high speeds. You can also do damage to enemies with this boost, which is something I really wanted to be integrated into Sonic's boost. This is Knuckles of equivalent to Amy's card spin boost, allowing him to travel at max speed through the world, which is always nice. Initially, Knuckles played really poorly, but after these movement updates, he's definitely my second favourite character to play as in the open world. So what about Knuckles' combat abilities? He is a very combat-centric character after all. Honestly, the combat abilities were there when this DLC first came out. You can use the homing attack, you can use basic combos, you can use his drill spin attack, you can even smash down to the ground and create this huge explosion area of effect attack, which is really cool. But my only issue with Knuckles when this DLC came out is that Sonic's friends did incredibly little damage to any enemies in the open world. But as I mentioned in the Amy section, this has been completely fixed. However, similarly to Amy, Knuckles simply does too much damage, which means certain fights will be over very, very quickly, and you don't actually have an opportunity to use any of his abilities. If they could have struck a balance between the current damage and the previous damage output, it would have been perfect, but they just amplified it too much, and fighting Guardians as Sonic's friends, whilst very doable, is just not very fun because the fights don't last long at all. When playing as Knuckles, your goal is to find these little podiums that have Coco in them, and then you've got to punch them. The game doesn't put an awful lot of emphasis on this, but I think Tails mentions at some point that they're dampening Knuckles' senses to the Chaos Emeralds, so destroying them allows Knuckles to find his Emerald, as he has the natural ability to sense nearby Chaos Emeralds. Whereas Amy needed help from the Coco, Knuckles just needs to destroy these podiums to find them. The game has you partaking in platforming in order to reach these podiums. Now, most of this platforming is fine, and I actually had a good time with it. It feels great to climb on walls and glide from platform to platform. Now of course when I first played this DLC Knuckles had his original movement and it was incredibly janky. Gliding was difficult, latching onto walls was temperamental and it was just an all round not very fun experience. But since the new movement update with Knuckles it actually feels so much better to play and these platforming sections are fine. Nothing groundbreaking by any means but it's certainly nice that Knuckles base mechanics actually work now. There's also this one platforming section in which you need the Psyknuckle ability, and if you don't have it, you cannot complete the section. However, the game doesn't even attempt to tell you that you need a certain ability, so I was trying to figure out what I had to do without even having the means to do it. Yeah, in the end, it was pretty easy to work out what ability I was missing, but the fact that you're not forewarned about needing specific abilities just felt kind of unfair and so I had to go off on a tangent and do some levelling. But how do you level up Sonic's friends in the open world? Fighting Guardians doesn't offer much XP, and there aren't any regular enemies to fight, so how do you actually level up? Well, scattered around Oranos Island are these little XP Coco. Pink ones for Amy, red ones for Knuckles, and yellow ones for Tails. Interacting with these Coco gives you a set amount of skill points to use to purchase abilities from the skill trees. I actually think this was the best way of being able to level up Sonic's friends, because having to grind a ton more content just to unlock their abilities would have felt like such a slog. Just being able to walk up to these Coco and instantly get levels was so convenient, and allows you to get the abilities out of the way so you can mess around with them in the open world. 
world. Some of these cocoa require simple platforming routes to reach, and some of them are on the ground level of the map, which was very helpful. This was particularly useful in my case, because I didn't want to spend too much time away from the main objective. All I had to do was find a couple of these cocoa, and I had the XP I needed to return to platforming. The ability I needed in particular was the Psynuckle ability, which allows you to interact with these purple dig spots that are all over the walls of this platforming route. Once I had the ability, it was just a matter of climbing along the walls using the Psynuckle on the right spots and heading to the top. This actually ended up being a pretty fun platforming section that focuses directly on Knuckles' core abilities, and it worked well. Reaching the top, Knuckles finally finds his Chaos Emerald, but of course with no way of collecting it just now, he has to wait by the Emerald like Amy. This is where we finally switch to Tails, who is also on his own journey to find where the Chaos Emeralds are hiding. Tails is definitely one of the most fun characters to play as, because of course, a lot of his movement is tied to his aerial abilities. Much like Amy and Knuckles, Tails shares some base abilities with Sonic. Jump, double jump, boost, side loop, spin dash, and parry. Although something strange I noticed is that Tails is unable to perform the homing attack, meaning you can't homing attack to spring pads, pulleys, or enemies. You can't interact with some platforming sections in the usual way whilst playing as Tails. You have to get creative with his movement. Tails' unique abilities are fly, cyclone boost, debuff parry, wrench attack, spike stomp, cyclone cannon, charged wrench attack, and side blaster. Fully upgrading Tails' movement abilities makes him pretty overpowered in terms of traversal. His fly ability already allows you to bypass a decent amount of the story's platforming sections, which is just classic Tails, but once you purchase his cyclone boost ability, you can literally fly anywhere in the map you like. The Cyclone Boost, similar to Amy's Card Spin Boost and Knuckles Drill Spin Boost, can only be activated when you have max rings. But as we established, this isn't hard to achieve or maintain thanks to the infinite amount of rings you can get from spamming the Psy Loop. Combining this with the infinite boost Psy Loop, you can fly infinitely, allowing you to reach the max height of the map as Tails, and bypass most platforming sections with the click of a button. This ability alone makes Tails the best character in terms of traversal ability. I don't even care that it's overpowered, it's just so fun to freely fly around in the Cyclone as much as I want. And it was nice to see the Cyclone again, considering it hasn't properly been used in a game since Shadow the Hedgehog back in 2005. But this isn't where Tails' movement capabilities end. The Spin Dash is of course just as fun as ever, and it can be used as a normal ground boost when you have the Cyclone boost active. I really don't recommend using the Cyclone for ground movement. It does have wheels, but it doesn't have the best turning circle, as it was definitely intended to be used for aerial use only, so being able to use the spin dash as an alternate boost when you have cyclone boost active is nice. In terms of combat, after the update that slightly tweaked Sonic Friends damage output, Tails is absolutely broken. Before the update, Tails was incredibly weak and probably did the least damage out of any of the characters because of his wrench attack ability just being so underwhelming. But since the update, Tails is just insane in terms of damage output. His wrench attack locks onto enemies, so all you need to do to defeat Guardians is get close enough to them, and then spam the ability by pressing the attack button. At least with the other characters, you actually have to get in close and do damage physically, but with Tails, you can just spam the wrench attack as fast as you like, and the Guardians will be taken down in seconds. On top of this, you can even use his charge wrench attack ability, which requires even less effort. All you need to do is hold down the attack button and let it go, and that's pretty much it, the fight is over. Of course, I'm happy to see that Tails is now useful for combat, but similarly to what I said before, it's just too much of a buff and it leads to the fights being completely pointless. Like, there's no way I should be able to take a Master Ninja Plus down this fast, it's, it's just ridiculous. So yeah, Tails went from being the weakest character to easily being the most overpowered thanks to a simple tweak in damage numbers. Tails' goal is to find these computer Coco and activate them. Each time Tails interacts with one of these Coco, it brings the group closer to collecting the emeralds. The computer Coco are the ones generating the force field that surrounds the Chaos Emeralds, and deactivating them will allow Amy and Knuckles to collect the emeralds that they're waiting for. To find these computers, you have to complete a variety of platforming sections, and similarly to Knuckles' section I talked about earlier, to complete some of these requires Tails to obtain some abilities from the skill tree. Of course, as I mentioned, the game gives you 
you no indication that you need a specific ability to complete certain sections. You kind of just have to try them and realize halfway through that you're missing an integral ability. Like this platforming section with the balloons for example, it's clear to me now that I needed Tails wrench attack ability to destroy the balloons first, then I could travel through without issue. But I had no idea that I needed this specific ability so I just kept throwing myself at it and actually managed to complete it without the wrench attack, but it was absolutely painful. I think a way to remedy this confusion would be to either have the icon of the ability you need floating next to the platforming section so that you know you need to do some leveling in order to complete it, or have a pop-up appear on screen as you approach the platforming section that tells you which abilities you need in order to complete it. Little things like this would go a long way because getting halfway through platforming and realizing, oh, I need to go back and get an ability and come back isn't a very fun experience in my opinion. A particular issue with the game's platforming I haven't brought up yet is the pop-ins. It's something that was an issue in the base game, but it seems particularly egregious in the Final Horizons DLC. Because the render distance of the platforms is so low, you need to be incredibly close for them to appear for you in-game. This was particularly bad in Knuckles and Tails' platforming sections, in which you use flight abilities to cross large gaps between platforms. Sometimes you have to just straight up guess which direction the platforms are in, which ends up just being frustrating. You'd think the developers would have at least playtested this and realised how much the render distance disrupts the game's platforming, but no. This is the final product that someone thought was acceptable. Yeah, it's not great. Anyway, Tails activates his final Coco computer, and Amy and Knuckles are able to collect their respective emeralds. But that still leaves Tails to collect his emeralds. This leads to some more platforming that I'm not going to go into too much detail about, because Tails' platforming sections can mostly be bypassed thanks to his flight ability. Like, you can straight up just fly over most of the intended routes and just head straight for the emerald. Which was great, because at this point I was pretty much ready to switch characters again. Finally, Tails activates yet another Coco computer and frees his Chaos Emerald, meaning the gang have altogether collected three of the seven Chaos Emeralds for Sonic. With three emeralds secured, the game has a switch back to Sonic. And oh boy, Sonic's section in this DLC is an absolute mess. After collecting the third Chaos Emerald as Tails, the scene cuts to Sage and Sonic. Sage tells Sonic that he needs to scale the four towers of the Masters on Oranos Island. Yes, Oranos Island now has towers similar to Rhea Island, but these are a little more important because they are memorials to the pilots of the four titans that gave their lives to save the world. Unlocking the towers, ascending them, and completing the trials waiting at the top is the key to gaining control over Sonic's cyber corruption. With that, I think it's time we get to work. I gotta say, it's nice to return to Sonic after playing as Amy, Knuckles, and Tails for a few hours. It makes you realize just how well Sonic plays in Frontiers, especially after the new updates. Anyway, the towers themselves have to be unlocked first before you can scale them, which requires Sonic to find Lookout Coco. Finding Lookout Coco is thankfully very easy. All you have to do is run around looking for dig spots. Once you find a dig spot, just use the Psy Loop to interact with it, and there's a very high chance you'll get a Lookout Coco. I'm pretty sure each tower only requires about 4 or 5 Lookout Coco before it unlocks, so this part is actually quite simple. I don't really see much of a point in the Lookout Coco being required to unlock the towers, but I'd imagine it was an attempt to encourage players to explore this new version of Oranos Island before going straight for the main story. For me, it just felt like random padding for no reason. Why have the towers locked off in the first place? Either way, the Lookout Coco aren't hard to find, and it doesn't take long, so it didn't bother me all that much. After collecting enough Lookout Coco, one of the towers will open up, allowing you to begin scaling it in order to reach the first trial. Now, the towers themselves are quite hit or miss, with some having what I think is unfair platforming, and some having fun platforming. Like Rare Islands Towers, you have to partake in extensive and high-risk platforming in order to reach the top. And I'm not against this. As I said earlier, I loved reaching the top of the towers on Rare Island. They were a ton of fun. However, some of the towers on Oranus Island feel a little unfair sometimes. Like, for example, this part where you have to loop around these two dash panels to spawn a bounce pad. This was such an unneeded 
needed and tedious thing to have players do. It's just not very fun, especially when you realise the platform is slightly sloped, which messes with Sonic's movement, especially if you have his deceleration speed turned down. I literally only got past this section by accident. It just felt so cheap. Another part of this tower that felt janky was the overabundance of sloped platforms. It doesn't feel fun to platform on these slopes, as you have to take it insanely slow, and the physics really are working against you here. If you boost at all, you just go flying straight off the edge. But if you're too slow, Sonic will begin to slide down some of these platforms, and you have to just hopelessly jump to the next one and hope that you don't fall off the edge. I don't know, I just feel like I had such a lack of control over Sonic during a lot of this tower, and I found it wasn't particularly fun or rewarding reaching the top. I just felt like I'd overcome the game's jank, and not a challenging platforming section. Another section I felt was pretty bad was halfway through the second tower. The platforming up until this section was fair but challenging, and I actually enjoyed it. But once you reach this certain point, there are these explosive boxes that blow up when you get too close to them. There's normally a timer before they blow up that allows you to get away from them if you're fast enough with your platforming, but the first set of boxes blew up instantly and I didn't even have a timer which was great. I was punished for simply taking the intended route to the top of the tower. Then once I got to the next set of explosive boxes, I choked and failed the platforming, which was totally my fault for not being fast enough. However, when you try to get back to where you were, the pink walls that you'd normally use to homing attack your way to the next section are gone, so you have to just sheepishly walk along these very thin platforms to get back to where you were. I feel as if these walls should have respawned when I failed and fell, but they didn't, which felt massively unfair fair, especially considering the balloons that you can use for platforming always respawn if you fail a platforming section, because they're required for you to platform effectively. I just can't imagine that this was the way developers intended you to play this section if you failed the platforming once. I also think the explosive boxes should have had a slightly longer timer. When playing this for the first time, you need a little bit of time to analyse the route you need to take to get past the explosives, but you don't really have much time to think at all, which just ends up with you getting blown up. Now, now this may actually just be a skill issue and I just suck at the game, but I felt as if the timing was very harsh. However, that doesn't mean that I had an issue with every tower in this DLC. I think this tower with the climbable walls was actually really fun. The wall running mechanic as Sonic does work pretty well, and you're given plenty of space on these walls to run around, which allows for a decent amount of speed and maneuverability. There's also pink walls that you can homing attack to reach higher places, and to reveal more walls to walk along. I found it really engaging. I just had a ton of fun running and jumping from wall to wall, slowly scaling my way up the tower with each satisfying movement. This is a prime example of what these towers should be. Fun and satisfying without being too easy to the point where there's no risk involved at all. This tower in particular really plays into Sonic's strengths, and I was almost disappointed when I reached the top and realised there was no platforming left. I had a lot of fun with it. I also really enjoyed the fourth tower, even though it was quite challenging and I failed it many times. This tower has a focus on rails and fans, which I found to be an interesting combo. Instead of using bounce pads to boost you upwards, you have to platform using fans, which is very difficult. But I never felt like it wasn't my fault when I failed. I knew I just had to be more accurate with my movement. I particularly really like the section where you have to grind along these circular rails and then boost jump off to reach the next one. The movement is just so satisfying, slingshotting yourself off of one rail to the next. My one issue with this tower, however, was when you get to this circle of fans. For some reason, the rainbow ring at the end of the rail just doesn't boost you up high enough to reach the fans. I still don't know how I got the fans to work. I just kept falling back down to the rainbow ring, getting boosted back up, and double jumping, and it eventually worked. But I still have no idea how I did it. I think maybe it had something to do with how long I held the jump button, but I'm not quite sure. To end off this tower, you're rewarded with this nice long winding rail, with a rainbow ring at the end of it which boosts you up to reach the top. This tower was definitely challenging, but it's got lots of satisfying movement, and a fair challenge that doesn't feel like you're being punished for nothing, which I think is brilliant. So what exactly is waiting for us at the top of each tower? A trial from the ancients themselves, and I gotta say, these trials are a bit jarring to say the least. First we have the dragon's trial at the top of the first tower. This trial sounds very simple at first, you just have to take out 5 Oranos soldier type enemies, but you soon realise that these enemies have been buffed a ton. Their overall speed has been increased, meaning they get attacks off much quicker and attack more frequently, and their health has been increased, meaning it takes you a long time to take out even one of them. 
Given the fact that there's five of them, they all attack you at once, which just leads to the fight feeling like a bit of a clusterfuck. You can't directly homing attack them because they have shields, so you have to siloop them in order to break their guard. This is easier said than done, because their area of effect attacks often stop you in their tracks, leading to a cycle of you trying to siloop, getting hit by the spikes, and then trying to recover and siloop again, only to be hit by the same attack from another enemy. I get the ramped up health for this trial, it actually makes sense considering most people will have Sonic leveled up to the max by this point in the game, but man the increase to the enemy speed is what makes this fight pretty jarring. But overall, I really didn't mind this one too much. It's challenging, yeah, and sometimes feels unfair, but it's very obviously doable, especially in the generous amount of time you're given to complete it. Next we have the Snakes Trial, and this is the one that baffles most people. In this trial, Sonic's stats are fixed, and the Psyloop is the only available ability for him to use. You have to defeat four shell enemies in the given time limit, which seems incredibly simple considering all you have to do is siloop them and do damage. However, given the enemies increase speed, once you get their shell off, the window to do damage is incredibly small, meaning you only have what feels like a second to get a small combo off before the shell is back on and you have to siloop again. You also don't have any of Sonic's combat abilities bar the homing attack and regular combo, so you can't activate an ability to do more damage, you just have to work with what you've got. You also only get 2 minutes to complete this trial, which leaves you with 30 seconds to defeat each enemy, which a lot of people feel isn't enough time at all. Of course, it is enough time, but it does feel incredibly tight, and you have to play perfectly in order to beat this one. The best way I found of completing this was by silooping an enemy, creating a small bit of distance while the siloop animation happens, and then immediately homing attacking as the shell is about to fly up, then getting off a small combo to do the most damage possible in the small amount of time before the shell lands. Timing is key when attacking these enemies, because the shell falls back down so quickly, you need to make sure you're up in the enemy's face doing damage as soon as it flies up, but you can't homing attack too quickly because then you risk hitting the shell before it's fully off the enemy, which stops your combo in its tracks. I found this one particularly frustrating, and even though it's a simple concept, it took me about 15 minutes of straight playing to get this one right. In the end, my siloops were accurate, my attack timing was close to perfect, and I still only managed to finish with 4 seconds to spare. This one in particular just feels like it wasn't playtested, and I've read a lot of people that had to turn their difficulty down to easy just to stand a chance of beating this one. I feel like an extra 10 or 15 seconds would have turned this from throwing yourself at the trial over and over and over again, to a fun challenge that tests your ability to time attacks. This trial is definitely the worst one by far, it just feels really unbalanced. Balanced. Next up is the Tiger's Trial, which is actually pretty easy. This one has you fighting the wolf enemy, which I don't think I've talked about at all in this video. When fighting wolves, they will surround you and begin circling you. Each wolf will jump out of the circle to attack you, and you have to parry them to stun them. Once you've parried all wolves, you can then do damage. It's pretty simple. The only difference this trial adds to the fight is that the wolves' movement speed has been increased by a lot, meaning you have less time to react and parry. But given the fact that Sonic Frontier's parry mechanic just requires you to hold both bumpers, this isn't hard at all. Just hold the parry buttons, and as soon as you parry one wolf, press them again to parry the next, and keep doing this until all wolves are stunned. The wolves have slightly more health in this fight, and they recover from being stunned much quicker than the ones in the open worlds, but honestly, this trial is so easy, especially because you're given 5 minutes to complete it. There's no way I need 5 minutes to beat these enemies. I managed to finish this one in 41 seconds, ending with 4 minutes and 19 seconds left. The disparity between the amount of time you're given for this trial when compared to the snakes trial is insane. Why did they give me 2 minutes to complete something that pretty much takes 2 minutes to complete when playing almost perfectly, but give me 5 minutes to complete something that can easily be done in 41 seconds? seconds. It just doesn't make sense at all. The Tiger's Trial is just a complete write-off in my opinion, because it's too easy, which is strange considering I thought the last one was a bit too hard. Again, did the devs actually test the difficulty of these trials before the DLC was released, or did the higher-ups just not care about making them a fair challenge? 
It just seems really odd to me. Finally, we have the Cranes Trial. In this fight, we have to take on a buffed up ninja. Similar to the other enemies in these trials, this ninja has increased health and massively increased speed, meaning it's a little bit more tricky to parry its attacks, and you have to output more damage in order to take it out quickly. Ninja's attacks are insanely fast, but the key to this fight is parrying constantly, and if you're quick enough, you can follow up with a riposte that will do lots of damage. If you can get a quick Psy loop off, then even better, as it stuns the ninja momentarily, allowing you to perform a combat ability to get some more damage in. But overall, parrying is your best best friend in this fight. I actually did this one first try, and didn't even take a hit whilst doing it. But even if I did mess up some of my parries, it wouldn't have mattered, because you literally get 10 minutes to do this fight. I just don't understand. Who came up with the time limits for these fights? The first two had relatively strict time constraints to finish the trial. I mean, 3 minutes to take out 5 amped up enemies, and 2 minutes to take out 4 amped up shells were both a challenge. But 10 whole minutes to take out a single ninja that's not even that hard in the first place is a little bit ridiculous. Even with the combat trials being pretty jarring in terms of their disparity of difficulty, they do offer some story before and after each trial. When you reach the top of each tower, interacting with the Coco on top actually allows Sonic to speak with the four pilots that saved the world from the end's wrath using the titans. At first, each of them berates Sonic for freeing the end, but after the trials, they see that Sonic is only trying to protect the world and save his friends like they once did. They admire his determination and power, and each of them bestow upon him their blessing, which Sage can use to stabilise his cyber corruption. Something interesting about these conversations is that we interact with the Coco in order to speak with each of these ancients. This means that these Coco once belonged to the four pilots, and we are able to use the data and memories that are stored within them in order to speak to a digitally recreated version of the ancients that gave their lives for the world. It's a little insight into the cyberspace in action, which I thought was cool. Even though these pilots have been dead for thousands of years, Sonic is still able to transcend time to speak with them. It really shows the power of the cyberspace and how advanced the ancients really were. After completing the trials, Sonic's cyber corruption has been stabilised, and he will be able to use the ancients' blessing to unlock a new power, but we'll talk about that later. The scene then cuts to Amy, Knuckles and Tails. Tails proclaims that the end is corrupting everything on the island, even the Coco. Knuckles goes off to weaken the end's hold on the emeralds, and Tails goes to work on breaking the emeralds free from their containment, whilst Amy works on helping out the Coco. Now we return to Amy, Knuckles and Tails, as we collect the next three Chaos Emeralds. I'm not going to go into as much detail as I did before, because this second act of playing as Sonic's friends consists pretty much of the same platforming, upgrading abilities, punching Coco and hacking computers as before. So let's go through this quickly, shall we? Amy, Knuckles and Tails all complete their tasks and find the altars holding the Emeralds. But once they get close to the Emeralds, they each begin to suffer from an advanced state of cyber corruption, allowing them to feel what Sonic has been been putting up with for the entire game. However, they need to tough it out if they want to secure the emeralds for him. They're taking on some of the burden that Sonic endured for them, which is quite a nice sentiment, but realistically all they need to do is stand there next to the emeralds and wait for everyone to be in position. Then they can finally collect them. Finally, once Tails activates the last Coco computer, everyone is able to collect their emeralds, meaning the team now has 6 emeralds out of 7, allowing us to return to Sonic once more. But before we return to Sonic, I just want to give some thoughts on playing as Amy, Knuckles and Tails in this DLC. I'm all for allowing you to play as Sonic's friend in Sonic games. I think it's always a great option to be able to steer away from Sonic for a while to experience a different playstyle. But honestly, I was mostly disappointed with how this turned out in the end. The initial janky mechanics, the platformers popping in and out, the lack of indication that you need to upgrade your abilities to partake in certain platforming sections, the unbalanced combat, it all just feels so botched. Yeah, Amy plays really well with her increased verticality when platforming, Knuckles' fixed glide mechanic is very fun, and it's even better when paired with the spin dash, and Tails Cyclone Boost offers some of the best and most free maneuverability in this game. But overall, I found myself just kind of bored when playing as Sonic's friends, mainly because the objectives we have to complete just aren't that fun. When I had to play as all three of them again and perform the same menial tasks to collect three more emeralds, I was pretty much over the idea of playing as any of them and just wanted to get back to Sonic. Maybe if Act 2 of Amy, Knuckles and Tails gameplay had you doing something a little bit different, then it would have been more interesting, but having to do the exact same tasks you were doing when collecting the first three emeralds is insanely boring, and I ended up just rushing through everything to get back to Sonic. Not to mention that you're stuck 
work on Oranos Island for this entire DLC. Maybe if we were able to explore some of the other islands as Sonic's friends, this would have been a little bit more interesting. Just right into the story that the Coco have hidden the remaining emeralds across the islands, and you have to visit Kronos, Ares, and Chaos in order to collect them. At least then there would have been some variety. I, I don't know. Something about wandering around Oranos Island, partaking in mostly mediocre platforming with not really much else to do, is really underwhelming. I actually enjoyed playing as Sonic's friends at first, but after the second time you get to play as them, I was pretty much done by this point, and was happy to return to Sonic. Upon spawning back into the open world of Sonic, nothing happens. There's no marker on the map, and not even a cutscene telling you what to do. You actually have to collect more Lookout Coco in order to unlock the final trial, which of course requires scaling another tower. After collecting the Lookout Coco, you can head to the final tower, which actually isn't bad. I actually had a great time with this one. The platforming is fun and challenging, but isn't unfair. I think it plays really well. The platforms themselves are pretty big, so it's safe enough to do boost jumps, and there's also moving platforms, so you're not just boosting everywhere. You actually have to think about your movements a little bit more. There's lots of these pink crates too, and taking the time to homing attack them usually reveals a bounce pad that will take you even higher, rewarding the player for interacting with destroyable objects. There's also plenty of enemies on this tower too, like buzzers which can be homing attacked to reach higher platforms, spinners that serve as a hazard during platforming and speed sections, and those cannons from earlier which add a nice layer of danger, whilst also allowing you to homing attack their projectiles to reach other platforms. There's also these really nice speed sections, one where you have this long straight with dash panels and cannons shooting directly at you, forcing you to jump over their projectiles, and another on this winding path with spinners positioned so you have to jump over or go under them to reach the end. It's just a really well designed platforming gauntlet, and I had a ton of fun navigating this one. It pretty much has everything I'd want it to. I just think some of the earlier towers tried too hard to be challenging that they ended up asking too much of the player at certain points. And these last three towers have been lots of fun, with a balanced challenge that feels rewarding to complete. So upon reaching the top, we are met by the Master King Coco, a particularly interesting character. This big guy is the former leader of the ancient civilization, meaning he holds the key to the power that Sonic wants to unlock using the blessing of the ancients he received from the previous trials. He was the one that ordered the evacuation of the ancients' homeworld when the end attacked, he oversaw the colonization of the Starfall Islands when they arrived on Earth, he directed the installation of the cyberspace, and he ordered the construction of the Titans. So he was pretty important to the ancient civilization. Sonic is for some reason super rude to this guy. After stating his importance in the ancient civilization, Sonic calls him a rock in a chair, which is just so uncalled for. Bro's pouring his heart out talking about his former position in his fallen civilization, and Sonic takes the opportunity to roast him for becoming a Coco. I do kind of wish Sonic took this moment a little more seriously even if his unprovoked attack on this man is actually quite funny. The Master King Coco calls Sonic forward, and we can finally begin his trial. So what exactly is the Master King Coco's trial? The goal is simple, complete all three Titan boss battles back to back with no breaks, with only 400 rings to spread across each boss battle, meaning you only have pretty much 400 seconds to defeat all three bosses because Sonic loses one ring per second in super form. If that doesn't sound hard enough, perfect parry is the only way to parry these bosses' attacks, so you have to time your parries with enemy attacks now instead of just holding down the parry buttons. Basically, you have to play these bosses pretty much 100% perfectly without missing any parries and making the most of the damage you deal. When I say this is hard, I mean it's hard. I really had a tough time with this trial, mainly because of the incredibly strict ring capacity of 400, and if you take hits during the boss, this number will only decrease more rapidly. Of course, with the experience of the base game's bosses as well as the battle rush mode under my belt, I felt prepared for this ultimate challenge. The boss's moveset are the exact same as they normally are, so the game doesn't throw a curveball at you like that. But man was the perfect parry hard to get used to, considering we've been using the normal parry for the entire game. But eventually, I learned the attack patterns of Giganto, Wyvern, and Knight, and was able to reliably parry their attacks and retaliations perfectly. It felt really good to learn their movesets like this. 
The hardest one for me was Wyvern, mainly because you have to perfect parry the rockets it shoots at you, and sometimes it can be quite hard to tell which rocket is closest to you. On top of that, Wyvern's attacks are very fast, and it can be hard to time your parries right. If you don't hit your parries on this boss, you can basically kiss completion of this trial goodbye. You may as well just restart. But eventually, I was able to respond perfectly to all its attacks, and it felt great. Even though it was insanely hard, I really enjoyed the Master King Coco's trial. It's always fun to play these bosses, and I don't think I'll ever pass up an opportunity to play as Supersonic in this game. It really pushes your skills to their limits, and I had a great time taking on these bosses one last time before the true end of the game. After the trial, the Master King Coco bestows Sonic with the ancient power he's been working towards this whole time. He tells Sonic he must be careful with this power, due to its fragile nature. If the power is used recklessly, it will leave Sonic entirely. The Master King Coco has done all he can for his people by giving Sonic this power. The rest he entrusts to Sonic, to finally rid the world of the end once and for all. And with that, Sonic takes his leave. Now, before we get into the final fight, we get one last chance to explore Oranos Island and do any optional content before facing the end. So I thought this was the perfect opportunity to talk about the Final Horizon side content before ending the game. So let's get into it, shall we? One last critique of this game's side content before the big final showdown. Challenges make a comeback in Sonic Frontiers The Final Horizon, and like lots of things in this game, they're a mix of good and bad. I will say the challenges are a lot more challenging this time around with harder objectives. The challenges in the base game felt really underwhelming, and a lot of them in The Final Horizon do feel like open world padding, but some of them are genuinely challenging and fun. The challenges where you have to kick the ball through hoops have more hoops and tighter time constraints. The platforming challenges are trickier, with faster moving platforms and longer routes to take. The horizontal button challenges have more buttons to press and the timer is much shorter, meaning you have to be much quicker. The laser jump challenges are faster and longer, leaving less room for error. And the time trial challenges are much more exhilarating and fun thanks to more focus on platforming and much more ambitious goal placement. There's even a bigger focus on puzzle solving for some of these challenges, like this one where you have to position the mirrors correctly so the laser beam is angled in the right direction, or this one where you have to face statues in the right way in order to spawn platforms that allow you to collect this glowing orb. There's also this one which you have to interact with all sorts of aspects of the environment around you in order to activate five nodes, such as side looping these flames, climbing to the top of this tower and collecting the orb, and homing attacking these objects. Once all of the nodes are glowing, you've completed the challenge. It's nice to see enjoyable challenge that either focus on speed, accuracy, or puzzle solving. But my favourite challenge by far in this DLC is one of the speed trials that tests how fast you can reach a button. Only this time, there are four buttons instead of one and they're all scattered around the map. You have to race across to different corners of the map as quick as possible in order to step on each button. Then you've got to race back to the challenge's starting location in order to finish the challenge. This is without a doubt my favourite challenge in the entire game, and I wish all islands had one like this. Just racing across the map as quick as possible to complete it in the given time frame was really fun. Honestly, this would have been a really cool idea for a new challenge mode like the Action Chain or Open Zone Coco challenges. Just one focused entirely on speed and how quickly you can traverse from one side of the map to the other. I think that would have been great. But that's not to say all challenges are amazing. There are still challenges dedicated to stepping on three buttons, the Tetris block puzzles, and side looping a random strip of light a few times, but honestly, I'm not even going to focus on those, because the vast majority of challenges in the Final Horizon are a major step up from the challenges in the base game, which was really nice to see. It's great that Sonic Team took the criticism and feedback they got on the base game and immediately applied it to the Final Horizon. It demonstrates that the devs of Sonic Team are learning what works and what doesn't and listening to fan feedback. Of course, completing challenges reveals more of the map to the player, but this isn't the only method of revealing the map. In the Final Horizon, you can find these map cocos scattered across Oranos Island. There are pink ones for Amy, red ones for Knuckles, and yellow ones for Tails. In order to reach most of these map coco, you have to complete a simple platforming section to reach it. I quite like these, as they give you something different to do other than interact with challenges to unlock the map. If anything, it's an excuse to play as Sonic's friends and play around with their movement abilities, which I personally had a bit of fun with.
Remember the Starfall event from the base game? Well, it's back again in the Final Horizon, but it's been altered slightly. Due to there being no Big the Cat fishing minigame in the DLC, yeah I know, I was devastated too, there isn't any need for purple coins this time around. So instead of keeping the Starfall event the same, they opted to remove the slot machine altogether. Now, instead of there being Starfall fragments at the base of every beam of light, there is one of three items a cocoa, a seed of defense, or a seed of power. Now this may seem pretty useless at first because Sonic has all of his abilities upgraded to max by this point in the game, but these Starfall events are incredibly useful for leveling Amy, Knuckles, and Tails stats. Pretty much all you need to do as each character is wait for a Starfall event, then go crazy collecting as many cocoa and seeds as you can. After picking up an item, you'll see that in the top left corner of the screen, the number of the item you picked up will begin to increase exponentially. So the goal is to just just keep picking up item after item to keep those numbers going up. At the end of each Starfall event, you should have hundreds of upgrade seeds and thousands of cocoa, and if you're playing as Amy, Knuckles, or Tails, you can immediately take these upgrade materials to the Elder and Hermit Coco to max out your stats on all three characters. The Starfall event in the Final Horizon is very useful, and I'm glad they decided to change the mechanics of this to making leveling up Sonic's friends' base stats much easier. It really saves you a lot of time. I can't imagine how boring it would have been running around the world manually collecting cocoa and upgrade seeds. In the Final Horizon DLC, the Guardians on Oranos Island have been reworked, some of them quite significantly. In the base game, Oranos Island had Red Pillar, Caterpillar, Kunoichi, Ghost, Master Ninja, and Silver Hammer. However, this new Oranos Island in the DLC has a reworked version of Caterpillar, New Ghost Encounters, Tank Plus, Spider Plus, Master Ninja Plus, and a stronger version of Silver Hammer. It's nice to see some of the Guardians get entire reworks, and others being made more difficult to fit the harder nature of this expansion. A lot of the new Ghost fights are a lot of fun, especially this one where you have to find your way through this maze in order to reach the totem to siloop them. I thought this one was really fun. I really quite like the focus on platforming that the ghost bosses offer. It's a nice little change from the combat oriented mini bosses. I also enjoyed this ghost mini boss with the floating cubes. The urgency of platforming whilst the boss is trying to take your rings felt very hectic and it was very rewarding to reach the next totem and do some damage. I think the ghost bosses are really creative and it was a cool way to mix a boss battle with platforming. The Caterpillar boss has also been reworked, no longer requiring you to grind on rails in order to fight it like in the base game. The Final Horizon version of Caterpillar will begin running around in circles shooting all sorts of projectiles at Sonic. The goal is to dodge these projectiles and get as many hits on the weak spot on the back of the Caterpillar as quickly as possible. However, when doing damage to the boss you have to be careful not to get greedy with damage, because the Caterpillar will shoot projectiles at you mid-combo if you linger behind it for too long. The goal is to do damage during the window where Caterpillar isn't shooting, then get out of there as it winds up to do its attacks. This version of Caterpillar is so much better than the base games one, it feels like an actual boss with attack patterns which is great to see. Tank Plus is also so much better than its original counterpart in the base game. The original tank would boost Sonic up into the air, and most of the fight would be spent on this whirlwind, requiring Sonic to dodge the tank's attacks in mid-air, then attack when it's open. This new Tank Plus fight cuts out the whirlwind part entirely and just gets straight down to business. Similarly to Caterpillar, Tank Plus shoots out these orb-like projectiles that Sonic must dodge, but instead of running around the boss arena shooting orbs behind it, Tank Plus is much more aggressive and will also shoot fast projectiles that track Sonic, forcing you to run circles around the boss until it's open to more attacks. A particular move Tank Plus has that I thought was really cool was the huge laser beam it shoots at you. The only way to escape this move is to run for your life pretty much, as the laser beam is incredibly fast and you can only just barely outrun it. To do damage to Tank Plus I found it really useful to use the quick siloop ability as this will stun the boss allowing you to string together a few combos before it recovers. This fight compared to the original tank is night and day. I'd always run past the base game tank because I found the fight boring, but this new version is actually really engaging and I had a fun time taking it on. One of my favourite bosses in the Final Horizon is the Spider Plus boss. This boss requires you to siloop these mines that the spider throws out. Using the siloop on the mines shoots them back at the spider, which will weaken its shield. Once you've done this enough times, the spider will be stunned, allowing you to come in and deal some damage. 
The spider is also able to shoot lasers and projectiles, so you have to be careful with positioning when you're trying to slow loop the mines. If you stay still for too long or move too slowly, the projectiles will hit you, so you have to be in a constant state of motion in order to avoid damage. Some of the other bosses like Caterpillar or Tank Plus have very aggressive attack patterns and can sometimes feel like complete attack spam, but the spider is much more manageable and I found it more fun for that reason. You can get some really nice combos off when the spider is stunned, stringing together all all sorts of moves to maximize damage. I also really like its new design too. The white color scheme looks great when compared to the red one we got on Chaos Island in the base game, so that's definitely a plus too. I had a good time fighting Spider Plus overall. I think it's a big improvement on the original fight, which had more of a focus on this sort of skydiving section instead of actually fighting the boss itself. It seems the DLC, a lot of the bosses that had gimmicky fights, have been stripped back a bit, making way for more combat oriented fights. Master Ninja is back in this DLC in the form of Master Ninja Plus, and I gotta say this fight is just as fun as ever, only this time Master Ninja has increased speed and a much higher health pool, which is exactly what I wanted. My main issue with the Master Ninja fight in the base game is that the fights ended too quickly because Sonic did too much damage, but with this new health pool the fights last much longer, leading to a more engaging experience overall. The key to beating Master Ninja Plus, much like the original variant, is to parry its quick slash attacks and then follow up with a riposte move when you can. While it's stunned from the counter you can then follow up with more attacks. I recommend using your quick side loop on it as soon as possible to stun it further, which will allow you to get off even more attacks. Given its faster movement speed, the Master Ninja Plus will recover from your attacks much quicker, so it's important to make sure you get off as many attacks in as quick a time as possible so as to not give it the opportunity to recover. A new move that the Master Ninja does in this fight is to spawn a single clone of itself that attacks you alongside the original. I thought this was pretty cool and adds a higher level of speed to the fight as you're trying to parry two enemies at once. Parrying them both successfully would allow you to do damage to the original one. Once you get Master Ninja's health down low enough, it will perform the ability where it spawns four clones of itself, which all attack you in quick succession. Now I like this move, I think it looks cool but I really wish the game didn't go into slow motion after you parry each of the clone's attacks. It just slows the fight down too much. There's not really much point in having this move in the first place if the game goes into super slow motion whenever you parry. It just makes it too easy. I think it would have been better if the four clones attacks can be parried, but the game stays at normal speed to make parrying all of them a bit more challenging. Then when the final one attacks you, parrying that one will activate slow-mo. This move in its current state just messes with the pacing of the fight, which a shame. Overall though, I thought Master Ninja Plus was a solid fight filled with fast paced action, and I'm glad they kept this one on Oranos Island. Lastly we have the Silver Hammer reworked fight. This one is probably the one that's been changed the least. The only noticeable differences between the new Silver Hammer and the old one is that it's much taller than before, moves much more quickly, and has a much higher health pool. I actually prefer the newer version though, mainly because the fights last much longer and are generally more difficult. You have to slowly whittle down its height by destroying the layers of the tower, which before could be destroyed incredibly easily with Sonic's cross slash ability. Once you've cut the tower down to size, you can then begin attacking its head by stringing combos together. That's pretty much it. It's definitely the boss that stands out the least to me when compared to all these other reworked fights, but it's definitely improvement on the original. Overall, I'd say these fights are better than their original counterparts. My only issue with them is that I think their bump in health was a bit too drastic. Yeah, I wanted bosses in the base game to have higher health pools, but this is a bit too much. It leads to some fights taking like 5 minutes to complete. I think if they found a nice middle ground between the original boss health and what we have now, it'd be perfect. I like the idea of a higher health pool because it allows you to use some of Sonic's stronger abilities, and you can reliably proc Phantom Rush and actually use it on the bosses without them dying instantly. But this level of health is just too much. Most of the time I'd be sitting there spamming the Phantom Rush combo over and over and over again and the bosses barely even flinch, which gets old pretty quickly as you're literally just rapidly pressing the attack button. If the bosses had slightly less health than they do now, they would feel pretty nicely balanced in my opinion. Even though I didn't enjoy everything they had to offer, I did have a fun time fighting them.
I was pretty happy to hear that the Final Horizon was going to include new cyberspace stages. I had a really fun time with the ones in the base game, and I was excited to see what Sonic Team had cooked up this time. And I wasn't disappointed. There are 9 new cyberspace stages in the DLC, and I gotta say they're a ton of fun. With brilliant movement, multiple pathways, fun level design, and reasons to explore and replay each stage. Some of these cyberspace stages include gimmick features that change the way you interact with the level. These gimmicks include rocket boost canisters, racing against an AI, a bomb that blows up if the timer runs out, speed increasing gears as you boost continually, mines that blow you up and boost you into the air when you walk over them, and low gravity. Now some of these gimmicks sound like a hindrance at first, but most of them can be ignored entirely, or are actually fun. For example, the stage that has Sonic carrying a bomb with a timer isn't as annoying as it sounds. You can collect extra time in the form of these little stopwatches that are scattered around the stage, and if you're speedrunning the stage and using skips, you don't even need to worry about the bomb, as you'll finish the stage before it goes off anyway. Similarly, in the stage with the mines, it's pretty hard to actually run into them when trying to avoid them, and one of them actually boosts you up to an advantageous position, so you can either ignore them completely or use them to your advantage. The AI race as well as the stage with the speed gears also don't really matter. If you're planning on going for a fast time, neither of these gimmicks holds you back which is great. They still allow you to focus on speed and emphasise playing well to beat the stage as quick as possible. Although one problem I have with the speed gears stage is that Sonic feels uncharacteristically slidey, even with deceleration turned all the way down. This was pretty annoying, but if you run and platform more carefully, you'll be fine. Of all the gimmicks though, I had the most fun with the rocket boost and the low gravity stages. Rocket boost allows you to destroy enemies whilst boosting, which is something that you can't do in the base game which was fun to play around with, and low gravity is pretty self explanatory. It allows you to perform massive jumps and level skips by spin dashing and boost jumping, which is really fun to go soaring through the air as you race through the level. When I heard that the stages had gimmicks in them, I was worried that the stages would focus on them too much, and that speed and precise movement would take a back seat, but man was I wrong. I actually thought they spiced up the stages a little bit, differentiating them from the cyberspace stages in the base game. It's cool to see Sonic Team experiment with ideas and actually get them right, considering execution hasn't been their strong suit before when trying to incorporate some out of the box ideas into their previous games. Similarly to the base game cyberspace stages requiring you to collect red star rings or to finish the stage with a certain amount of rings, these new stages have new missions to complete. There are four new objectives to complete. Rescuing animals, collecting silver moon rings, collecting numbered rings, and reaching the hidden goal. Rescuing the animals is pretty simple. Find the animal in the stage, pick it up, and take it to the blue goal which is usually quite close to where you found the animal. Anyway, saving the animals was probably my least favourite of the missions. When you pick up the animal, Sonic is extremely slow, and the platforming isn't all that interesting. Although I do appreciate the encouragement to explore the stages in order to find hidden secrets and take alternate routes. I had fun collecting the animals because it forces you to veer off of the most obvious course, and allows you to see the stage from a completely different angle which was cool. It's it's just a shame that taking the animals from A to B isn't very fun. I feel as if it would have been better if the animals were still scattered around the stages like they already are, but instead of having to pick them up in your hands, you have to reach them via a platforming or speed section that veers off to the main course of the level. I think it would have been cool to have the animal trapped in a special kind of enemy which, when destroyed, puts the animal in your inventory, then taking them to the end of the level rescues them. I just think this would have been a little bit more exciting than having to physically pick them up and take them to a location. The silver moon rings were a ton of fun to collect in my opinion, they're almost a sort of speed challenge within the stages themselves, testing your ability to collect items whilst maintaining constant speed or accurate platforming. Collecting the first silver moon ring in a chain starts a timer, and you must collect all five within the time limit. Once the time is up, all the remaining rings disappear and you must restart the stage to get another chance at collecting them. Even though some of these were really hard to get, I thought they were fun. They really test your abilities to remain focused when under pressure, because you only get one shot at collecting all of them, otherwise you have to restart. After a few times of trying to collect all of them and failing multiple times, it really starts to get to you, and you start playing sloppier, desperately trying to make up for past failed attempts. The key to reliably collecting them is to remain focused, and to not underestimate the time you have to collect them. You actually get much more than enough time to collect them if you play carefully, but trying to rush it normally ends in failure. 
Celia. And considering no timer pops upon the screen when you're collecting the rings, you just have to guess how long you have, and most of the time you'll assume you have less time than you actually do. I had a fun time overcoming this challenge, and I found it really satisfying successfully collecting all rings across the stages. Numbered rings are kind of similar in concept to silver moon rings, only you don't have to collect these in a set time limit. Instead, the numbered rings must be collected in the right order, descending from 5 to 1. You have to collect each ring in this order, which leads to some fun platforming and speed sections. Sometimes the numbered rings spawn very close together, and sometimes they spawn scattered across the level, meaning you have to take specific routes to collect them in order. This was a fun challenge too. It's not really too hard, but it does test your ability to reach platforms in a specific order, even when the route is a little irregular at times. The last mission is to reach the hidden goal, which I thought was a fun little addition to these stages. These hidden goals are often ways of completing the stage much quicker than normal, so it adds a lot of incentive to finding them. I'm really liking the encouragement these stages give to find alternate routes and explore to find hidden secrets. Thanks to the hidden goal on one stage, you can complete it in under 20 seconds using the right skips and jumps. It was really fun to learn and to optimise my runs to coincide with the hidden goals, allowing me to maximise my personal best times. Overall, I had a good time with these stage missions. They're simple enough that they aren't annoying or finicky, and they really encourage players to explore levels, taking all sorts of routes in order to find the secrets hidden within each stage. I wouldn't be against some of these features, or something similar to them, coming back in future games linear stages. As I've mentioned during this section before, the level design of these stages is very open, offering multiple routes and pathways, with even multiple goals in most stages. This gives the player a lot of freedom in how they tackle the stage, and how they choose to move through each level. This is exactly what I want to see. Some of the later cyberspace stages in the base game played around with multiple routes, but these stages take it to a whole new level. The routes are so varied that you can complete most stages multiple times in entirely different ways. Sometimes you can complete a stage using one route without ever coming across the others, or you can jump between them and mix it up a little bit. The choice is ultimately yours, which makes these levels feel so free. I think these stages also strike a really good balance between pure speed, pure platforming, and interesting set pieces. There's really never a dull moment during any of these stages thanks to their exciting and varied level design. What makes these cyberspace stages even more fun and replayable is the spin dash. Using it on ramps to boost yourself into the air, allowing you to skip huge chunks of the level and save massive amounts of time. A lot of these levels seem to actively intentionally allow using the spin dash to do this too, and even seem to encourage it in some instances with specifically placed ramps that can be used to safely and accurately skip platforming sections. I absolutely love doing this. After getting to grips with the gimmicks and completing all the stage missions, I then replayed all of them and started to go for the S rank, getting my time down as low as possible by using the spin dash to save massive amounts of time. After playing the stages so many times, I felt as if I'd mastered them, and attempting some of the more difficult to pull off stage skips really tested my abilities. And it was so satisfying to complete the stages in this way, really demonstrating that you've learned the level completely, and being able to beat it in the most efficient way. My only gripe with the level design in these stages is that, much like the open world areas of the DLC, the platform's render distance are far too low, causing them to pop in a little bit too late for my liking, especially when you're using the spin dash and travelling at fast speeds. But it didn't ruin my experience, and I can overlook this simply because of how fun these stages were. Overall, I love the cyberspace stages in the DLC. This is some of the best made, most creative, and most replayable content in the game, and I really think it demonstrates demonstrates that Sonic Team has it in them to create some really good linear stages in future Sonic games. With Sonic's current movement and this new approach to level design in linear Sonic stages, I am so excited for the future of linear Sonic gameplay. We can only hope that Sonic Team leans into what makes these stages so fun and maintains this quality of level design in future titles. Much like in the base game, the Final Horizon has side stories that take the form of simple conversations that Sonic and his friends have. All you need to do is approach the character you want to speak to and press the action button. 
Thankfully, in the DLC, you don't need to collect memory tokens in order to watch these conversations, which is how it should have been in the base game, given how minimal these interactions normally are. Now, most of these conversations are pretty inconsequential, but there are a few that are worth listening to, mainly conversations with Sage or Eggman, as they offer some interesting insight into the Ancients. Sage gives us some cool lore about the Ancients and how originally the civilization consisted of five tribes, all with unique attributes and evolutionary differences. Unfortunately, four of the tribes were wiped out, and the remaining one, the most intelligent of all, are the Ancients we see in the flashbacks in this game. I like hearing more about the Ancients and their lore. I think it is a great deal to add to the world building, so conversations like this are always a nice bonus touch in my opinion. Another conversation between Sage and Sonic that was rather interesting is where Sonic remarks that he's going to grind on a nearby rail, but Sage explains that for her, the rails are not there. Due to Sonic's communion with the cyberspace, aspects of his memories are bleeding into the real world, allowing him to interact with objects such as rails, bounce pads and platforms that aren't actually there. This concept really didn't make much sense to me at all. What does Sage see when Sonic is running around the world? When you're on rails, is he just floating in the sky for her? When you're platforming, is Sonic just jumping in mid-air from Sage's perspective? I don't really know what this means. It's an interesting concept that characters see the world differently because they're influenced by the cyberspace, but I don't know. Sage not being able to see the rails just seems dumb to me when you actually think about what that implies. One conversation that I found interesting was a conversation between Sage and Amy regarding this symbol that we see throughout the game. Sage tells us that the ancients worship this as a symbol of a god, because it would appear in the sky above the Starfall Islands. We don't really know anything about this symbol, or the supposed god that Sage talks about, but Sage does put emphasis on the god that the symbol references still existing out there somewhere today. So maybe this god of the ancients will show up somewhere in a sequel to Frontiers. I guess we'll have to wait and see. During a conversation between Sonic and Sage, Sonic finally asks her the big question. What is Big doing here? Well, Sage confirms my hypothesis that the version of Big we see in the fishing cyberspace isn't the real Big the Cat, but a digital illusion. Of course, the cyberspace takes aspects of Sonic's memories and creates digital spaces out of them, and it can do the same with people. This explains why Big isn't trying to get away or asking for help to leave the cyberspace, and it explains why there's no Froggy, because this Big isn't real. It all makes sense now. I also think it's really wholesome that the cyberspace took Sonic's memories of Big and created a little peaceful oasis for him to come and visit to fish with his friend when he wants. Well, thankfully we don't have to worry about Big's safety. The real Big is somewhere out there in the jungles of the Mystic Ruins, sipping on a mojito and enjoying a nice slow evening of fishing with Froggy. Lastly, I just want to talk about a conversation between Sonic and Tails. Sonic asks Tails about the pinball machine on Chaos Island. Tails explains that the machine was a mechanism that controls volcanic activity, and once activated it causes the volcano to erupt. I'm going to assume this was to be used as a last resort, a defense mechanism that the ancients could use if things got bad during the battle between the end, because I can't think of any other use for a volcano eruption machine. I'd imagine either A, the ancients would use the volcano against the end, or B, the ancients intended on using it to destroy what's left of their civilization on Chaos Island if they thought the end would win. This way their secrets would die with them in a fiery pit of lava. These are the only two reasons I can think of for the ancients wanting to have a manual way of erupting their volcano, but why exactly is it a pinball machine? Well, Tails says it's a playful design choice from the engineers, but I just can't suspend my disbelief that much. It's just too ridiculous. So you're telling me, an ancient engineer not only created a manual erupt button for this volcano for unclear reasons, but also the only way of activating it is to play an elaborate game of pinball in order to build up points to erupt the volcano? How would this even be used? Say my idea of the ancients using it against the end is true. Just imagine the ancients frantically playing a game of pinball whilst their brothers and sisters die outside as the end bombards the islands with lasers from space. How would this help anyone? Or say they use it as a way to destroy their tech so their secrets aren't given away. 
Just imagine the engineer playing pinball in order to do this, to wipe out his own civilization. It's just such a ridiculous idea. If this machine had a more wholesome function, then it'd be more believable. But the fact that the function is to literally flood the island with lava, it's just so comedic that the way to activate it is to play the comically large game of pinball. How do the ancients even know what pinball is? It's a game created by humans and they're literally from a different planet. Ugh. Like, I appreciate the attempt from the writers to explain things that seem a bit nonsensical, but I think some things just shouldn't be acknowledged by the characters in Sonic games, and this is one of them. Overall, the side stories in the DLC were pretty meh. I could have done without most of them. The conversations offered by Sage and Eggman are actually mostly really interesting, as they discuss the Ancients' lore in more detail, giving us a better idea of how ancient life worked. But the conversations between Sonic and his friends are mostly inconsequential and pointless, which was a little bit disappointing, as this isn't an improvement on the base game. Just the same old open world slop for the most part. Hey, nice of you to catch up. Were you successful? Naturally. Good. Unfortunately, your friends aren't handling their cyber corruption nearly as well. Oh, you guys are the best. What does that make me? Hmm? Fashionably late. But hey, you tried. I command you to save us! So, finally, after completing all challenges, defeating all the new Guardians, clearing all the new cyberspace stages and their optional missions, listening to all the side stories, completing the Trials of the Ancients, and collecting six Chaos Emeralds, we are finally ready for the true final fight and ending of Sonic Frontiers. It's all been building to this. Sonic returns to the Master King Coco, and this is where we initiate the final battle. Sonic meets back up with Sage, Eggman, Amy, Knuckles, and Tails, and everyone has played their part in the preparations to make sure Sonic has all seven Chaos Emeralds. Given the fact that this is a rewritten ending, I'm happy they kept in Eggman giving Sonic the final Emerald. It's just a really nice way of showing how high the stakes are right now, with Sonic and Eggman teaming up properly for the first time since Sonic Adventure 2. I know they've sort of worked together in games like Heroes, Shadow of the Hedgehog, Sonic 06, and Lost Worlds, but I think Frontiers is an instance that stands out a little bit more because they actively create a plan together, instead of Eggman deciding last minute that he wants to help Sonic like in other games. Either way, it's nice to see. And with that, Sonic takes the seven Chaos Emeralds to turn super and flies for the final battle. However, first, before we get the true ending boss of the game, we must fight Supreme just one more time. At this point in the game's timeline, Sonic hasn't fought Supreme yet, so he's got to deal with that first before we can get to the new stuff. Of course, Supreme is a great fight, but I can't actually tell if they changed this boss at all from the original. I believe it's pretty much exactly the same as the original fight in the base game, which is totally fine because Supreme was a great boss anyway. It was just a nice little victory lap after completing the Master King Coco trial, getting to fight the last Titan one last time before the end of the game, meaning we fought all four of them three separate times throughout the course of this video, in the base game, in the battle rush, and in the final horizon. And man do they never get boring. But let's stop talking about Supreme, that's not what this section is about. 
The true enemy shows itself after we defeat Supreme. After defeating Supreme, the skies turn purple and the end finally reveals itself from the clouds. The big purple moon is back, which I still think is a goofy design, but I can take it more seriously given the new ending and boss fight. It feels a lot more imposing this time around. The end attaches a large cable to Supreme's neck, using Supreme as its avatar to bring destruction to the world, which is quite fitting because Supreme was once its prison for thousands of years. Supreme then goes through this transformation, falling to the ground in what seems to be pain, then rising on all fours like some sort of feral beast. Five new arms tear through its chassis, protruding from its back in all directions. I really like this transformation for Supreme. It almost seems like the Titan is in pain, being horrifically mutated by the end and perverted from its natural state of being. There we have it. Supreme becomes the end and the fight can begin. The first section of this fight is quite short. You'll notice that you're not doing any damage to the end at all when attacking it, and this is because Sonic hasn't actually activated his new power yet. You just have to wail on the end hopelessly for this first phase of the fight, which I think is pretty cool. It shows how useless standard Super Sonic is when compared to the power of the end, and if it wasn't for the Ancients bestowing Sonic with their power, this would be a hopeless situation. After a while, a cutscene will activate, and Sonic will finally use his cyber corruption to unleash a new super form. A red aura surrounds him, enveloping his entire body. It looks for a second like Sonic's about to lose control, until he tempers the power. A large red and golden shockwave emanates from him, and his eyes turn from the standard supersonic red to blue, showing his new power. In game, this power allows us to actually damage the end, but it also allows us to parry any attack the end throws at us using the perfect parry, meaning all of the attacks in this fight can be avoided with good timing, rewarding the player for playing well. Here we go, it's time to start dealing damage. The first thing you should do in this fight is target the cable attached to Supreme's neck. Destroying it will stop the end from healing, meaning you can actually progress in the fight. During my first playthrough of this fight, I had no idea what I had to do, so I was just endlessly attacking the end and wondering why it kept getting its health back. So yeah, destroying the cable is a very important part of this fight. Another thing to keep in mind is that the end will throw these orbs at you in quick succession, and the only way to stop them is to perfect parry them. Something I love about the parry animation in this fight is that Sonic will just lightly brush off any attack that you successfully parry. It's so shonen, I absolutely love it. Just that casual attitude to the fight because he's so powerful, it's just so cool. Periodically throughout the fight, the end will reattach the cable to Supreme's neck, allowing it to heal again, but this can of course be easily rectified by immediately targeting the cable and getting rid of it as soon as possible, not allowing the end to regain health. Once you've got its health bar down, it isn't immediately clear what you have to do. There are actually two points of the boss you can target, one being Supreme's head and the other being the gun slotted in its back. When the boss is stunned after getting its health bar down, you have to use quick psi loop on the gun, which will eject Supreme's gun from its holster. My only issue with this move is that the quick psi loop is very unreliable to activate. You have to press the attack button and psi loop button in quick succession, but sometimes it just doesn't work and tries to start a combo when you don't want to. Quick psi loop is one ability I actually had trouble activating right until the end of the game. Sometimes it worked perfectly and sometimes it didn't want to work at all. It's a little bit of a temperamental ability. Anyway, after successfully psi looping the gun from its holster, we then have to psi loop it again in order to give it to Eggman, who will use it later in the fight. Taking its gun seems to enrage the end, because it then begins shooting a large barrage of laser beams towards Eggman, Sage, and Sonic's friends. Sage puts up a barrier to protect Eggman, but begins losing control as the sheer barrage of attacks is requiring too much energy. That's until Amy, Knuckles, and Tails join her, and reinforce the barrier using their connection to the cyberspace. I really like this moment, everyone helping each other out and playing their part in the fight. Unlike the original final boss in which Sonic friends did nothing to help at all and just waited back on Earth for Sonic to be done. This act buys Sonic more time to fight the end and we can start the second phase of the fight. There's this really cool move you can do in the second phase of the fight if you parry the end's arms. You can repost by pressing the corresponding buttons and Sonic will dodge the end as it barrels towards him and unleash a barrage of attacks leaving the end stunned. There's this really cool shot after the animation where Sonic crosses his arms looking behind him Again, it's so shonen and looks so fucking cool. This move does a ton of damage too, so not only does it look cool, but it's incredibly useful to pull off. Once you do enough damage in the second phase, the end will turn around and begin forming a 
a huge orb of energy with its arms, throwing it at Sonic, who just about manages to catch it and change its course so it doesn't hit the rest of the team. However, in doing so, this orb does so much damage that it actually reverts him back from super form into his normal form for a moment, but he's easily able to reactivate his power. In another moment that's clearly inspired by some shonen anime, Sonic reactivates the cyber power and slowly raises his hand to point at the end with his eyes closed, almost to say, is that all you've got? I just love this attitude for Sonic in this super form, being so powerful that he's almost nonchalant about the fight itself, having a bit of fun whilst fighting the end because he knows how much power he holds. It's just so cool. I know I've used that word a lot during this fight, but please allow me this. I haven't thought Sonic was cool in literal years, so let me nerd out a bit for this fight. The rest of the fight past this point is pretty much a conjunction of the different moves like perfect parrying, parrying the end's arms to riposte, and attacking its head and string to get a long combos to maximize damage. Once you get the end's health back down, a final quick time event will begin, in which Sonic kicks Supreme into the air and then waits for it to fall back down before delivering the final blow in the most badass way possible. This version of Super Sonic is just so cool, I love it. Once the corrupted Supreme has been dealt with, that still leaves the end's true form. Using Supreme's cannon, Sonic gets inside the barrel and begins cybercharging his new power, becoming a fully blue powered up Cyber Super Sonic. Eggman lines up the shot and Sonic blasts out the barrel at max speed, going straight through the remains of Supreme and then through the end itself. After dealing the final blow of the fight, Sonic drifts through space, and you can see this fight has clearly taken a toll on his body. The end blows up in one last colossal explosion, and the fight is over. In classic supersonic fashion, Sonic falls back down to the earth below, and the emeralds scatter once more, most likely taking up residence in all different corners of the world, ready to be found again in a future adventure. And there we have it folks! Sonic celebrates with his friends, and in this version of the ending, Sage doesn't have to sacrifice herself, meaning Eggman actually gets a happy ending this time. Now, I both like and dislike this, mainly because I really liked Eggman's ending in the base game. That shot of him staring at the falling debris of the end, clenching his fist and resolving himself to bring back Sage whatever the cost was really poignant, and losing that scene is a shame but I think it's a small price to pay for a way better final boss and ending. Plus, this means Sage can immediately return in future games, which I think is cool. He congratulates her on her contribution to the fight, and Eggman says, it's time to go home, dear daughter. They have both accepted that they care for each other greatly, and neither of them shy away from the father-daughter dynamic that they have. The events of this game have brought them closer, and I'm actually really excited to see what they do with Sage and Eggman in future games. The final scene of the game ends the same way as in the base game, with Sonic proclaiming to his friends, So, that was fun, and each of them having these comical negative expressions. But I found that I don't feel so bitter about the ending this time around. This ending was satisfying, with a great fight and an impressive spectacle, and a part to play for each of the characters that shaped this story. I must say, Sonic Team did a great job rewriting the ending of Sonic Frontiers. It actually feels conclusive this time, instead of rushed. To have an actual final boss to finish the game off was just what Frontiers needed, and being able to play as Sonic Friends was a nice bonus addition, even if some of them are janky to control and the platforming doesn't work 100% of the time. Sonic Frontiers The Final Horizon is a very valuable addition to the game. Yes, it's incredibly rough around the edges, but I've got to thank Sonic Team for putting in the effort to release this, especially given the fact it's a completely free update. This truly is the canon ending for Sonic Frontiers, and I'm happy to say I mostly enjoyed it. Wow, this is the first time in a video I've done two conclusions instead of just one. But I'm going to try and finalise my opinions on Sonic Frontiers as a whole, including the base game, the post-launch content updates, and the Final Horizon DLC. First of all, I'll come out and say that Sonic Frontiers is a messy game. It's clear that the development cycle was complicated, with lots of ambitious ideas flying around that weren't quite able to be realised by the developers in time for the game's release. But underneath a lot of the jank, the mostly poorly written main story, the clear open world padding, or the lack of true open world side content, this game has something that Sonic games haven't had for a long time. Ambition. 
To create the first open world game in a franchise that is so used to being strictly linear has to be a mammoth task, and the developers had their work cut out for them for this project. The base game had innumerable issues, but there are traces of love and passion put into this game, in the form of the Ancients lore, the characterization of the main cast, the wholesome addition of the fishing minigame, the beautiful handcrafted open world spaces, the incredibly fun and replayable cyberspace stages, the epic titan boss battles, and a story that not not only acknowledges the events of previous games, but makes an effort to change the perspectives of the characters involved in it. Furthermore, Sonic Team really demonstrated a desire to get Sonic right for once. In a timeline where Sonic has been repeatedly mishandled as an IP and fell into a complete shadow of its former self, it's nice for them to retroactively update the game for free post-launch content and actually improve it a hell of a lot. Don't get me wrong, my criticisms of the base game are still valid, and I will not overlook these issues. But the post-launch updates make Sonic Frontiers a much better game without a doubt. The inclusion of the Cyberspace Challenge mode, the Battle Rush mode, the Open Zone Coco challenges and the Action Chain challenges really did add a lot of replayability to most of the content in the game and I had such a fun time interacting with all of this content. The improved physics modifiers is one of the best things Sonic Team did for Sonic Frontiers, and the game went from not feeling amazing to play, to suddenly being incredibly fun to run around the islands with no goal in mind, simply to engage with the movement system. And adding the manual spin dash on top of that really made Sonic Frontiers movement system one of the best we've ever had. The Final Horizons DLC is exactly what Sonic Frontiers needed. Now, I'm by no means saying that it was perfect, Perfect, because it certainly isn't. The platforms popping in and out constantly, the mass amount of clutter on Oranos Island, the poorly balanced trials, and the lackluster side stories really hold this DLC back, and I will always stand by these criticisms. But the Final Horizon did do some really good things. It allowed us to play with additional characters, which is always welcome. It had some really fun platforming sections, particularly the last few towers. It gave us nine new, really fun and replayable cyberspace stages. But most importantly of all, it did a great job of rewriting the end of the game and actually gave us a satisfying ending and boss fight, which is exactly what I wanted when I first finished Sonic Frontiers. I started writing this script what feels like a very long time ago, around February at the start of this year, and the journey I've gone on since then whilst trying to critique this game has been a complicated one to say the least. I originally only intended to critique the base game and just leave it at that, but after hearing about the post-launch updates, I thought I'd give the game more of a chance before writing it off entirely. I'm overall really glad I played the three post-launch updates for this game. They're by no means the best content I've ever played in a game, but they're good. They symbolise Sonic Team's desire to bring Sonic to the next level, and I hope that the success this game has seen invigorates them with the hunger to make the next Sonic game the best we've ever had, because I believe they can do it. The talent is there. The higher-ups just need to make sure that the developers have enough time to fine-tune the game next time, instead of pushing it out before it was ready like Frontiers clearly was. Overall, I still think there's so much that holds Sonic Frontiers back from being a great game in my mind. It's just too messy in certain places, much more messy than a few post-launch updates can fix, but I am happy with the current state of Sonic Frontiers, and I must commend Sonic Team on taking what was a game with a plethora of problems and turning it into a good one. I'm glad to say that looking back, I like Sonic Frontiers. It's not as bad as some people will have you believe, but it's also not as good as a lot of people will tell you. That's why to me, it's somewhere in the middle. It still could have been so much more than what it is, even with all the updates. I've never played a game burdened with so many issues, whilst still having so much about it that I like. Which is why to me, I still believe that Sonic Frontiers was almost great. Thank you so much for watching if you made it to this point in the video. I know five hours is a lot of time to dedicate to a video about a blue hedgehog. If you've watched the entire thing, that's crazy. I, I can't thank you enough. There's no really way of me actually thanking you bar just saying thank you. As I said earlier in the video, uh, my first experience with AAA games when I was a kid was Sonic Adventure DX on the GameCube. So Sonic has been 
you know, he's had a special place in my heart ever since those days when I first started playing games. I slowly watched him go from a character that I held in such high regard to something that I didn't really care about anymore because he was mishandled so often. So I decided to come back to Sonic Frontiers for this video and I was like, you know, maybe Sonic's good, maybe, maybe Sonic's good now. And while I don't think Sonic Frontiers is like the best game ever, it's, it's good, you know, it's, it sounds cliche and a lot of people have said this about Sonic, but I think Sonic Frontiers is a step in the right direction and it shows us that Sonic can be so much more than what it's been for sort of the last 10 years. But I'm going to stop yapping about Sonic. You probably don't want to hear any more of it. It's been like five hours worth of this bollocks. This video has taken me so long to create. Um, you know, I started recording the footage for Sonic Frontiers about a year ago. So this video has technically been in the works for, for a year, but I started writing the script in around February, March time. And then obviously all the updates came out, the Final Horizon DLC came out, and I had to go back and basically redraft a ton of the script and, you know, write an extra whole section on the end. I was intending for the update section to just be like, you know, maybe like an hour or so, maybe like half an hour. Ended up being two hours long. It was an extra like 20,000 words on top of the script or something like that. But I didn't want to cover this game with like half measures. I wanted to cover everything, all of my opinions, the post-launch updates, the fixes, what they still got wrong with the updates, all that good stuff. I didn't want to compromise, so I was like, fuck it. Let's make it five hours long. Why not? That's fine. My last video was like 11 hours anyway, so five hours comparatively is short, right? But yeah, thank you so much for watching if you've got to this point. I really, really appreciate it. You know, Sonic is not a franchise I make videos on very often. I think I made like one Sonic Mania video back when that game came out years ago. But Sonic is not something that I've talked about like at all on this channel, but it's something that I loved as a kid and you know, it's a series that I still sort of check in on every now and then. So it was a good time making this video, even if the production of it was kind of turbulent. I know my upload schedule is very erratic, and that's not going to change, you know, I'll see you guys in a few months for the next one. Well, a few months, it's probably going to be longer than that. Anyway, yeah, that's it. I'm going to stop rambling because I've done enough yapping this video already. Um, so thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you watching this video. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.